Introduction to a Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Introduction. It is perhaps due to a chance conversation held some seventeen years ago in New York that this diary of the Civil War was saved from destruction. A Philadelphian had been talking with my mother of North and South, and had alluded to the engagement between the Essex and the Arkansas on the Mississippi as a brilliant victory for the Federal Navy. My mother protested at once, said that she and her sister Miriam and several friends had been witnesses from the levee to the fact that the Confederates had fired and abandoned their own ship when the machinery broke down after two shots had been exchanged. The Federals, cautiously turning the point, had then captured but a smoking hulk. The Philadelphian gravely corrected her. History, it appeared, had consecrated, on the strength of an official report, the version more agreeable to northern pride. "'But I wrote a description of the whole just a few hours after it occurred,' my mother insisted. "'Early in the war I began to keep a diary and continued until the very end. I had to find some vent for my feelings, and I would not make an exhibition of myself by talking, as so many women did.' I have written while resting to recover breath in the midst of a stampede. I have even written with shells bursting over the house in which I sat, ready to flee, but waiting for my mother and sisters to finish their preparations. If that record still existed, it would be invaluable, said the Philadelphian. We northerners are sincerely anxious to know what southern women did and thought at that time, but the difficulty is to find authentic contemporaneous evidence." All that I, for one, have seen has been marred by improvement in the light of subsequent events. You may read my evidence as it was written from March 1862 until April 1865, my mother declared impulsively. At our home in Charleston, on her return, she unstitched with trembling hands a linen-bound parcel always kept in her tall cedar-lined wardrobe of curled walnut. On it was scratched in ink, to be burned unread after my death. It contained, she had once told me, a record of no interest save to her who had written it and lacked the courage to reread it, a narrative of days she had lived, of joys she had lost, of griefs accepted, of vain hopes cherished. From the linen, as the stitches were cut, fell five blank books of different sizes, Two of convenient dimensions might have been intended for diaries. The other three, somewhat unwieldy, were partly used ledgers from Judge P. H. Morgan's office. They were closely written in a clear, firm hand. The ink of poor quality had faded in many places to a pale brown, scarcely darker than the deep yellow to which time had burned the paper. The effort to read under such conditions, and the tears shed over the scenes evoked, might well have cost my mother her sight, but she toiled for many weeks, copying out the essential portions of the voluminous record for the benefit of the northerner who really wished to know. Her transcription finished, she sent it to Philadelphia. It was in due course returned, with cold regrets that the temptation to rearrange it had not been resisted. No Southerner at that time could possibly have had opinions so just, or foresight so clear, as those here attributed to a young girl. Explanation was not asked, nor justification allowed. The case, tried by one party alone, with evidence seen from one standpoint alone, had been judged without appeal. Keenly wounded and profoundly discouraged, my mother returned the diaries to their linen envelope and never saw them again. But my curiosity had been roused by these incidents. In the night thoughts of the records would haunt me, bringing ever the antebellum scent of the cedar-lined wardrobe. 
I pleaded for the preservation of the volumes, and succeeded at last, when, beneath the injunction that they should be burned, my mother wrote a deed of gift to me, with permission to make such use of them as I might think fitting. Reading those pages for myself of late, as I transcribed them in my turn, I confess to having blamed the Philadelphian but lightly for his skepticism. Here was a girl who, by her own admission, had known but ten months' schooling in her life, and had educated herself at home because of her yearning for knowledge. And yet she wrote in a style so pure, with a command of English so thorough, that rare are the pages where she had to stop for the alteration of so much as one word. The very haste of noting what had just occurred before more should come had disturbed the pure line of very few among these flowing sentences. There are certain uses of words to which the twentieth-century purist will take exception, but if he is familiar with Victorian literature he will know that these points have been solved within the last few decades, and not all solved to the satisfaction of every one even now. But underlying this remarkable feat of style are a fairness of treatment and a balance of judgment incredible at such a period and in an author so young. On such a day we may note an entry denouncing the Federals before their arrival at Baton Rouge. Another page, and we see that the Federal officers are courteous and considerate. We hear regrets that denunciations should have been dictated by prejudice. Does Farragut bombard a town occupied by women and children, or does Butler threaten to arm Negroes against them? Be sure, then, that this Southern girl will not spare adjectives to condemn them. But do Southern women exaggerate in applying to all Federals the opprobrium deserved by some? Then those women will be criticized for forgetting the reserve imposed upon ladies. This girl knew then what history has since established, and what enlightened men and women on both sides of Mason and Dixon's line have since acknowledged, that in addition to the gentlemen in the Federal ranks who always behaved as gentlemen should, there were others, both officers and privates, who had donned the Federal uniform because of the opportunity for rapine which offered, and who were as unworthy of the stars and stripes as they would have been of the stars and bars. I can understand, therefore, that this record should meet with skepticism at the hands of theorists committed to an opinion, or of skimmers who read guessing the end of a sentence before they reach the middle, but the originals exist to-day, and have been seen by others than myself, and I pledge myself here to the assertion that I have taken no liberties, have made no alterations, but have strictly adhered to my task of transcription, merely omitting here and there passages which deal with matters too personal to merit the interest of the public. Those who read seriously and with an unbiased mind will need no external guarantees of authenticity, however, for the style is of that spontaneous quality which no imitation could attain, and which attempted improvement could only mar. The very construction of the whole, for it does appear as a whole, is influenced by the circumstances which made the life of that tragic period. The author begins with an airy appeal to Madame Idleness in order to forget. Then the war seemed a sacred duty, an heroic endeavor, an inevitable trial, according as Southerners chose to take it. But the prevailing opinion was that the solution would come in victory for Southern arms, whether by their own unaided might or with the support of English intervention. The seat of war was far removed, and but for the absence of dear ones at the front and anxiety about them, southern women would have been little disturbed in their routine of household duties. But presently the roar of cannon draws near, actual danger is experienced in some cases, suffering and privation must be accepted in all. Thenceforth the women are part of the war, there may be interludes of plantation life momentarily secure from bullets and from oppression, yet the cloud is felt hanging ever lower and blacker. 
Gradually the writer's gay spirit fails, an injury to her spine, for which adequate medical care cannot be found in the Confederacy, and the condition of her mother, all but starving at Clinton, drive these southern women to the protection of a Union relative in New Orleans. The hated Eagle Oath must be taken. The beloved Confederacy must be renounced, at least in words. Entries in the diary become briefer and briefer, yet are sustained unto the bitter end, when the deaths of two brothers and the crash of the lost cause are told with the tragic reserve of a broken heart. I have alluded to passages omitted because too personal. That the clearness of the narrative may not suffer, I hope to be pardoned for explaining briefly here the position of Sarah Morgan's family at the outbreak of the Civil War. Her father, Judge Thomas Gibbs Morgan, had been collector of the Port of New Orleans, and in 1861 was judge of the district court of the parish of Baton Rouge. In complete sympathy with Southern rights, he disapproved of secession as a movement fomented by hotheads on both sides, but he declared for it when his state so decided. He died at his home in Baton Rouge in November 1861, before the arrival of Farragut's fleet. Judge Thomas Gibbs Morgan's eldest son, Philip Hickey Morgan, was also a judge of the Second District Court of the Parish of Orleans. Judge P. H. Morgan, alluded to as brother and his wife as sister throughout the diary, disapproved of secession like his father, but did not stand by his state. He declared himself for the Union, and remained in New Orleans when the Federals took possession, but refused to bear arms against his brothers and friends. His position enabled him to render signal services to many Confederate prisoners suffering under Butler's rule and it was a conversation of his with President Hayes when he told the full unprejudiced truth about the dual government and the popular sentiment of Louisiana, which put an end to reconstruction there by the Washington government's recognition of General Francis T. Nichols, elected governor by the people, instead of Packard, declared governor by the Republican Returning Board of the State. Judge P. H. Morgan had proved his disinterestedness in his report to the President, for the new Democratic regime meant his own resignation from the post of Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of Louisiana, which he held under the Republicans. He applied then to himself a piece of advice which he later was to give a young relative mentioned in the pages of this diary— Always remember that it is best to be in accord with the sentiments of the vast majority of the people in your state. They are more apt to be right on public questions of the day than the individual citizen. If Judge Thomas Gibbs Morgan's eldest son stayed within the Union lines because he would not sanction secession, his eldest daughter, Lavinia, was on the Federal side also— married to Colonel Richard Coulter Drum, then stationed in California, and destined to become, in days of peace, adjutant general under President Cleveland's first administration. Though spared the necessity of fighting against his wife's brothers, Colonel Drum was largely instrumental in checking the secession movement in California, which probably would have assured the success of the South. In the early days of secession agitation, another son of Judge T. G. Morgan, Henry, had died in a duel over a futile quarrel which busybodies had envenomed. The three remaining sons had gone off to the war. Thomas Gibbs Morgan, Jr., married to Lydia, daughter of General A. G. Carter and a cousin of Mrs. Jefferson Davis, was captain in the 7th Louisiana Regiment, serving under Stonewall Jackson. George Mather Morgan, unmarried, was a captain in the first Louisiana, also with Jackson in Virginia. The youngest, James Morris Morgan, had resigned from Annapolis, where he was a cadet, and hurried back to enlist in the Confederate Navy. At the family home in Baton Rouge, only women and children remained. There was Judge Morgan's widow, Sarah Fowler Morgan, 
a married daughter, Eliza, or Lily, with her five children, and two unmarried daughters, Miriam and Sarah. Lily's husband, J. Charles Lanou, came and went. Unable to abandon his large family without protector or resources, he had not joined the regular army, but took a part in battles near whatever place of refuge he had found for those dependent on him. We note, for instance, that he helped in the Confederate attack on Baton Rouge together with General Carter, whose age had prevented him from taking regular service. A word more as to the author of this diary, and I have finished. The war over, Sarah Morgan knitted together the threads of her torn life and faced her present in preparation for whatever the future might hold. In South Carolina, under Reconstruction, she met a young Englishman, Captain Francis Warrington Dawson, who had left his home in London to fight for a cause where his chivalrous nature saw right threatened by might. In the Confederate Navy, under Commodore Pegram, in the Army of Northern Virginia, under Longstreet, at the close of the war he was Chief Ordnance Officer to General Fitzhugh Lee. But although the force of arms, of men, of money, of mechanical resources, of international support, had decided against the Confederacy, he refused to acknowledge permanent defeat for Southern ideals, and so cast his lot with those beside whom he had fought. His ambition was to help his adopted country in reconquering through journalism and sound politics that which seemed lost through war. What he accomplished in South Carolina is a matter of public record today. The part played in this work by Sarah Morgan as his wife is known to all who approached them during their fifteen years of a married life across which no shadow ever fell. Sarah Morgan Dawson was destined to outlive not only her husband, but all save three of her eight brothers and sisters, and most of the relatives and friends mentioned in the pages which follow was destined to endure deep affliction once more, and to renounce a second home dearer than that first whose wreck she recorded during the war. Yet never did her faith, her courage, her steadfastness fail her. Never did the light of an almost childlike trust in God and in mankind fade from her clear blue eyes." The Sarah Morgan, who as a girl could stifle her sobs as she forced herself to laugh or to sing, was the mother I knew in later years. I love most to remember her in the broad tree-shaded avenues of Versailles, where dreaming of a distant tragic past she found ever new strength to meet the present. Death claimed her not far from there in Paris, at a moment when her daughter in America— her son in Africa, were powerless to reach her. But souls like unto hers leave their mark in passing through the world, and though in a foreign land, separated from all who had been dear to her, she received from two friends such devotion as few women deserve in life, and such as few other women are capable of giving. She had done more than live and love. She had endured while endurance was demanded, and released from the house of bondage, she had, without trace of bitterness in her heart, forgiven those who had caused her martyrdom. Warrington Dawson, Versailles, France, July, 1913 End of Introduction Book One, Part One of A Confederate Girl's Diary this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book One, Part One, March 9th to April 19th, 1862. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, March 9th, 1862. Here I am at your service, Madam Idleness, waiting for any suggestion it may please you to put in my weary brain as a means to pass this dull, cloudy Sunday afternoon, for the great pike clock over the way has this instant struck only half-past three, 
and if a rain is added to the high wind that has been blowing ever since the month commenced and prevents my going to mrs bruno's before dark i fear i shall fall victim to the blues for the first time in my life indeed it is dull miriam went to linwood with lydia yesterday and i miss them beyond all expression miriam is so funny she says she cannot live without me and yet she can go away and stay for months without missing me in the slightest degree extremely funny and i well it is absurd to fancy myself alive without miriam she would rather not visit with me and yet be it for an hour or a month i never halfway enjoy myself without her away from home miriam is my rock ahead in life i'll founder on her yet it's a grand sight for people out of reach who will not come in contact with the breakers but it is quite another thing to me perpetually dancing on those sharp points in my little cockle shell that form so ludicrous a contrast to the grand scene around i am sure to founder i hold that every family has at heart one genius in some line no matter what except in our family where each is a genius in his own way hem and miriam has a genius for the piano now i never could bear to compete with any one knowing that it is the law of my being to be inferior to others consequently to fail and failure is so humiliating to me so it is that people may force me to abandon any pursuit by competing with me for knowing that failure is inevitable rather than fight against destiny i give up de bonne grace originally i was said to have a talent for the piano as well as miriam sister and miss isabella said i would make a better musician than she having more patience and perseverance however i took hardly six months lessons to her ever so many years heard how well she played got disgusted with myself and gave up the piano at fourteen with spasmodic fits of playing every year or so at sixteen harry gave me a guitar here was a new field where i would have no competitors i knew no one who played on it so i set to work and taught myself to manage it mother only teaching me how to tune it but miriam took a fancy to it and i taught her all i knew but as she gained i lost my relish and if she had not soon abandoned it i would know nothing of it now she does not know half that i do about it they tell me i play much better than she yet they let her play on it in company before me and i cannot pretend to play after why is it it is not vanity or i would play confident of excelling her it is not jealousy for i love to see her show her talents it is not selfishness i love her too much to be selfish to her what is it then simply lack of self-esteem i would say if there was no phrenologist near to correct me and point out that well-developed hump at the extreme southern and heavenward portion of my morgan head self-esteem or not mr phrenologist the result is that miriam is by far the best performer in baton rouge and i would rank forty-third even in the delectable village of jackson and yet i must have some ear for music to know as many songs as sarah is a family proverb not very difficult songs or very beautiful ones to be sure besides being very indifferently sung but the tunes will run in my head and it must take some ear to catch them people say to me of course you play to which i invariably respond oh no but miriam plays beautifully you sing i believe not at all except for father that is what i used to say and the children but miriam sings you are fond of dancing very but i cannot dance as well as miriam of course you are fond of society no indeed miriam is and she goes to all the parties and returns all the visits for me the consequence is that if the person who questions is a stranger he goes off satisfied that that miriam must be a great girl but that little sister of hers well a prig to say the least so it is miriam catches all my fish and so it is too that it is not raining and i'm off 
April 7th. Until that dreary 1861, I had no idea of sorrow or grief. How I loved to think of myself at that time, not as myself, but as some happy careless child who danced through life, loving God's whole world too much to love any particular one outside of her own family. She was more childish then, yet I like her for all her folly. I can say it now, for she is as dead as though she was lying underground. Now do not imagine that Sarah has become an aged lady in the fifteen months that have elapsed since, for it is no such thing. Her heart does ache occasionally, but that is a secret between her and this little rosewood-furnished room. And when she gets over it, there is no one more fond of making wheelbarrows for the children, or of catching Charlie or Mother by the foot and making them play lame chicken. Now all this, done by a young lady who remembers eighteen months ago with so much regret that she has lost so much of her high spirits, might argue that her spirits before were tremendous, and yet they were not. That other Sarah was ladylike, I am sure, in her wildest moments, but there is something hurried and boisterous in this one's tricks that reminds me of someone who is making a merit of being jolly under depressing circumstances. No, that is not a nice Sarah now to my taste. The commencement of sixty-one promised much pleasure for the rest of the year, and though secession was talked about, I do not believe any one anticipated the war that has been desolating our country ever since, with no prospect of terminating for some time to come. True, the garrison was taken, but then several pleasant officers of the Louisiana Army were stationed there, and made quite an agreeable addition to our small parties, and we did not think for a moment that trouble would grow out of it, at least we girls did not. Next, Louisiana seceded, but still we did not trouble ourselves with gloomy anticipations, for many strangers visited the town, and our parties, rides, and walks grew gayer and more frequent. One little party, shall I ever forget it, was on the ninth of March, I think. Such an odd, funny little party. Such queer things happened. What a fool Mr. McGee made of himself, even more so than usual. But hush, it's not fair to laugh at a lady under peculiar circumstances. And he tried so hard to make himself agreeable, poor fellow, that I ought to like him for being so obedient to my commands. "'Say something new, something funny,' I said, tired of a subject on which he had been expatiating all the evening, for I had taken a long ride with him before sunset, he had escorted me to Mrs. Bruno's, and here he was still at my side, and his conversation did not interest me. To hear with him was to obey. Something funny? Well... Here he commenced telling something about somebody, the fun of which seemed to consist in the somebody's having knocked his shins against something else. I only listened to the latter part of it. I was bored and showed it. Shins! Was I to laugh at such a story? April 12th. Day before yesterday, just about this time of evening, as I came home from the graveyard, Jimmy unexpectedly came in. Ever since the 12th of February he has been waiting on the Yankees' pleasure in the Mississippi at all places below Columbus, and having been under fire for thirteen days at Tiptonville, Island No. 10 having surrendered Monday night, and Commodore Hollins, thinking it high time to take possession of the ironclad ram at New Orleans and give them a small party below the forts, he carried off his little aide from the McRae Tuesday morning and left him here Thursday evening, to our infinite delight, for we felt as though we would never again see our dear little Jimmy. He has grown so tall and stout that it is really astonishing, considering the short time he has been away. To our great distress he jumped up from dinner and declared he must go to the city on the very next boat. Commodore Hollins would need him, he must be at his post, etc., and in twenty minutes he was off the rascal before we could believe he had been here at all. There is something in his eye that reminds me of Harry, and tells me that, like Hal, he will die young. 
and these days that are going by remind me of hal too i am walking in our footsteps of last year the eighth was the day we gave him a party on his return home i see him so distinctly standing near the pier table talking to mr sparks whom he had met only that morning and who three weeks after had harry's blood upon his hands he is a murderer now without aim or object in life as before with only one desire to die and death still flees from him and he dares not rid himself of life all those dancing there that night have undergone trial and affliction since father is dead and harry mr trezevant lies at corinth with his skull fractured by a bullet every young man there has been in at least one battle since and every woman has cried over her son brother or sweetheart going away to the wars or lying sick and wounded and yet we danced that night and never thought of bloodshed the week before louisiana seceded jack wheat stayed with us and we all liked him so much and he thought so much of us and last week a week ago to-day he was killed on the battlefield of shiloh april sixteenth among the many who visited us in the beginning of eighteen sixty one there was mr bradford I took a dislike to him the first time I ever saw him, and being accustomed to say just what I pleased to all the other gentlemen, tried it with him. It was at dinner, and for a long while I had the advantage, and though father would sometimes look grave, Gibbs and all at my end of the table would scream with laughter. At last Mr. Bradford commenced to retaliate, and my dislike changed into respect for a man who could make an excellent repartee with perfect good breeding, and after dinner, when the others took their leave and he asked permission to remain, during his visit, which lasted until ten o'clock, he had gone over such a variety of subjects, conversing so well upon all, that Miriam and I were so interested that we forgot to have the gas lit. April 17th. And another was silly little Mr. B. R., my little golden calf. What a... don't call names... I owe him a grudge for cold hands, and the other day when I heard of his being wounded at Shiloh, I could not help laughing a little at Tom B. R.'s being hurt. What was the use of throwing a nice big cannon-ball that might have knocked a man down away on that poor little fellow, when a pea from a pop-gun would have made the same impression? Not but what he is brave, but little Mr. B. R. is so soft." Then there was that rattle-brain Mr. T. T., who, commencing one subject, never ceased speaking until he had touched on all. One evening he came in talking, and never paused even for a reply until he bowed himself out, talking still, when Mr. Bradford, who had been forced to silence as well as the rest, threw himself back with a sigh of relief and exclaimed, "'This man talks like a woman!' I thought it the best description of Mr. T. T.'s conversation I had ever heard. It was all on the surface, no pretensions to anything except to put the greatest possible number of words of no meaning in one sentence, while speaking of the most trivial thing. Night or day Mr. T. T. never passed home without crying out to me, C'est joli yeux bleu, and if the parlour were brightly lighted so that all from the street might see us and be invisible to us themselves, I always nodded my head to the outer darkness and laughed, no matter who was present, though it sometimes created remark. You see, I knew the joke. Coming from a party escorted by Mr. B. R., Miriam by Mr. T. T., we had to wait a long time before Rose opened the door, which interval I employed in dancing up and down the gallery, followed by my cavalier, singing, Mes jolis yeux bleus, bleus comme les cieux, mes jolis yeux bleus, on ravi son âme, etc., which naive remark Mr. B. R., not speaking French, lost entirely, and Mr. T. T. endorsed it with his approbation and belief in it, and ever afterwards called me ces jolis yeux bleus. 
April 19, 1862. Another date in Hal's short history. I see myself walking home with Mr. McGee just after sundown, meeting Miriam and Dr. Woods at the gate. Only that was a Friday instead of a Saturday as this. From the other side, Mr. Sparks comes up and joins us. We stand talking in the bright moonlight, which makes Miriam look white and statue-like. I am holding roses in my hand, in return for which one little pansy has been begged from my garden, and is now figuring as a shirt-stud. I turn to speak to that man of whom I said to Dr. Woods before I even knew his name, Who is this man who passes here so constantly? I feel that I shall hate him to my dying day. He told me his name was Sparks, a good harmless fellow, etc., and afterwards, when I did know him, Dr. Woods would ask every time we met, "'Well, do you hate Sparks yet?' I could not really hate any one in my heart, so I always answered, "'He is a good-natured fool, but I will hate him yet.' And even now I cannot. My only feeling is intense pity for the man who has dealt us so severe a blow, who made my dear father bow his grey head and shed such bitter tears.' The moon is rising still higher now, and people are hurrying to the grand meeting where the state of the country is to be discussed, and the three young men bow and hurry off too. Later at eleven o'clock Miriam and I are up at Lydia's waiting until the boat comes with Miss Comstock, who is going away. As usual I am teasing and romping by turns. Harry suddenly stands in the parlor door, looking very grave and very quiet. He is holding father's stick in his hand, and says he has come to take us over home. I was laughing still, so I said, Wait, while I prepared for some last piece of folly. But he smiled for the first time, and throwing his arm around me, said, Come home, you rogue, and laughing still, I followed him. He left us in the hall, saying he must go to Charlie's a moment, but to leave the door open for him. So we went up, and I ran in his room and lighted his gas for him, as I did every night when we went up together. In a little while I heard him come in and go to his room. I knew nothing then, but next day going into Mother's room, I saw him standing before the glass door of her armoire, looking at a black coat he had on. Involuntarily I cried out, "'Oh, don't, Hal!' "'Don't what? Isn't it a nice coat?' he asked. "'Yes, but it is buttoned up to the throat, and I don't like to see it. It looks—' Here I went out as abruptly as I came in. That black coat, so tightly buttoned, troubled me. He came to our room after a while, and said he was going ten miles out in the country for a few days. I begged him to stay, and reproached him for going away so soon after he had come home. But he said he must, adding, "'Perhaps I am tired of you and want to see something new. I'll be so glad to get back in a few days.' Father said yes, he must go, so he went without any further explanation. Walking out to Mr. Davidson's that evening, Lydia and I sat down on a fallen rail beyond the Catholic graveyard, and there she told me what had happened. The night before, sitting on Dr. Wood's gallery with six or eight others who had been singing, Hal called on Mr. Henderson to sing. He complied by singing one that was not nice. Old Mr. Sparks got up to leave, and Hal said, "'I hope we are not disturbing you.' "'No,' he said, he was tired and would go home.' As soon as he was gone, his son, who I have since heard was under the influence of opium, though Hal always maintained that he was not, said it was a shame to disturb his poor old father. Hal answered, You heard what he said. We did not disturb him. You are a liar, the other cried. That is a name that none of our family has either merited or borne with and quick as thought Hal sprang to his feet and struck him across the face with the walking-stick he held. The blow sent the lower part across the balcony in the street, as the spring was loosened by it, while the upper part to which was fastened the sword, for it was father's sword-cane, remained in his hand. 
I doubt that he ever before knew the cane would come apart. Certainly he did not perceive it until the other whined piteously that he was taking advantage over an unarmed man, when, cursing him, he, Harry, threw it after the body of the cane, and said, "'Now we are equal.' The other's answer was to draw a knife, and was about to plunge it into Harry, who disdained to flinch, when Mr. Henderson threw himself on Mr. Sparks and dragged him off. It was a little while after that Harry came for us. The consequence of this was a challenge from Mr. Sparks in the morning, which was accepted by Harry's friends, who appointed Monday at Greenwell to meet. Lydia did not tell me that. She said she thought it had been settled peaceably, so I was not uneasy, and only wanted Harry to come back from Seth David's soon. The possibility of his fighting never occurred to me. Sunday evening I was on the front steps with Miriam and Dr. Woods, talking of Harry and wishing he would come. "'You want Harry?' the doctor repeated after me. "'You had better learn to live without him.' "'What an absurdity!' I said, and wondered when he would come. Still later, Miriam, father, and I were in the parlour when there was a tap on the window just above his head, and I saw a hand for an instant. Father hurried out, and we heard several voices, and then steps going away. Mother came down and asked who had been there, but we only knew that, whoever it was, father had afterward gone with them. Mother went on, there is something going on which is being kept from me. Everyone seems to know it and to make a secret of it. I said nothing, for I had promised Lydia not to tell, and even I did not know all. When father came back, Harry was with him. I saw by his nod and how are you girls, how he wished us to take it, so neither moved from our chairs, while he sat down on the sofa and asked what kind of a sermon we had had and we talked of anything except what we were thinking of until we went upstairs. Hal afterwards told me that he had been arrested up there, and father went with him to give bail, and that the sheriff had gone out to Greenwell after Mr. Sparks. He told me all about it next morning, saying he was glad it was all over, but sorry for Mr. Sparks, for he had a blow on his face which nothing would wash out. I said, "'Hal, if you had fought, much as I love you, I would rather he had killed you than that you should have killed him. I love you too much to be willing to see blood on your hands.' First he laughed at me, then said, "'If I had killed him, I never would have seen you again.' We thought it was all over. So did he. But Baton Rouge was wild about it. Mr. Sparks was the bully of the town, having nothing else to do, and whenever he got angry or drunk would knock down anybody he chose. That same night before Harry met him he had slapped one man and had dragged another over the room by the hair, but these coolly went home and waited for a voluntary apology. So the mothers, sisters, and intimate friends of those who had patiently borne the blows and being wooled, vaunted the example of their heroes, and asked why Dr. Morgan had not acted as they had done and waited for an apology. Then there was another faction who cried only blood could wash out that blow and make a gentleman of Mr. Sparks again, as though he ever had been one. So knots assembled at street corners and discussed it, until father said to us that Monday night, These people are so excited and are trying so hard to make this affair worse that I would not be surprised if they shot each other down in the street, speaking of Harry and the other. Hal seemed to think of it no more, though, and Wednesday said he must go to the city and consult brother as to where he should permanently establish himself. I was sorry, yet glad that he would then get away from all this trouble. I don't know that I ever saw him in higher spirits than he was that day and evening, the 24th. Lily and Charlie were here until late, and he laughed and talked so incessantly that we called him crazy. We might have guessed by his extravagant spirits that he was trying to conceal something from us. He went away before daybreak, and I never saw him again. End of Book One, Part One
Book One, Part Two of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book One, Part Two, April twenty sixth to May twenty seventh, eighteen sixty two. April twenty sixth, eighteen sixty two. There is no word in the English language that can express the state in which we are and have been these last three days. Day before yesterday, news came early in the morning of three of the enemy's gunboats passing the forts, and then the excitement began. It increased rapidly on hearing of the sinking of eight of our gunboats in the engagement, the capture of the forts, and last night of the burning of the wharves and cotton in the city while the Yankees were taking possession. Today the excitement has reached the point of delirium. I believe I am one of the most self-possessed in my small circle, and yet I feel such a craving for news of Miriam and Mother and Jimmy who are in the city that I suppose I am as wild as the rest. It is nonsense to tell me I am cool with all these patriotic and enthusiastic sentiments. Nothing can be positively ascertained, save that our gunboats are sunk and theirs are coming up to the city. Everything else has been contradicted until we really do not know whether the city has been taken or not. We only know we had best be prepared for anything. So day before yesterday, Lily and I sewed up our jewelry, which may be of use if we have to fly. I vow I will not move one step unless carried away. Come what will, here I remain. We went this morning to see the cotton burning, a sight never before witnessed and probably never again to be seen. Wagons, drays, everything that can be driven or rolled, were loaded with the bales and taken a few squares back to burn on the commons. Negroes were running around, cutting them open, piling them up, and setting them afire. All were as busy as though their salvation depended on disappointing the Yankees. Later, Charlie sent for us to come to the river and see him fire a flatboat loaded with the precious material for which the Yankees are risking their bodies and souls. Up and down the levee, as far as we could see, Negroes were rolling it down to the brink of the river, where they would set them afire and push the bales in to float burning down the tide. Each sent up its wreath of smoke and looked like a tiny steamer puffing away. Only I doubt that from the source to the mouth of the river there are as many boats afloat on the Mississippi. The flatboat was piled with as many bales as it could hold without sinking. Most of them were cut open, while Negroes staved in the heads of barrels of alcohol, whiskey, etc., and dashed buckets full over the cotton. Others built up little chimneys of pine every few feet, lined with pine knots and loose cotton, to burn more quickly. There, piled the length of the whole levee, or burning in the river, lay the work of thousands of Negroes for more than a year past. It had come from every side. Men stood by who owned the cotton that was burning or waiting to burn. They either helped or looked on cheerfully. Charlie owned but sixteen bales, a matter of some fifteen hundred dollars, but he was the head man of the whole affair and burned his own as well as the property of others. A single barrel of whiskey that was thrown on the cotton cost the man who gave it one hundred and twenty-five dollars. It shows what a nation in earnest is capable of doing. Only two men got on the flatboat with Charlie when it was ready. It was towed to the middle of the river, set afire in every place, and then they jumped into a little skiff fastened in front and rowed to land. The cotton floated down the Mississippi, one sheet of living flame, even in the sunlight. It would have been grand at night. But then we will have fun watching it this evening anyway, for they cannot get through today, though no time is to be lost. Hundreds of bales remained untouched. An incredible amount of property has been destroyed today, but no one begrudges it. Every grog shop has been emptied, and gutters and pavements are floating with liquors of all kinds, so that if the Yankees are fond of strong drink, they will fare ill. 
Yesterday, Mr. Hutchinson and a Dr. Moffat called to ask for me with a message about Jimmy. I was absent, but they saw Lily. Jimmy, they said, was safe. Though sick in bed, he had sprung up and had rushed to the wharf at the first tap of the alarm bell in New Orleans. But as nothing could be done, he would probably be with us today, bringing Mother and Miriam. I have neither heard nor seen more. The McRae, they said, went to the bottom with the others. They did not know whether anyone aboard had escaped. God be praised that Jimmy was not on her then. The new boat to which he was appointed is not yet finished, so he is saved." I am distressed about Captain Huger, and could not refrain from crying, he was so good to Jimmy. But I remembered Miss Cammack might think it rather tender and obtrusive, so I dried my eyes and began to hope he had escaped. Oh, how glad I should be to know he has suffered no harm. Mr. Hutchinson was on his way above, going to join others where the final battle is to be fought on the Mississippi. He had not even time to sit down, so I was doubly grateful to him for his kindness. I wish I could have thanked him for being so considerate of me in my distress now. In her agitation Lily gave him a letter I had been writing to George when I was called away, and begged him to address it and mail it at Vicksburg or somewhere, for no mail will leave here for Norfolk for a long while to come. The odd part is that he does not know George, but he said he would gladly take charge of it and remember the address, which Lily told him was Richmond. Well, if the Yankees get it they will take it for an insane scrawl. I wanted to calm his anxiety about us, though I was so wildly excited that I could only say, Don't mind us, we are safe, but fight, George, fight for us. The repetition was ludicrous. I meant so much, too. I only wanted him to understand he could best defend us there. Ah, Mr. Yankee, if you had but your brothers in this world, and their lives hanging by a thread, you too might write wild letters." and if you want to know what an excited girl can do, just call and let me show you the use of a small seven-shooter and a large carving-knife which vibrate between my belt and my pocket, always ready for emergencies. April 27th. What a day! Last night came a dispatch that New Orleans was under British protection and could not be bombarded. Consequently, the enemy's gunboats would probably be here this morning, such few as had succeeded in passing the forts, from nine to fifteen, it was said. And the forts, they said, had not surrendered. I went to church, but I grew very anxious before it was over, feeling that I was needed at home. When I returned, I found Lily wild with excitement, picking up hastily whatever came to hand, preparing for instant flight she knew not where. The Yankees were in sight, the town was to be burned, we were to run to the woods, etc. If the house had to be burned, I had to make up my mind to run, too. So my treasure-bag tied around my waist as a bustle, a sack with a few necessary articles hanging on my arm, some few quite unnecessary ones, too, as I had not the heart to leave the old and new prayer-books father had given me, and Miriam's, too, pistol and carving-knife ready, I stood awaiting the exodus. I heaped on the bed the treasures I wanted to burn, matches lying ready to fire the hole at the last minute. I may here say that, when all was over, I found I had omitted many things from the Holocaust. This very diary was not included. It would have afforded vast amusement to the Yankees. There may yet be occasion to burn them, and the house also. People fortunately changed their minds about the auto de fe just then, and the Yankees have not yet arrived at sundown. So when the excitement calmed down, poor Lily tumbled in bed in a high fever in consequence of terror and exertion. A page torn out. I was right in that prophecy, for this was not the Will Pinckney I saw last. So woe-begone, so subdued, careworn, and sad, no trace of his once merry self. He is good-looking, which he never was before, but I would rather never have seen him than have found him so changed. I was talking to a ghost. 
His was a sad story. He had held one bank of the river until forced to retreat with his men, as their cartridges were exhausted and General Lovell omitted sending more. They had to pass through swamps, wading seven and a half miles up to their waists in water. He gained the edge of the swamp, saw they were over the worst, and fell senseless. Two of his men brought him milk and woke him up, he said. His men fell from exhaustion, were lost, and died in the swamp, so that out of five hundred but one hundred escaped. This he told quietly and sadly, looking so heartbroken that it was piteous to see such pain. He showed me his feet, with thick clumsy shoes which an old negro had pulled off to give him, for his were lost in the swamp, and he came out barefooted. They reached the La Fourche River, I believe, seized a boat, and arrived here last night. His wife and child were aboard. Heaven knows how they got there. The men he sent on to Port Hudson, while he stopped here. I wanted to bring his wife to stay with us, but he said she could not bear to be seen, as she had run off just as she had happened to be at that moment. In half an hour he would be off to take her to his old home in a carriage. There he would rejoin his men on the railroad, and march from Clinton to the Jackson Road, and so on to Corinth. A long journey for men so disheartened, but they will conquer in the end. Beauregard's army will increase rapidly at this rate. The whole country is aroused, and every man who owns a gun, and many who do not, are on the road to Corinth. We will conquer yet. May 5th. Vile old Yankee boats, four in number, passed up this morning without stopping. After all our excitement, this silent contempt annihilated me. What in the world do they mean? The river was covered with burning cotton. Perhaps they wanted to see where it came from. May 9th. Our lawful, question mark, owners have at last arrived. About sunset, day before yesterday, the Iroquois anchored here, and a graceful young Federal stepped ashore, carrying a Yankee flag over his shoulder, and asked the way to the mayor's office. I like the style. If we girls of Baton Rouge had been at the landing instead of the men, that Yankee would never have insulted us by flying his flag in our faces. We would have opposed his landing except under a flag of truce. But the men let him alone, and he even found a poor Dutchman willing to show him the road. He did not accomplish much, said a formal demand would be made next day, and asked if it was safe for the men to come ashore and buy a few necessaries, when he was assured the air of Baton Rouge was very unhealthy for Yankee soldiers at night. He promised very magnanimously not to shell us out if we did not molest him, but I notice none of them dare set their feet on terra firma except the officer, who has now called three times on the mayor, and who is said to tremble visibly as he walks the streets. Last evening came the demand. The town must be surrendered immediately, the federal flag must be raised, and they would grant us the same terms they granted New Orleans. Jolly terms those were. The answer was worthy of a southerner. It was... The town was defenseless. If we had cannon, there were not men enough to resist. But if forty vessels lay at the landing, it was intimated we were in their power and more ships coming up, we would not surrender. If they wanted, they might come and take us. If they wished the federal flag hoisted over the arsenal, they might put it up for themselves. The town had no control over government property. Glorious! What a pity they did not shell the town! but they are taking us at our word, and this morning they are landing at the garrison. All devices, signs, and flags of the Confederacy shall be suppressed, so says Picayune Butler. Good. I devote all my red, white, and blue silk to the manufacture of Confederate flags. As soon as one is confiscated, I make another, until my ribbon is exhausted, when I will sport a duster emblazoned in high colors, Hurrah for the bonny blue flag! Henceforth I wear one pinned to my bosom, not a duster but a little flag, and the man who says take it off will have to pull it off for himself. The man who dares attempt it, well, a pistol in my pocket fills up the gap. 
I am capable, too. This is a dreadful war to make even the hearts of women so bitter. I hardly know myself these last few weeks. I, who have such a horror of bloodshed, consider even killing in self-defense murder, who cannot wish them the slightest evil, whose only prayer is to have them sent back in peace to their own country, I talk of killing them. For what else do I wear a pistol and carving knife? I'm afraid I will try them on the first one who says an insolent word to me, yes, and repent it for ever after in sackcloth and ashes. Oh, if only I was a man! Then I could don the breeches and slay them with a will. If some few southern women were in the ranks, they could set the men an example they would not blush to follow. Pshaw! There are no women here. We are all men. May 10th. Last night, about one o'clock, I was awakened and told that Mother and Miriam had come. Oh, how glad I was! I tumbled out of bed half asleep and hugged Miriam in a dream, but waked up when I got to Mother. They came up under a flag of truce on a boat going up for provisions, which, by the way, was brought to by half a dozen Yankee ships in succession, with a threat to send a broadside into her if she did not stop. The wretches knew it must be under a flag of truce. No boats leave except by special order to procure provisions. What tales they had to tell! They were on the wharf and saw the ships sail up the river, saw the broadside fired into Will Pinckney's regiment, the boats we fired, our gunboats floating down to meet them all wrapped in flames, twenty thousand bales of cotton blazing in a single pile, molasses and sugar thrown over everything. They stood there opposite to where one of the ships landed, expecting a broadside, and resolute not to be shot in the back. I wish I had been there. And Captain Huger is not dead. They had hopes of his life for the first time day before yesterday. Miriam saw the ball that had just been extracted. He will probably be lame for the rest of his life. It will be a glory to him. For even the Federal officers say that never did they see so gallant a little ship, or one that fought so desperately as the McRae. Men and officers fought like devils. Think of all those great leviathons after the poor little widow Mickey. One came tearing down on her sideways, while the Brooklyn fired on her from the other side, when brave Captain Worley put the nose of the Manassas under the first, and tilted her over so that the whole broadside passed over instead of through the McRae, who spit back its poor little fire at both. And after all was lost, she carried the wounded and the prisoners to New Orleans, and was scuttled by her own men in port glorious Captain Huger, and think of his sending word to Jimmy, suffering as he was, that his little brass cannon was game to the last. Oh, I hope he will recover. Brave daredevil Captain Worley is prisoner, and on the way to Fort Warren, that home of all brave patriotic men. We'll have him out. And my poor little Jimmy, if I have not spoken of him, it is not because I have lost sight of him for a moment. The day the McRae went down, he arose from his bed, ill as he was, and determined to rejoin her, as his own boat, the Mississippi, was not ready. When he reached the St. Charles, he fell so very ill that he had to be carried back to Brothers. Only his desperate illness saved him from being among the killed or wounded on that gallant little ship. A few days after, he learned the fate of the ship, and was told that Captain Huger was dead. No wonder he should cry so bitterly, for Captain Huger was as tender and as kind to him as his own dear father. God bless him for it. The enemy's ships were sailing up, so he threw a few articles in a carpet-bag and started off for Richmond, Corinth, anywhere to fight. Sick, weak, hardly able to stand, he went off, two weeks ago yesterday. We know not where, and we have never heard from him since. Whether he succumbed to that jaundice and the rest, and lies dead or dying on the road, God only knows. We can only wait and pray God to send dear little Jimmy home in safety. And this is war. 
Heaven save me from like scenes and experiences again. I was wild with excitement last night when Miriam described how the soldiers, marching to the depot, waved their hats to the crowds of women and children, shouting, God bless you, ladies, we will fight for you. And they, waving their handkerchiefs, sobbed with one voice, God bless you, soldiers, fight for us. We, too, have been having our fun. Early in the evening, four more gunboats sailed up here. We saw them from the corner, three squares off, crowded with men, even up in the riggings. The American flag was flying from every peak. It was received in profound silence by the hundreds gathered on the banks. I could hardly refrain from a groan. Much as I once loved that flag, I hate it now. I came back and made myself a Confederate flag about five inches long, slipped the staff in my belt, pinned the flag to my shoulder, and walked downtown to the consternation of women and children who expected something awful to follow. An old negro cried, My young missus got her flag flyin' anyhow. Nettie made one and hid it in the folds of her dress. But we were the only two who ventured. We went to the State House Terrace and took a good look at the Brooklyn, which was crowded with people who took a good look at us likewise. The picket stationed at the garrison took alarm at half a dozen men on horseback and ran, saying that the citizens were attacking. The kind officers aboard the ship sent us word that if they were molested the town would be shelled. Let them. Butchers. Does it take thirty thousand men and millions of dollars to murder defenseless women and children? Oh, the great nation! Bravo! May 11th. I, I am disgusted with myself. No unusual thing, but I am peculiarly disgusted this time. Last evening I went to Mrs. Bruno's without an idea of going beyond, with my flag flying again. They were all going to the State House, so I went with them. To my great distress, some fifteen or twenty Federal officers were standing on the first terrace, stared at like wild beasts by the curious crowd. I had not expected to meet them, and felt a painful conviction that I was unnecessarily attracting attention by an unladylike display of defiance from the crowd gathered there. But what was I to do? I felt humiliated, conspicuous, everything that is painful and disagreeable. But strike my colors in the face of the enemy? Never. Nettie and Sophie had them, too, but that was no consolation for the shame I suffered by such a display so totally distasteful to me. How I wished myself away, and chafed at my folly, and hated myself for being there and every one for seeing me. I hope it will be a lesson to me always to remember a lady can gain nothing by such a display. I was not ashamed of the flag of my country. I proved that by never attempting to remove it in spite of my mortification. But I was ashamed of my position, for these are evidently gentlemen, not the Billy Wilson's crew we were threatened with. Fine, noble-looking men they were, showing refinement and gentlemanly bearing in every motion. One cannot help but admire such foes. They set us an example worthy of our imitation, and one we would be benefited by following. They come as visitors, without either pretensions to superiority or the insolence of conquerors. They walk quietly their way, offering no annoyance to the citizens, though they themselves are stared at most unmercifully and pursued by crowds of ragged little boys, while even men gape at them with open mouths. They prove themselves gentlemen, while many of our citizens have proved themselves bores, and I admire them for their conduct. With a conviction that I had allowed myself to be influenced by bigoted, narrow-minded people in believing them to be unworthy of respect or regard, I came home wonderfully changed in all my newly acquired sentiments, resolved never more to wound their feelings, who were so careful of ours, by such unnecessary display, and I hung my flag on the parlour mantel, there to wave, if it will, in the shades of private life but to make a show, make me conspicuous and ill at ease as I was yesterday, never again. 
There was a dozen officers in church this morning, and the psalms for the eleventh day seemed so singularly appropriate to the feelings of the people that I felt uncomfortable for them. They answered with us, though. May 14th. I am beginning to believe that we are even of more importance in Baton Rouge than we thought we were. It is laughable to hear the things a certain set of people, who know they can't visit us, say about the whole family. When father was alive they dared not talk about us aloud beyond calling us the proud Morgans and the aristocracy of Baton Rouge. But now father is gone, the people imagine we are public property, to be criticized, vilified, and abused to their heart's content. And now, because they find absurdities don't succeed, they try improbabilities. So yesterday the town was in a ferment because it was reported the federal officers had called on the Miss Morgans, and all the gentlemen were anxious to hear how they had been received. One had the grace to say, if they did, they received the best lesson there that they could get in town. Those young ladies would meet them with a true southern spirit. The rest did not know. They would like to find out. I suppose the story originated from the fact that we were unwilling to blackguard, yes, that is the word, the federal officers here, and would not agree with many of our friends in saying they were liars, thieves, murderers, scoundrels, the scum of the earth, etc. Such epithets are unworthy of ladies, I say, and do harm, rather than advance our cause. Let them be what they will, it shall not make me less the lady. I say it is unworthy of anything except low newspaper war such abuse, and I will not join in. I have a brother-in-law in the Federal Army whom I love and respect as much as anyone in the world, and shall not readily agree that his being a northerner would give him an irresistible desire to pick my pockets and take from him all power of telling the truth. No, there are few men I admire more than Major Drum, and I honor him for his independence in doing what he believes right. Let us have liberty of speech and action in our land, I say, but not gross abuse and calumny. Shall I acknowledge that the people we so recently called our brothers are unworthy of consideration, and are liars, cowards, dogs? Not I. If they conquer us, I acknowledge them as a superior race. I will not say that we were conquered by cowards, for where would that place us? It will take a brave people to gain us, and that the northerners undoubtedly are. I would scorn to have an inferior foe. I fight only my equals. These women may acknowledge that cowards have won battles in which their brothers were engaged, but I, I will ever say mine fought against brave men and won the day. Which is most honorable? I was never a secessionist, for I quietly adopted father's views on political subjects without meddling with them. But even father went over with his state, and when so many outrages were committed by the fanatical leaders of the North, though he regretted the Union, said, Fight to the death for our liberty. I say so too. I want to fight until we win the cause that so many have died for. I don't believe in secession, but I do in liberty. I want the South to conquer, dictate its own terms, and go back to the Union, for I believe that apart, inevitable ruin awaits both. It is a rope of sand, this Confederacy, founded on the doctrine of secession, and will not last many years, not five. The North cannot subdue us. We are too determined to be free. They have no right to confiscate our property to pay debts they themselves have incurred death as a nation rather than union on such terms. We will have our rights secured on so firm a basis that it can never be shaken. If by power of overwhelming numbers they conquer us, it will be a barren victory over a desolate land. We, the natives of this loved soil, will be beggars in a foreign land. We will not submit to despotism under the garb of liberty." the North will find herself burdened with an unparalleled debt, with nothing to show for it except deserted towns, burning homes, a standing army which will govern with no small caprice, and an impoverished land. If that be treason, make the best of it. 
May 17th. One of these days, when peace is restored and we are quietly settled in our allotted corners of this wide world without any particularly exciting event to alarm us, and with the knowledge of what is now the future and will then be the dead past, seeing that all has been for the best for us in the end, that all has come right in spite of us, we will wonder how we could ever have been foolish enough to await each hour in such breathless anxiety. We will ask ourselves if it was really true that nightly, as we lay down to sleep, we did not dare plan for the morning, feeling that we might be homeless and beggars before the dawn. How unreal it will then seem! We will say it was our wild imagination, perhaps. But how bitterly, horribly true it is now! Four days ago the Yankees left us to attack Vicksburg leaving their flag flying in the garrison without a man to guard it, and with the understanding that the town would be held responsible for it. It was intended for a trap, and it succeeded. For night before last it was pulled down and torn to pieces. Now, unless Will will have the kindness to sink a dozen of their ships up there, I hear he has command of the lower batteries, they will be back in a few days and will execute their threat of shelling the town. If they do, what will become of us? All we expect in the way of earthly property is as yet mere paper, which will be so much trash if the South is ruined, as it consists of debts due father by many planters for professional services rendered, who of course will be ruined too, so all money is gone. That is nothing. We will not be ashamed to earn our bread, so let it go." but this house is at least a shelter from the weather, all sentiment apart. And our servants, too, how could they manage without us? The Yankees on the river and a band of guerrillas in the woods are equally anxious to precipitate a fight. Between the two fires, what chance for us? It would take only a little while to burn the city over our heads. They say the women and children must be removed, these guerrillas. Where, please? Charlie says we must go to Greenwell, and have this house pillaged, for Butler has decreed that no unoccupied house shall be respected. If we stay through the battle, if the Federals are victorious, we will suffer, for the officers here were reported to have said, if the people here did not treat them decently, they would know what it was when Billy Wilson's crew arrived. They would give them a lesson." That select crowd is now in New Orleans. Heaven help us when they reach here. It is in these small cities that the greatest outrages are perpetrated. What are we to do? A new proclamation from Butler has just come. It seems that the ladies have an ugly way of gathering their skirts when the Federals pass to avoid any possible contact. Some even turn up their noses, unladylike to say the least but it is maybe owing to the odor they have, which is said to be unbearable even at this early season of the year. Butler says, whereas the so-called ladies of New Orleans insult his men and officers, he gives one and all permission to insult any and all who so treat them then and there, with the assurance that the women will not receive the slightest protection from the government, and that the men will all be justified." I did not have time to read it, but repeat it as it was told me by mother, who is in utter despair at the brutality of the thing. These men are brothers, not mine. Let us hope for the honor of their nation that Butler is not counted among the gentlemen of the land. And so, if any man should fancy he cared to kiss me, he could do so under the pretext that I had pulled my dress from under his feet." that will justify them, and if we decline their visits they can insult us under the plea of a prior affront. Oh, Gibbs, George, Jimmy, never did we need your protection as sorely as now, and not to know even whether you are alive. When Charlie joins the army we will be defenseless indeed. Come to my bosom, O oh my discarded carving-knife, laid aside under the impression that these men were gentlemen. We will be close friends once more, and if you must have a sheath, perhaps I may find one for you in the heart of the first man who attempts to butlerize me. 
I never dreamed of kissing any man save my father and brothers, and why any one should care to kiss any one else I fail to understand, and I do not propose to learn to make exceptions. Still no word from the boys. We hear that Norfolk has been evacuated, but no details. George was there. Gibbs is wherever Johnston is, presumably on the Rappahannock, but it is more than six weeks since we have heard from either of them, and all communication is cut off. May 21st. I have had such a search for shoes this week that I am disgusted with shopping. I am triumphant now, for after traversing the town in every direction and finding nothing, I finally discovered a pair of boots, just made for a little negro to go fishing with, and only an inch and a half too long for me besides being unbendable. But I seized them with avidity, and the little negro would have been outbid if I had not soon after discovered a pair more seemly, if not more serviceable, which I took without further difficulty. Behold my tender feet cased in crocodile skin, patent leather tipped, low quarter boy's shoes number two. What a fall there was, my country, from my pretty English glove kid, to sabots made of some animal closely connected with the hippopotamus, a dernier roseau vraiment, for my choice was that, or cooling my feet on the burning pavement au naturel, I who have such a terror of any one seeing my naked foot, and this is thanks to war and blockade, not a decent shoe in the whole community." N'importe. Better days are coming. We'll all have shoes, after a while, perhaps. Why did not Mark Tapley leave me a song calculated to keep the spirits up under depressing circumstances? I need one very much, and have nothing more suggestive than the old Methodist hymn, Better days are coming, we'll all go right, which I shout so constantly as our prospects darken that it begins to sound stale. May 27th. The cry is, Ho for Greenwell. Very probably this day week will see us there. I don't want to go. If we were at peace and were to spend a few months of the warmest season out there, no one would be more eager and delighted than I. But to leave our comfortable home and all it contains, for a rough pine cottage seventeen miles away even from this scanty civilization, is sad. It must be. We are hourly expecting two regiments of Yankees to occupy the garrison, and some fifteen hundred of our men are awaiting them a little way off, so the fight seems inevitable. And we must go, leaving what little has already been spared us to the tender mercy of northern volunteers, who, from the specimen of plundering they gave us two weeks ago, will hardly leave us even the shelter of our roof. Oh, my dear home, how can I help but cry at leaving you forever? For if this fight occurs, never again shall I pass the threshold of this house, where we have been so happy and sad, the scene of joyous meetings and mournful partings, the place where we greeted each other with glad shouts after even so short a parting, the place where Harry and father kissed us good-bye and never came back again. I know what Lavinia has suffered this long year by what we have suffered these last six weeks. Poor Lavinia, so far away, how easier poverty, if it must come, would be if we could bear it together. I wonder if the real fate of the boys, if we ever hear, can be so dreadful as this suspense. Still no news of them. My poor little Jimmy! and think how desperate Gibbs and George will be when they read Butler's proclamation, and they not able to defend us. Gibbs was in our late victory of Fredericksburg, I know. In other days, going to Greenwell was the signal for general noise and confusion. All the boys gathered their guns and fishing tackle, and thousand and one amusements. Father sent out provisions. We helped Mother pack. Hal and I tumbled over the libraries to lay in a supply of reading material, and all was bustle until the carriage drove to the door at daylight one morning and swept us off. It is not so gay this time. 
I wandered around this morning, selecting books alone. We can only take what is necessary, the rest being left to the care of the northern militia in general. I never knew before how many articles were perfectly indispensable to me. This or that little token or keepsake, piles of letters I hate to burn, many dresses, etc., I cannot take conveniently, lie around me, and I hardly know which to choose among them, yet half must be sacrificed. I can only take one trunk. End of Book One, Part Two Book One, Part Three of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book One, Part Three, May thirtieth, eighteen sixty two. May 30th, Greenwell. After all our trials and tribulations, here we are at last, and no limbs lost. How many weeks ago was it since I wrote here? It seems very long after all these events. Let me try to recall them. Wednesday the 28th, a day to be forever remembered, as luck would have it, we rose very early and had breakfast sooner than usual, it would seem for the express design of becoming famished before dinner. I picked up some of my letters and papers and set them where I could find them whenever we were ready to go to Greenwell, burning a pile of trash and leaving a quantity equally worthless, which were of no value even to myself except from association. I was packing up my travelling desk with all Harry's little articles that were left to me and other things, and I was saying to myself that my affairs were in such confusion that if obliged to run unexpectedly I would not know what to save, when I heard Lily's voice downstairs crying as she ran in, she had been out shopping, "'Mr. Castle has killed a Federal officer on a ship, and they are going to shell!' Bang! went a cannon at the word, and that was all our warning. Mother had just come in and was lying down, but sprang to her feet and added her screams to the general confusion. Miriam, who had been searching the libraries, ran up to quiet her. Lily gathered her children, crying hysterically all the time, and ran to the front door with them as they were. Lucy saved the baby, naked as she took her from her bath, only throwing a quilt over her. I bethought me of my running bag, which I had used on a former case, and in a moment my few precious articles were secured under my hoops, and with a sunbonnet on I stood ready for anything. The firing still continued. They must have fired half a dozen times before we could coax mother off. What awful screams! I had hoped never to hear them again after Harry died. Charlie had gone to Greenwell before daybreak to prepare the house, so we four women, with all those children and servants, were left to save ourselves. I did not forget my poor little Jimmy. I caught up his cage and ran down. Just at this moment mother recovered enough to insist on saving father's papers, which was impossible, as she had not an idea of where the important ones were. I heard Miriam plead, argue, insist, command her to run. Lily shriek and cry she should go. The children screaming within, women running by without, crying and moaning. But I could not join in. I was going I knew not where. It was impossible to take my bird, for even if I could carry him he would starve. So I took him out of his cage, kissed his little yellow head, and tossed him up. He gave one feeble little chirp as if to ascertain where to go, and then for the first and last time I cried, laying my head against the gate-post, and with my eyes too dim to see him. Oh, how it hurt me to lose my little bird, one Jimmy had given me too. But the next minute we were all off in safety. A square from home I discovered that boy shoes were not the most comfortable things to run in, so I ran back, in spite of cannonading, entreaties, etc., to get another pair. 
I got home, found an old pair that were by no means respectable, which I seized without hesitation, and, being perfectly at ease, thought it would be so nice to save at least Miriam's and my toothbrushes, so slipped them in my corsets. These in, of course we must have a comb, that was added. Then how could we stand the sun without starch to cool our faces? This included the powder bag. Then I must save that beautiful lace collar, and my hair was tumbling down, so in went the tucking comb and hairpins with the rest, until, if there had been any one to speculate, they would have wondered a long while at the singular appearance of a girl who is considered as very slight, usually. By this time Miriam, alarmed for me, returned to find me, though urged by Dr. Castleton not to risk her life by attempting it, and we started off together. We had hardly gone a square when we decided to return a second time and get at least a few articles for the children and ourselves, who had nothing except what we happened to have on when the shelling commenced. She picked up any little things and threw them to me, while I filled a pillowcase jerked from the bed and placed my powder and brushes in it with the rest. Before we could leave, Mother, alarmed for us both, came to find us with Tish. Note, Tish was Mrs. Morgan's maid. All this time they had been shelling, but there was quite a lull when she got there, and she commenced picking up Father's papers, vowing all the time she would not leave. Every argument we could use was of no avail, and we were desperate as to what course to pursue, when the shelling recommenced in a few minutes. Then Mother recommenced her screaming, and was ready to fly anywhere, and, holding her box of papers, with a faint idea of saving something, she picked up two dirty underskirts and an old cloak. By dint of Miriam's vehement appeals, aided by a great deal of pulling, we got her down to the back door. We had given our pillowcase to Tish, who added another bundle and all our silver to it, and had already departed. As we stood in the door, four or five shells sailed over our heads at the same time, seeming to make a perfect corkscrew of the air, for it sounded as though it went in circles. Miriam cried, "'Never mind the door!' Mother screamed anew, and I stayed behind to lock the door, with this new music in my ears." we reached the back gate that was on the street when another shell passed us and miriam jumped behind the fence for protection we had only gone half a square when dr castleton begged us to take another street as they were firing up that one we took his advice but found our new street worse than the old for the shells seemed to whistle their strange songs with redoubled vigour the height of my ambition was now attained. I had heard Jimmy laugh about the singular sensation produced by the rifled balls spinning around one's head, and here I heard the same peculiar sound, ran the same risk, and was equal to the rest of the boys, for was I not in the midst of flying shells, in the middle of a bombardment? I think I was rather proud of it. We were alone on the road, all had run away before, so I thought it was for our special entertainment, this little affair. I cannot remember how long it lasted. I am positive that the clock struck ten before I left home, but I had been up so long I know not what time it began, though I was told it was between eight and nine. We passed the graveyard, we did not even stop, and about a mile and a half from home, when Mother was perfectly exhausted with fatigue and unable to proceed farther, we met a gentleman in a buggy who kindly took charge of her and our bundles. We could have walked miles beyond then, for as soon as she was safe we felt as though a load had been removed from our shoulders, and after exhorting her not to be uneasy about us, and reminding her we had a pistol and a dagger, I had secured a for true one the day before, fortunately, she drove off and we trudged on alone, the only people in sight on foot, though occasionally carriages and buggies would pass going towards town. One party of gentlemen put their heads out, and one said, "'There are Judge Morgan's daughters sitting by the road.' But I observe he did not offer them the slightest assistance. 
However, others were very kind. One I never heard of had volunteered to go for us and bring us to mother when she was uneasy about our staying so long when we went home to get clothes. We heard him ring and knock, but thinking it must be next door paid no attention, so he went back and mother came herself. We were two miles away when we sat down by the road to rest and have a laugh. Here were two women married and able to take care of themselves, flying for their lives and leaving two lorn girls alone on the road to protect each other. To be sure, neither could help us, and one was not able to walk, and the other had helpless children to save. But it was so funny when we talked about it, and thought how sorry both would be when they regained their reason. While we were yet resting, we saw a cart coming, and giving up all idea of our walking to Greenwell, called the people to stop. To our great delight it proved to be a cart loaded with Mrs. Bruno's affairs, driven by two of her negroes, who kindly took us up with them on the top of their luggage. And we drove off in state, as much pleased at riding in that novel place as though we were accustomed to ride in wheelbarrows. Miriam was in a hollow between a flour barrel and a mattress, and I at the end, astride, I am afraid, of a tremendous bundle, for my face was down the road and each foot resting very near the sides of the cart. I tried to make a better arrangement, though, after a while. These servants were good enough to lend us their umbrella, without which I am afraid we would have suffered severely, for the day was intensely warm. Three miles from town we began to overtake the fugitives. Hundreds of women and children were walking along, some bareheaded and in all costumes. Little girls of twelve and fourteen were wandering on alone. I called to one I knew and asked where her mother was. She didn't know. She would walk on until she found out. It seems her mother lost a nursing baby, too, which was not found until ten that night. White and black were all mixed together, and were as confidential as though related. All called to us and asked where we were going, and many we knew laughed at us for riding on a cart, but as they had walked only five miles I imagined they would like even these poor accommodations if they were in their reach. The Negroes deserve the greatest praise for their conduct. Hundreds were walking with babies or bundles asked them what they had saved, it was invariably, my mistress's clothes or silver or baby. Ask what they had for themselves, it was, bless your heart, honey, I was glad to get away with mistress's things, I didn't think about mine. It was a heart-rending scene, women searching for their babies along the road where they had been lost, others sitting in the dust, crying and wringing their hands, for by this time we had not an idea but what Baton Rouge was either in ashes or being plundered, and we had saved nothing. I had one dress, Miriam too, but Tish had them, and we had lost her before we left home. Presently we came on a guerrilla camp. Men and horses were resting on each side of the road, some sick, some moving about carrying water to the women and children, and all looking like a monster barbecue, for as far as the eye could see through the woods was the same repetition of men and horses. They would ask for the news, and one, drunk with excitement or whiskey, informed us that it was our own fault if we had saved nothing. The people must have been blank, fools, not to have known trouble would come before long, and that it was the fault of the men who were aware of it that the women were thus forced to fly. In vain we pleaded that there was no warning, no means of foreseeing this. He cried, You are ruined, so am I, and my brothers too, and by blank there is nothing left but to die now, and I'll die. Good, I said, but die fighting for us. He waved his hand, black with powder, and shouted, "'That I will, after us!' That was the only swearing gorilla we met. The others seemed to have too much respect for us to talk loud. Lucy had met us before this. 
Early in the action, Lily had sent her back to get some baby clothes, but a shell exploding within a few feet of her, she took alarm and ran up another road for three miles, when she cut across the plantations and regained the Greenwell route. It is fortunate that, without consultation, the thought of running here should have seized us all. End of Book One, Part Three Book One, Part Four of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book One, Part Four, May 31st to June 3rd, 1862. May 31st. I was interrupted so frequently yesterday that I know not how I continued to write so much. First I was sent for to go to Mrs. Bruno, who had just heard of her son's death, and who was alone with Dina. And some hours after I was sent for to see Fanny, now Mrs. Trezevant, who had just come with her husband to bring us news of George. A Mrs. Montgomery, who saw him every day at Norfolk, said Jimmy was with him, and though very sick at first, was now in good health. The first news in all that long time. When the city was evacuated, George went with his regiment seven miles from Richmond, Jimmy to the city itself as aide to Commodore Hollins. This lady brought George's opal ring and diamond pin. Howell and Mr. Badger, who had just joined the guerrillas as independents, spent the day with me. We were all in such confusion that I felt ashamed, every one as dirty as possible. I had on the same dress I had escaped in, which, though then perfectly clean, was now rather dirty. But they knew what a time we had had. To return to my journal. Lucy met Mother some long way ahead of us, whose conscience was already reproaching her for leaving us, and in answer to her, what has become of my poor girls, ran down the road to find us, for Lucy thinks the world can't keep on moving without us. When she met us she walked by the cart, and it was with difficulty we persuaded her to ride a mile. She said she felt used to walking now. About five miles from home we overtook Mother. The gentleman had been obliged to go for his wife, so Mary gave her her seat on the cart and walked with Lucy three miles beyond, where we heard that Lily and the children had arrived in a cart early in the day. All the talk by the roadside was of burning homes, houses knocked to pieces by balls, famine, murder, desolation. So I comforted myself singing, Better days are coming, and I hope to die shouting, The Lord will provide, while Lucy toiled through the sun and dust and answered with a chorus of, I'm a runnin', a runnin' up to glory. It was three o'clock when we reached Mr. David's and found Lily. How warm and tired we were! A hasty meal, which tasted like a feast after our fatigue, gave us fresh strength, and Lily and Miriam got in an old cart with the children to drive out here, leaving me with Mother and Delly to follow next day. About sunset Charlie came flying down the road on his way to town. I decided to go, and after an obstinate debate with Mother, in which I am afraid I showed more determination than amiability, I wrung a reluctant consent from her, and promising not to enter if it was being fired or plundered, drove off in triumph. It was a desperate enterprise for a young girl to enter a town full of soldiers on such an expedition at night, but I knew Charlie could take care of me, and if he was killed I could take care of myself. So I went. It was long after nine when we got there, and my first act was to look around the deserted house. What a scene of confusion! Armoires spread open with clothes tumbled in every direction, inside and out, ribbons, laces on floors, chairs overturned, my desk wide open covered with letters, trinkets, etc., bureau drawers half out, the bed filled with odds and ends of everything. I no longer recognized my little room. 
On the bolster was a little box, at the sight of which I burst out laughing. Five minutes before the alarm, Miriam had been selecting those articles she meant to take to Greenwell, and holding up her box, said, "'If we were forced to run for our lives without a moment's warning, I'd risk my life to save this rather than leave it.' Yet here lay the box, and she was safe at Greenwell. It took me two hours to pack father's papers, then I packed Miriam's trunk, then some of mother's and mine, listening all the while for a cannon, for men were constantly tramping past the house, and only on condition our guerrillas did not disturb them had they promised not to recommence the shelling. Charlie went out to hear the news, and I packed alone. It seems the only thing that saved the town was two gentlemen who rode out to the ships and informed the illustrious commander that there were no men there to be hurt, and he was only killing women and children. The answer was, he was sorry he had hurt them. He thought, of course, the town had been evacuated before the men were fools enough to fire on them, and had only shelled the principal streets to intimidate the people." These streets were the very ones crowded with flying women and children, which they must have seen with their own eyes, for those lying parallel to the river led to the garrison at one end and the crevasse at the other, which cut off all the lower roads, so that the streets he shelled were the only ones that the women could follow unless they wished to be drowned. As for the firing, four guerrillas were rash enough to fire on a yawl which was about to land without a flag of truce, killing one, wounding three, one of whom afterwards died. They were the only ones in town, there was not a cannon in our hands, even if a dozen men could be collected, and this cannonading was kept up in return for half a dozen shots from as many rifles, without even a show of resistance after. So ended the momentous shelling of Baton Rouge, during which the valiant Farragut killed one whole woman, wounded three, struck some twenty houses several times apiece, and indirectly caused the death of two little children who were drowned in their flight, one poor little baby that was born in the woods, and several cases of the same kind, besides those who will yet die from the fatigue, as Mrs. W. D. Phillips, who had not left her room since January, who was carried out in her nightgown, and is now supposed to be in a dying condition. The man who took mother told us he had taken a dying woman in the act of expiring in his buggy from her bed, and had left her a little way off, where she had probably breathed her last a few moments after. There were many similar cases. Hurrah for the illustrious Farragut, the woman-killer! It was three o'clock before I left off packing and took refuge in a tub of cold water from the dust and heat of the morning. What a luxury the water was, and when I changed my underclothes I felt like a new being. To be sure I pulled off the skin of my heel entirely where it had been blistered by the walk, dust, sun, etc., but that was a trifle, though still quite sore now. For three hours I dreamed of rifled shells and battles, and at half-past six I was up and at work again. Mother came soon after, and after hard work we got safely off at three, saving nothing but our clothes and silver. All else is gone. It cost me a pang to leave my guitar and Miriam's piano, but it seems there was no help for it, so I had to submit. It was dark night when we reached here. A bright fire was blazing in front, but the house looked so desolate that I wanted to cry. Miriam cried when I told her her piano was left behind. Supper was a new sensation, after having been without anything except a glass of clabber, no saucers, and a piece of bread since half-past six. I laid down on the hard floor to rest my weary bones, thankful that I was so fortunate as to be able to lie down at all. In my dozing state I heard the wagon come, and Miriam ordering a mattress to be put in the room for me. I could make out, "'Very well, you may take that one to Miss Eliza, but the next one shall be brought to Miss Sarah.' 
poor Miriam. She is always fighting my battles. She and the servants are always taking my part against the rest of the world. She and Lucy made a bed and rolled me in it with no more questions, and left me with damp eyes at the thought of how good and tender every one is to me. Poor Lucy picked me a dish of blackberries to await my arrival, and I was just as grateful for it, though they were eaten by someone else before I came. Early yesterday morning, Miriam, Nettie, and Sophie, who did not then know of their brother's death, went to town in a cart, determined to save some things, Miriam to save her piano. As soon as they were halfway, news reached us that anyone was allowed to enter, but no one allowed to leave the town, and all vehicles confiscated as soon as they reached there. Alarmed for their safety, mother started off to find them, and we have heard of none of them since. What will happen next? I am not uneasy. They dare not harm them. It is glorious to shell a town full of women, but to kill four lone ones is not exciting enough. End of Book One, Part Four Book One, Part Five of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book One, Part Five, June First to June Third, eighteen sixty two. June first, Sunday. From the news brought by one or two persons who managed to reach here yesterday, I am more uneasy about mother and the girls. A gentleman tells me that no one is permitted to leave without a pass, and of these, only such as are separated from their families who may have left before. All families are prohibited to leave, and furniture and other valuables also. Here is an agreeable arrangement. I saw the pass, just such as we give our Negroes, signed by a Wisconsin colonel. Think of being obliged to ask permission from some low plowman to go in or out of our own house. Cannon are planted as far out as Colonel Davidson's, six of them at our graveyard, and one or more on all the other roads. If the guerrillas do not attempt their capture, I shall take it upon myself to suggest it to the very next one I see. Even if they cannot use them, it will frighten the Yankees, who are in a state of constant alarm about them. Their reason for keeping people in town is that they hope they will not be attacked so long as our own friends remain, thereby placing us above themselves in the scale of humanity, since they acknowledge we are not brute enough to kill women and children as they did not hesitate to do. Farragut pleads that he could not restrain his men they were so enraged when the order was once given to fire, and says they would strike a few houses, though he ordered them to fire solely at horses and the clouds of dust in the street where guerrillas were supposed to be. The dust was by no means thick enough to conceal that these guerrillas were women, carrying babies instead of guns, and the horses were drawing buggies in which many a sick woman was lying. A young lady who applied to the Yankee general for a pass to come out here, having doubtless spoken of the number of women here who had fled and the position of the place, was advised to remain in town and write to the ladies to return immediately, and assure them that they would be respected and protected, etc., but that it was madness to remain at Greenwell, for a terrific battle would be fought there in a few days, and they would be exposed to the greatest danger. The girl wrote the letter, but, Mr. Fox, we are not quite such fools as to return there to afford you the protection our petticoats would secure to you, thereby preventing you from receiving condign punishment for the injuries and loss of property already inflicted upon us by you. No, we remain here, and if you are not laid low before you pass the Comite Bridge, we can take to the woods again and camp out, as many a poor woman is doing now a few miles from town. Many citizens have been arrested, and after being confined a while and closely questioned, have been released if the information is satisfactory. 
A negro man is informing on all cotton burners and violent secessionists, etc. Sunday night. The girls have just got back, riding in a mule team on top of baggage, but without either mother or any of our affairs. Our condition is perfectly desperate. Miriam had an interview with General Williams which was by no means satisfactory. He gave her a pass to leave and bring us back, for he says there is no safety here for us. He will restrain his men in town and protect the women, but once outside he will answer neither for his men nor the women and children. As soon as he gets horses enough, he passes this road going to Camp Moor with his cavalry, and then we are in greater danger than ever. Any house shut up shall be occupied by soldiers. Five thousand are there now, five more expected. What shall we do? Mother remained sending Miriam for me, determined to keep us there rather than sacrifice both our lives and property by remaining here. But then, two weeks from now, the yellow fever will break out. Mother has the greatest horror of it, and we have never had it. Dying is not much in the present state of our affairs, but the survivor will suffer even more than we do now. If we stay, how shall we live? I have seventeen hundred dollars in Confederate notes now in my running bag, and three or four in silver. The former will not be received there, the latter might last two days. If we save our house and furniture, it is at the price of starving. I am of the opinion that we should send for mother, and with what money we have, make our way somewhere in the interior, to some city where we can communicate with the boys and be advised by them. This is not living. Home is lost beyond all hope of recovery. If we wait, what we have already saved will go too. So we had better leave at once with what clothing we have, which will certainly establish us on the footing of ladies if we chance to fall among vulgar people who never look beyond. I fear the guerrillas will attack the town to-night. If they do, God help mother." General Williams offered Miriam an escort when he found she was without a protector in the most fatherly way. He must be a good man. She thanked him, but said she felt perfectly safe on that road. He bit his lip understanding the allusion and did not insist. She was to deliver a message from parties in town to the first guerrillas they met concerning the safest roads, and presently six met them and entered into conversation. She told them of the proffered escort, when one sprang forward, crying, "'Why didn't you accept, miss? The next time ask for one, and if it is at all disagreeable to you, I am the very man to rid you of such an inconvenience. I'll see that you are not annoyed long.' I am glad it was not sent. She would have reproached herself with murder for ever after. I wonder if the general would have risked it. Baton Rouge, June 3rd. Well, day before yesterday I almost vowed I would not return, and last evening I reached here. Verily, consistency, thou art a jewel. I determined to get to town to lay both sides of the question before mother— Saving home and property by remaining, thereby cutting ourselves off forever from the boys and dying of yellow fever, or flying to Mississippi, losing all save our lives. So as Mrs. Bruno was panic-stricken and determined to die in town rather than be starved at Greenwell, and was going in on the same wagon that came out the night before, I got up with her and Nettie, and left Greenwell at ten yesterday morning, bringing nothing except this old book, which I would rather not lose, as it has been an old and kind friend during these days of trouble. At first I avoided all mention of political affairs, but now there is nothing else to be thought of. If it is not burnt for treason, I will like to look it over some day, if I live. I left Greenwell without ever looking around it, beyond one walk to the hotel, so I may say I hardly know what it looks like. Miriam stayed, much against her will, I fear, to bring in our trunks if I could send a wagon. A guerrilla picket stopped us before we had gone a mile, and seemed disposed to turn us back. We said we must pass, our all was at stake. 
They then entreated us not to enter, saying it was not safe. I asked if they meant to burn it. We will help try it, was the answer. I begged them to delay the experiment until we could get away. One waved his hat to me and said he would fight for me. Hope he will, at a distance. They asked if we had no protectors. None, we said. Don't go then, and they all looked so sorry for us. We said we must. Starvation and another panic awaited us out there. Our brothers were fighting, our fathers dead. We had only our own judgment to rely on, and that told us home was the best place for us. If the town must burn, let us burn in our houses rather than be murdered in the woods. They looked still more sorry, but still begged us not to remain. We would, though, and one young boy called out as we drove off, "'What's the name of that young lady who refused the escort?' I told him, and they too expressed the greatest regret that she had not accepted. We met many on the road, nearly all of whom talked to us, and as they were most respectful in their manner, though they saw us in a mule team, we gave them all the information we could, which was all news to them, though very little. Such a ride in the hot sun, perched up in the air. One of the servants remarked, "'Miss Sarah ain't ashamed to ride in a wagon. With truth I replied, "'No, I was never so high before.' Two miles from home we met the first Federal pickets, and then they grew more numerous, until we came on a large camp near our graveyard, filled with soldiers and cannon. From first to last none refrained from laughing at us, not aloud, but they would grin and be inwardly convulsed with laughter as we passed. One laughed so comically that I dropped my veil hastily for fear he would see me smile. I could not help it. If anyone smiled at me while I was dying, I believe I would return it. We passed crowds, for it was now five o'clock, and all seemed to be promenading. There were several officers standing at the corner near our house who were very much amused at our vehicle. I did not feel like smiling then. After reducing us to riding in a mule team, they were heartless enough to laugh. I forgot them presently and gave my whole attention to getting out respectably. Now getting in a wagon is bad enough, but getting out... I hardly know how I managed it. I had fully three feet to step down before reaching the wheel. Once there the driver picked me up and set me on the pavement. The net I had gathered my hair in fell in my descent, and my hair swept down halfway between my knee and ankle in one stream. As I turned to get my little bundle, the officers had moved their position to one directly opposite to me, where they could examine me at leisure. Queens used to ride drawn by oxen hundreds of years ago, so I played this was old times, the mules were oxen, I a queen, and stalked off in a style I am satisfied would have imposed on Juno herself. When I saw them as I turned, they were perfectly quiet, but Nettie says up to that moment they had been in convulsions of laughter with their handkerchiefs to their faces. It was not polite." I found mother safe, but the house was in the most horrible confusion. Jimmy's empty cage stood by the door. It had the same effect on me that empty coffins produce on others. Oh, my birdie! At six I could no longer stand my hunger. I had fasted for twelve hours, with the exception of a mouthful of hoe-cake at eleven. I that never fasted in my life, except last Ash Wednesday, when Lydia and I tried it for breakfast, and got so sick we were glad to atone for it at dinner. So I got a little piece of bread and corned beef from Mrs. Dagra's servant, for there was not a morsel here, and I did not know where or what to buy. Presently some kind friend sent me a great shortcake, a dish of strawberry preserves, and some butter, which I was grateful for, for the fact that the old negro was giving me part of her supper made me rather sparing, though she cried, "'Eat it all, honey, I get plenty more.' Mother went to Cousin Will's, and I went to Mrs. Bruno's to sleep, and so ended my first day's ride on a mule team. Bah! 
A lady can make anything respectable by the way she does it. What do I care if I had been driving mules? Better that than walk seventeen miles. I met Dr. Duchesne and Dr. Castleton twice each this morning. They were as kind to me as they were to the girls the other day. The latter saved them a disagreeable visit while here. He and those three were packing some things in the hall when two officers passed and prepared to come in, seeing three good-looking girls seemingly alone, for Miriam's dress hid Dr. Castleton as he leaned over the box. Just then she moved, the doctor raised his head, and the officers started back with an awe of surprise. The doctor called them as they turned away, and asked for a pass for the young ladies. They came back bowing and smiling, said they would write one in the house, but they were told very dryly that there were no writing accommodations there. They tried the fascinating, and were much mortified by the coldness they met. Dear me, why wasn't I born old and ugly? Suppose I should unconsciously entrap some magnificent Yankee. What an awful thing it would be. Sentinels are stationed at every corner. Dr. Castleton piloted me safely through one expedition, but on the next we had to part company, and I passed through a crowd of at least fifty alone. They were playing cards in the ditch and swearing dreadfully, these pious Yankees. Many were marching up and down, some sleeping on the pavement, others picking odious bugs out of each other's heads. I thought of the gorillas, yellow fever and all, and wished they were all safe at home with their mothers and sisters, and we at peace again. What a day I have had! Here mother and I are alone, not a servant on the lot. We will sleep here to-night, and I know she will be too nervous to let me sleep. The dirt and confusion were extraordinary in the house. I could not stand it, so I applied myself to making it better. I actually swept two whole rooms. I ruined my hands at gardening, so it made no difference. I replaced piles of books, crockery, china that Miriam had left packed for Greenwell. I discovered I could empty a dirty hearth, dust, move heavy weights, make myself generally useful and dirty, and all this is thanks to the Yankees. Poor me! This time last year I thought I would never walk again. If I am not laid up forever after the fatigue of this last week, I shall always maintain I have a constitution. But it all seems nothing in this confusion. Everything is almost as bad as ever. Besides that, I have been flying around to get Miriam a wagon. I know she is half distracted at being there alone. Mother chose staying with all its evils. Charlie's life would pay the penalty of a cotton-burner if he returned, so Lily remains at Greenwell with him. We three will get on as best we can here. I wrote to the country to get a wagon, sent a pass from headquarters, but I will never know if it reached her until I see her in town. I hope it will. I would be better satisfied with Miriam. End of Book One, Part Five Book One, Part Six of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book One, Part Six. June Fourth to June Sixteenth, eighteen sixty two. June 4th. Miriam and Mattie drove in in the little buggy last evening after sunset to find out what we were to do. Our condition is desperate. Beauregard is about attacking these Federals. They say he is coming from Corinth, and the fight will be in town. If true, we are lost again. Starvation at Greenwell, fever and bullets here, will put an end to us soon enough. There is no refuge for us, no one to consult. Brother, whose judgment we rely on as implicitly as we did on father's, we hear has gone to New York, 
There is no one to advise or direct us, for if he is gone, there is no man in Louisiana whose decision I would blindly abide by. Let us stay and die. We can only die once. We can suffer a thousand deaths with suspense and uncertainty. The shortest is the best. Do you think the few words here can give an idea of our agony and despair? Nothing can express it. I feel a thousand years old to-day. I have shed the bitterest tears to-day that I have shed since father died. I can't stand it much longer. I'll give way presently, and I know my heart will break. Shame! Where is God? A fig for your religion if it only lasts while the sun shines. Better days are coming. I can't. Troops are constantly passing and repassing. They have scoured the country for ten miles out in search of guerrillas. We are here without servants, clothing, or the bare necessities of life. Suppose they should seize them on the way. I procured a pass for the wagon, but it now seems doubtful if I can get the latter, a very faint chance. Well, let them go, our home next, then we can die, sure enough. With God's help I can stand anything yet in store for me. I hope to die shouting, the Lord will provide. Poor Lavinia, if she could only see us, I am glad she does not know our condition. 5 p.m. What a day of agony, doubt, uncertainty, and despair! Heaven save me from another such! Every hour fresh difficulties arose, until I believe we were almost crazy, every one of us. As Miriam was about stepping in the buggy to go to Greenwell to bring in our trunks, Mother's heart misgave her, and she decided to sacrifice her property rather than remain in this state any longer. After a desperate discussion which proved that each argument was death, she decided to go back to Greenwell and give up the keys of the house to General Williams and let him do as he pleased, rather than have it broken open during her absence. Mattie and Mr. Tunnard were present at the discussion, which ended by the latter stepping in the buggy and driving Miriam to the garrison. General Williams called her by name and asked her about Major Drum. It seems all these people, native and foreign, know us, while we know none. Miriam told him our condition, how our brothers were away, father dead, and mother afraid to remain, yet unwilling to lose her property by going away, how we three were alone and unprotected here, but would remain rather than have our home confiscated. He assured her the house should not be touched that it would be respected in our absence as though we were in it, and he would place a sentinel at the door to guard it against his own men who might be disposed to enter. The latter she declined, but he said he would send his aide to mark the house that it might be known. A moment after they got back, the aide, Mr. Biddle, I have his name to so many passes that I know it now, came to the door. Mr. Tunnard left him there, uncertain how we would receive a Christian, and I went out and asked him in. He looked uncertain of his reception, too, when we put an end to his doubt by treating him as we invariably treat gentlemen who appear such. He behaved remarkably well under the trying circumstances, and insisted on a sentinel, for, he said, though they would respect the property, there were many bad characters among the soldiers who might attempt to rob it, and the sentinel would protect it. After a visit of ten minutes devoted exclusively to the affair, he arose and took his leave, leaving me under the impression that he was a gentleman wherever he came from, even if there were a few grammatical errors in the pass he wrote me yesterday. But, Thou that judgest another, dost thou sin? Well, now we say, fly to Greenwell. Yes, and by to-night a most exaggerated account of the whole affair will be spread over the whole country, and we will be equally suspected by our own people. Those who spread useless falsehoods about us will gladly have a foundation for a monstrous one. Didn't Camp Moore ring with the story of our entertaining the Federal officers? Didn't they spread the report that Miriam danced with one to the tune of Yankee Doodle in the State House garden? 
What will they stop at now? Oh, if only I was a man and knew what to do. Night. We were so distressed by the false position in which we would be placed by a federal sentinel that we did not know what course to pursue. As all our friends shook their heads and said it was dangerous, we knew full well what our enemies would say. If we win Baton Rouge, as I pray we will, they will say we asked protection from Yankees against our own men, are consequently traitors, and our property will be confiscated by our own government. To decline General Williams's kind offer exposes the house to being plundered. In our dilemma, we made up our minds to stay, so we could say the sentinel was unnecessary. Presently a file of six soldiers marched to the gate. An officer came to the steps and introduced himself as Colonel McMillan of 21st Indiana Volunteers. He asked if this was Mrs. Morgan's. The general had ordered a guard placed around the house. He would suggest placing them in different parts of the yard. Madam, the pickets await your orders. Miriam, in a desperate fright, undertook to speak for mother, and asked if he thought there was any necessity. No, but it was an additional security, he said. Then, if no actual necessity, we will relieve you of the disagreeable duty, as we expect to remain in town, she said. He was very kind and discussed the whole affair with us, saying when we made up our minds to leave, we told him after we could not decide, to write him word and he would place a guard around to prevent his men and the negroes from breaking in. It was a singular situation, our brothers off fighting them, while these federal officers leaned over our fence and an officer standing on our steps offered to protect us. These people are certainly very kind to us. General Williams especially must be a dear old gentleman. He is so good. How many good and how many mean people these troubles have shown us. I am beginning to see my true friends now. There is a large number of them, too. Everybody from whom we least expected attention has agreeably surprised us. General Williams will believe we are insane from our changing so often. His guard positively refused. June 5th. Last night I determined to stay. Miriam went after our trunks at daylight. A few hours after, Lily wrote we must go back. McClellan's army was cut to pieces and driven back to Maryland by Jackson. The Federals were being driven into the swamp from Richmond, too. Beauregard is undoubtedly coming to attack Baton Rouge. His fire would burn the town if the gunboats do not. The Yankees will shell at all events if forced to retire. It cannot stand. We can't go to New Orleans. Butler says he will lay it in ashes if he is forced to evacuate it from yellow fever or other causes. Both must be burned. Greenwell is not worth the powder it would cost, so we must stand the chance of murder and starvation there, rather than the certainty of being placed between two fires here. Well, I see nothing but bloodshed and beggary staring us in the face. Let it come. I hope to die shouting, The Lord will provide. June 6th. We dined at Mrs. Bruno's yesterday, and sitting on the gallery later had the full benefit of a Yankee drill. They stopped in front of the house and went through some very curious maneuvers, and then marched out to their drill ground beyond. In returning, the whole regiment drew up directly before us, and we were dreadfully quiet for five minutes, the most uncomfortable I have experienced for some time for it was absurd to look at the sky, and I looked in vain for one man with downcast eyes whereon I might rest mine, but from the officers down to the last private they were all looking at us. I believe I would have cried with embarrassment if the command had not been given at that moment. They drilled splendidly and knew it too, so went through it as though they had not been at it for an hour before. One conceited, red-headed lieutenant smiled at us in the most fascinating way. Perhaps he smiled to think how fine he was, and what an impression he was making. 
We got back to our solitary house before twilight and were sitting on the balcony when Mr. Biddle entered. He came to ask if the guard had been placed here last night. It seems to me it would have saved him such a long walk if he had asked Colonel McMillan. He sat down, though, and got talking in the moonlight, and people passing, some citizens, some officers, looked wonderingly at this unheard-of occurrence. I won't be rude to anyone in my own house, Yankee or Southern, say what they will. He talked a great deal and was very entertaining. What tempted him I cannot imagine. It was two hours before he thought of leaving. He was certainly very kind. He spoke of the scarcity of flour in town, said they had quantities at the garrison, and asked permission to send us a barrel, which of course we refused. It showed a very good heart, though. He offered to take charge of any letters I would write, said he had heard General Williams speak of Harry, and when he at last left I was still more pleased with him for his kindness to us. He says Captain Huger is dead. I am very, very much distressed. They are related, he says. He talks so reasonably of the war that it was quite a novelty after reading the abusive newspapers of both sides. I like him, and was sorry I could not ask him to repeat his visit. We are unaccustomed to treat gentlemen that way, but it won't do in the present state to act as we please. Mob governs. Mother kept me awake all night to listen to the mice in the garret, Every time I would doze, she would ask, "'What's that?' and insist that the mice were men. I had to get up and look for an imaginary host, so I am tired enough this morning. Miriam has just got in with all the servants. Our baggage is on the way, so we will be obliged to stay whether we will or no. I don't care. It is all the same, starve or burn. Oh, I forgot. Mr. Biddle did not write that pass. It was his clerk. He speaks very grammatically, so far as I can judge. June 8th, Sunday. These people mean to kill us with kindness. There is such a thing as being too kind. Yesterday General Williams sent a barrel of flour to Mother, accompanied by a note begging her to accept it, in consideration of the present condition of the circulating currency. And the intention was so kind, the way it was done so delicate, that there was no refusing it. I had to write her thanks, and got in a violent fit of the trembles at the idea of writing to a stranger. One consolation is that I am not a very big fool, for it took only three lines to prove myself one. If I had been a thundering big one, I would have occupied two pages to show myself fully. And to think it is out of our power to prove them our appreciation of the kindness we have universally met with. Many officers were in church this morning, and as they passed us while we waited for the door to be opened, General Williams bowed profoundly. Another followed his example. We returned the salute, of course, but by to-morrow those he did not bow to will cry treason against us. Let them howl. I am tired of lies, scandal, and deceit. All the loudest gossips have been frightened into the country, but enough remain to keep them well supplied with town talk. It is such a consolation to turn to the dear good people of the world after coming in contact with such cattle. Here, for instance, is Mr. Boncase on whom we have not the slightest claims. Every day since we have been here he has sent a great pitcher of milk, knowing our cow is out. One day he sent rice, the next sardines, yesterday two bottles of port and Madeira which cannot be purchased in the whole South. What a duck of an old man! That is only one instance. June 10th. This morning, while I was attending to my flowers, several soldiers stopped in front of me and, holding on the fence, commenced to talk about some brave colonel and a shooting affair last night. When all had gone except one who was watching me attentively, as he seemed to wish to tell me, I let him go ahead. 
The story was that Colonel McMillan was shot through the shoulder, breast, and liver by three guerrillas while four miles from town last night on a scout. He was a quarter of a mile from his own men at the time, killed one who shot him, took the other two prisoners, and fell from his horse himself when he got within the lines. The soldier said these two guerrillas would probably be hanged, while the six we saw pass captives Sunday would probably be sent to Fort Jackson for life. I think the guerrilla affair mere murder, I confess, but what a dreadful fate for these young men. One who passed Sunday was Jimmy's schoolmate, a boy of sixteen. Another, Willie Garrig, the pet of a whole family of good honest country people. These soldiers will get in the habit of talking to me after a while through my own fault. Yesterday I could not resist the temptation to ask the fate of the six guerrillas, and stopped two volunteers who were going by to ask them. They discussed the fate of the country, told me Fort Pillow and Vicksburg were evacuated, the Mississippi opened from source to mouth. I told them of Banks's and McClellan's defeat. They assured me it would all be over in a month, which I fervently pray may be so. Told me they were from Michigan, one was Mr. B., he said, cousin of our general, and they would probably have talked all day if I had not bowed myself away with thanks for their information. It made me ashamed to contrast the quiet, gentlemanly, liberal way these volunteers spoke of us and our cause, with the rabid, fanatical, abusive violence of our own female secession declaimers. Thank heaven I have never yet made my appearance as a Billingsgate orator on these occasions. All my violent feelings, which in moments of intense excitement were really violent, I have recorded in this book. I am happy to say only the reasonable dislike to seeing my country subjugated has been confided to the public ear when necessary, and that even now I confess that nothing but the reign of terror and gross prejudice by which I was surrounded at that time could justify many expressions I have here applied to them. Fact is, these people have disarmed me by their kindness. I expected to be in a crowd of ruffian soldiers who would think nothing of cutting your throat or doing anything they felt like, and I find among all these thousands not one who offers the slightest annoyance or disrespect. The former is the thing as it is believed by the whole country, the latter the true state of affairs. I admire foes who show so much consideration for our feelings. Contrast these with our volunteers from New Orleans, all gentlemen, who came to take the garrison from Major Haskins. Several of them passing our gate where we were standing with the Brunos, one exclaimed, What pretty girls! It was a stage aside that we were supposed not to hear. Yes, said another, beautiful but they look as though they could be fast. Fast? And we were not even speaking, not even looking at them. Sophie and I were walking presently and met half a dozen. We had to stop to let them pass the crossing. They did not think of making way for us. Number one sighed, such a sigh. Number two followed, and so on, when they all sighed in chorus for our edification, while we dared not raise our eyes from the ground. That is the time I would have made use of a dagger. Two passed in a buggy, and, trusting to our not recognizing them from the rapidity of their vehicle, kissed their hands to us until they were out of sight. All went back to New Orleans, vowing Baton Rouge had the prettiest girls in the world. These were our own people, the elite of New Orleans, loyal Southerners and gentlemen. These northerners pass us satisfied with a simple glance. Some take off their hats, for all these officers know our name, though we may not know theirs. How, I can't say. When I heard of Colonel McMillan's misfortune, Mother conspired with me to send over some bandages and something Tish manufactured of flour under the name of nourishment, for he is across the street at Harriman's. 
Miriam objected on account of what our people will say, and what we will suffer for it if the guerrillas reach town, but we persuaded her we were right. You can imagine our condition at present, many years hence, Sarah, when you reflect that it is the brave, noble-hearted, generous Miriam who is afraid to do that deed on account of public opinion, which is indeed down on us. At Greenwell they are frantic about our returning to town and call us traitors, Yankees, and vow vengeance. A lady said to me, the guerrillas have a blacklist containing the names of those remaining in town. All the men are to be hanged, their houses burned, and all the women are to be tarred and feathered. I said, Madam, if I believed them capable of such a vile threat even, much less the execution, I would see them cut down without a feeling of compassion, which is not true and swear I was a Yankee rather than claim being a native of the same country with such brutes. She has a long tongue. When I next hear of it, it will be that I told the story, and called them brutes, and hoped they would be shot, etc. And so goes the world. No one will think of saying that I did not believe them guilty of the thought, even. Our three brothers may be sick or wounded at this minute. What I do for this man, God will send someone to do for them. And with that belief, I do it. June 11th. Last evening, Mother and Miriam went to the arsenal to see if they would be allowed to do anything for the prisoners. General Williams received them, and fascinated Miriam by his manner as usual. Poor Miriam is always being fascinated, according to her own account. He sent for little Nathan Castle and Willie Garrig, and left them alone in the room with them, showing his confidence and delicacy by walking away. The poor young men were very grateful to be remembered. One had his eyes too full of tears to speak. Mr. Garrig told Miriam that when the story of her refusing the escort was told in camp, the woods rang with shouts of, Three cheers for Miss Morgan. They said they were treated very well and had no want except clean clothes, and to let their mothers know they were well and content. I have been hard at work mending three or four suits of the boys' clothing for those poor young men. Some needed thread and needle very much, but it was the best we could do. So I packed them all up, not forgetting a row of pins, and sent Tish off with the bundle, perched real Congo fashion on her many-colored head-handkerchief, which was tied in the most superb Creole style in honor of the occasion. June 16th, Monday. My poor old diary comes to a very abrupt end to my great distress. The hardest thing in the world is to break off journalizing when you are once accustomed to it, and mine has proved such a resource to me in these dark days of trouble that I feel as though I were saying good-bye to an old and tried friend. Thanks to my liberal supply of pens, ink, and paper, how many inexpressibly dreary days I have filled up to my own satisfaction, if not to that of others. How many disagreeable affairs it has caused me to pass over without another thought! How many times it has proved a relief to me where my tongue was forced to remain quiet! Without the blessed materials I would have fallen victim to despair and the blues long since, but they have kept my eyes fixed on better days a-coming, while slightly alluding to present woes kept me from making a fool of myself many a day, acted as lightning-rod to my mental thunder, and have made me happy generally. For all of which I cry, Vive pen, ink, and paper, and add with regret, Adieu, my mental conductor, I fear this unchained lightning will strike somewhere in your absence. End of Book One, Part Six Book Two, Part One of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Two, Part One, June Sixteenth to June Twenty Sixth, eighteen sixty two. Monday, June Sixteenth, eighteen sixty two. There is no use in trying to break off journalizing, particularly in these trying times. It has become a necessity to me. I believe I should go off in a rapid decline if Butler took it in his head to prohibit that, among other things. I reserve to myself the privilege of writing my opinions, since I trouble no one with the expression of them. I insist that if the valor and chivalry of our men cannot save our country, I would rather have it conquered by a brave race than owe its liberty to the Billingsgate oratory and demonstrations of some of these ladies. If the women have the upper hand then, as they have now, I would not like to live in a country governed by such tongues. Do I consider the female who could spit in a gentleman's face merely because he wore United States buttons as a fit associate for me? Lieutenant Biddle assured me he did not pass a street in New Orleans without being most grossly insulted by ladies. It was a friend of his into whose face a lady spit as he walked quietly by without looking at her. Wonder if she did it to attract his attention. He had the sense to apply to her husband and give him two minutes to apologize or die, and of course he chose the former. Such things are enough to disgust any one. Loud women, what a contempt I have for you! How I despise your vulgarity! Some of these ultra-secessionists, evidently very recently from down east, who think themselves obliged to kick up their heels over the bonny blue flag, as Brother describes female patriotism, shriek out, "'What, see those vile northerners pass patiently! No true southerner could see it without rage. I could kill them. I hate them with all my soul, the murderers, liars, thieves, rascals. You are no southerner if you do not hate them as much as I.' "'Ah, saw. A true blue Yankee tell me that I, born and bred here, am no Southerner. I always think it is well for you, my friend, to save your credit, else you might be suspected by some people, though your violence is enough for me. I always say, you may do as you please. My brothers are fighting for me and doing their duty, so that excess of patriotism is unnecessary for me, as my position is too well known to make any demonstrations requisite. This war has brought out wicked, malignant feelings that I did not believe could dwell in woman's heart. I see some of the holiest eyes, so holy one would think the very spirit of charity lived in them, and all Christian meekness, go off in a mad tirade of abuse, and say, with the holy eyes wondrously changed, I hope God will send down plague, yellow fever, famine on these vile Yankees, and that not one will escape death. Oh, what unutterable horror that remark causes me as often as I hear it! I think of the many mothers, wives, and sisters who wait as anxiously, pray as fervently in their faraway homes for their dear ones, as we do here. I fancy them waiting day after day for the footsteps that will never come, growing more sad, lonely, and heartbroken as the days wear on. I think of how awful it would be if one would say, Your brothers are dead, how it would crush all life and happiness out of me, and I say, God forgive these poor women, they know not what they say. O oh, women, into what loathsome violence you have abased your holy mission! God will punish us for our hard-heartedness. Not a square off in the new theatre lie more than a hundred sick soldiers. What woman has stretched out her hand to save them, to give them a cup of cold water? Where is the charity which should ignore nations and creeds, and administer help to the Indian and heathen indifferently? Gone! All gone in Union versus Secession! That is what the American War has brought us. 
If I was independent, if I could work my own will without causing others to suffer for my deeds, I would not be poring over this stupid page, I would not be idly reading or sewing. I would put aside woman's trash, take up woman's duty, and I would stand by some forsaken man and bid him Godspeed as he closes his dying eyes. That is woman's mission, and not preaching and politics. I say I would, yet here I sit. Oh, for liberty, the liberty that dares do what conscience dictates, and scorns all smaller rules. If I could help these dying men, yet it is as impossible as though I was a chained bear. I can't put out my hand. I am threatened with Coventry because I sent a custard to a sick man who is in the army, and with the anathema of society, because I said if I could possibly do anything for Mr. Biddle, at a distance, he is sick, I would like to very much. Charlie thinks we have acted shockingly in helping Colonel McMillan, and that we will suffer for it when the Federals leave. I would like to see any man who dared harm my father's daughter. But as he seems to think our conduct reflects on him, there is no alternative. Die, poor men, without a woman's hand to close your eyes. We women are too patriotic to help you. I look eagerly on, cry in my soul, I wish you die. God judges me. Behold the woman who dares not risk private ties for God's glory and her professed religion. Coward, helpless woman that I am. If I was free. June 17th. Yesterday and day before, boats were constantly arriving and troops embarking from here destined for Vicksburg. There will be another fight, and of course it will fall. I wish Will was out of it. I don't want him to die. I got the kindest, sweetest letter from Will when Miriam came from Greenwell. It was given to her by a gorilla on the road who asked if she was not Miss Sarah Morgan. June 18th. How long, oh, how long is it since I have lain down in peace, thinking, this night I will rest in safety? Certainly not since the fall of Fort Jackson. If left to myself, I would not anticipate evil, but would quietly await the issue of all these dreadful events. But when I hear men, who certainly should know better than I, express their belief that in twenty-four hours the town will be laid in ashes, I begin to grow uneasy and think it must be so, since they say it. These last few days, since the news arrived of the intervention of the English and French, I have alternately risen and fallen from the depth of despair to the height of delight and expectation, as the probability of another exodus diminishes and peace appears more probable. If these men would not prophesy the burning of the city, I would be perfectly satisfied." Well, I packed up a few articles to satisfy my conscience, since these men insist that another run is inevitable, though against my own conviction. I am afraid I was partly influenced by my dream last night of being shelled out unexpectedly and flying without saving an article. It was the same dream I had a night or two before we fled so ingloriously from Baton Rouge, when I dreamed of meeting Will Pinckney suddenly, who greeted me in the most extraordinarily affectionate manner, and told me that Vicksburg had fallen. He said he had been chiefly to blame, and the Southerners were so incensed at his losing, the Northerners at his defending, that both were determined to hang him. He was running for his life. He took me to a hill from which I could see the garrison and the American flag flying over it. I looked and saw we were standing in blood up to our knees, while here and there ghastly white bones shone above the red surface. Just then, below me, I saw crowds of people running. "'What is it?' I asked. "'It means that in another instant they will commence to shell the town. Save yourself.' "'But, Will, I must save some clothes, too. "'How can I go among strangers with a single dress? "'I will get some,' I cried. "'He smiled and said, "'You will run with only what articles you happen to have on.' 
Bang! went the first shell. The people rushed by with screams, and I awakened to tell Miriam what an absurd dream I had had. It happened, as Will had said, either that same day or the day after, for the change of clothes we saved apiece were given to Tish, who lost sight of us and quietly came home when all was over, and the two dirty skirts and old cloak mother saved, after carrying them a mile and a half, I put in the buggy that took her up, so I saved nothing except the bag that was tied under my hoops. Will was right. I saved not even my powder bag. Tish had it in the bundle. My handkerchief I gave mother before we had walked three squares, and throughout that long, fearfully warm day, riding and walking through the fiery sunshine and stifling dust, I had neither to cool or comfort me. June 19th Miriam and I have disgraced ourselves. This morning I was quietly hearing Delly's lessons, when I was startled by Mother's shrieks of, "'Send for a guard! They've murdered him!' I saw through the window a soldier sitting in the road just opposite, with blood streaming from his hand in a great pool in the dust. I was downstairs in three bounds, and snatching up some water, ran to where he sat alone, not a creature near, though all the inhabitants of our side of the street were looking on from the balconies, all crying, Murder and help, without moving themselves. I poured some water on the man's bloody hand as he held it streaming with gore up to me, saying, The man in there did it, meaning the one who keeps the little grog shop, though it puzzled me at the time to see that all the doors were closed and not a face visible. I had hardly time to speak when Tish called loudly to me to come away. She was safe at the front gate, and looking up I found myself in a knot of a dozen soldiers and took her advice and retreated home. It proved to be the guard Miriam had roused. She ran out as I did, and, seeing a gentleman, begged him to call the guard for that murdered man. The individual, he must have been a patriot, said he didn't know where to find one. She cried out they were at Harriman's. He said he didn't believe they were. "'Go, I tell you,' she screamed at last." but the brave man said he didn't like to, so she ran to the corner and called the soldiers herself. Oh, most brave man! Before we got back from our several expeditions, we heard Mother, Lily, Mrs. Day, all shouting, Bring in the children, lock the doors, etc., all for a poor wounded soldier. We after discovered that the man was drunk and had cursed the woman of the grog shop, whereupon her husband had pitched him out in the street where they found him. They say he hurt his hand against a post, but wood could never have cut deep enough to shed all that gore. I don't care if he was drunk or sober, soldier or officer, federal or confederate. If he had been Satan himself lying helpless and bleeding in the street I would have gone to him. I can't believe it was as criminal as though I had watched quietly from a distance, believing him dying and contenting myself with looking on. Yet it seems it was dreadfully indecorous. Miriam and I did very wrong. We should have shouted murder with the rest of the women and servants, whereas the man who declined committing himself by calling one soldier to the rescue of another, supposed to be dying, acted most discreetly, and showed his wisdom in the most striking manner. May I never be discreet or wise if this is Christian conduct or a sample of either. I would rather be a rash, impetuous fool. Charlie says he would not open his mouth to save a dozen from being murdered. I say I am not stoic enough for that. Lily agrees with him, Miriam with me. So here we two culprits stand alone before the tribunal of patriotism. Madame Roland, I take the liberty of altering your words and cry, O oh, patriotism, how many base deeds are sanctioned by your name! Don't I wish I was a heathen! In twenty-four hours the whole country will be down on us. O oh, for a pen to paint the slaves, whose country, like a deadly blight, closes all hearts when pity craves, and turns God's spirit to darkest night, 
May life's patriotic cup for such be filled with glory overmuch, and when their spirits go above in pride, spirit of patriotism, let these valiant abide full in the sight of grand mass meeting. I don't want you to cuss them, but put them where they can hear politics and yet can't discuss them. I can't say worse than that. June 26. Yesterday morning, just as I stepped out of bed, I heard the report of four cannon fired in rapid succession, and everybody asked everybody else, Did you hear that? So significantly, that I must say my heart beat very rapidly for a few moments at the thought of another stampede. At half-past six this morning I was awakened by another report, followed by seven others, and heard again the question, Did you hear that? on a higher key than yesterday. It did not take me many minutes to get out of bed and to slip on a few articles, I confess. My chief desire was to wash my face before running, if they were actually shelling us again. It appears that they were only practicing, however, and no harm was intended. But we are living on such a volcano that not knowing what to expect we are rather nervous." I am afraid this close confinement will prove too much for me. My long walks are cut off on account of the soldiers. One month to-morrow since my last visit to the graveyard. That haunts me always. It must be so dreary out there. Here is a sketch of my daily life, enough to finish me off forever if much longer persisted in. First, get up a little before seven. After breakfast, which is generally within a few minutes after I get down, it used to be just as I got ready, and sometimes before, last winter, I attend to my garden, which consists of two strips of ground the length of the house in front, where I can find an hour's work in examining and admiring my flowers, replanting those that the cows and horses occasionally, once a day, pull up for me, and in turning the soil over and over again to see which side grows best. Oh, my garden, abode of rare delights! How many pleasant hours I have passed in you, armed with scissors, knife, hoe, or rake, only pausing when Mr. This or Mr. That leaned over the fence to have a talk. Last spring, that was. Ever so many are dead now, for all I know, and all off at the war. Now I work for the edification of proper young women, who look in astonishment at me, as they would consider themselves degraded by the pursuit. A delicate pair of hands my flower-mania will leave me. Then I hear Delly's and Morgan's lessons, after which I open my desk and am lost in the mysteries of arithmetic, geography, Blair's lectures, Noelle Chaspal, Ollendorf, and reading aloud in French and English, besides writing occasionally in each, and sometimes a peep at La Voine, until very nearly dinner. The day is not half long enough for me. Many things I would like to study I am forced to give up for want of leisure to devote to them. But one of these days I will make up for present deficiencies. I study only what I absolutely love now, but then, if I can, I will study what I am at present ignorant of, and cultivate a taste for something new. The few moments before dinner, and all the time after, I devote to writing, sewing, knitting, etc., and if I included darning, repairs, alterations, etc., my list would be tremendous, for I get through with a great deal of sewing. Somewhere in the day I find half an hour or more to spend at the piano. Before sunset I dress, and am free to spend the evening at home, or else walk to Mrs. Bruno's, for it is not safe to go farther than those three squares away from home. From early twilight until supper, Miriam and I sing with the guitar, generally, and after sit comfortably under the chandelier and read until about ten. What little reading I do is almost exclusively done at that time. It sounds woefully little, but my list of books grows to quite a respectable size in the course of a year. At ten comes my Bible class for the servants. 
Lucy, Rose, Nancy, and Dophy assemble in my room and hear me read the Bible or stories from the Bible for a while. Then one by one say their prayers. They cannot be persuaded to say them together. Dophy says she can't say with Rose cause she ain't got no brothers and sisters to pray for. And Lucy has no father or mother and so they go. All difficulties and grievances during the day are laid before me, and I sit like Moses judging the children of Israel until I can appease the discord. Sometimes it is not so easy. For instance, that memorable night when I had to work Rose's stubborn heart to a proper pitch of repentance for having stabbed a carving fork in Lucy's arm in a fit of temper. I don't know that I was ever as much astonished as I was at seeing the dogged, sullen girl throw herself on the floor in a burst of tears and say, if God would forgive her, she would never do it again. I was lashing myself internally for not being able to speak as I should, furious at myself for talking so weakly, and lo, here the girl tumbles over, wailing and weeping. And Dophy, overcome by her feelings, sobs, "'Lucy, I scratched you last week. Please forgive me this once.' And amazed and bewildered, I look at the touching tableau before me of kissing and reconciliation, for Lucy can bear malice toward no one, and is ready to forgive before others repent. And I look from one to the other, wondering what it was that upset them so completely, for certainly no words of mine caused it. Sometimes Lucy sings a wild hymn. Did you ever hear the heaven bells ring? Come, my loving brothers, when I put on my starry crown, etc. And after some such scene as just described, it is pleasant to hear them going out of the room saying, Good night, Miss Sarah, God bless Miss Sarah, and all that. End of Book Two, Part One Book Two, Part Two of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Two, Part Two, June twenty seventh to July third, eighteen sixty two. June twenty seventh. A proclamation of Van Dorn has just been smuggled into town that advises all persons living within eight miles of the Mississippi to remove into the interior, as he is determined to defend his department at all hazards to the last extremity. Does not look like the piece I have been deluding myself with, does it? That means another exodus. How are we to leave when we are not allowed to pass the limits of the corporation by the Federals? Where are we to go? We are between the two armies, and here we must remain, patiently awaiting the result. Some of these dark nights, bang, we will hear the cannon, and then it will be sauve qui peut in a shower of shells. Bah! I don't believe God will suffer that we should be murdered in such a dreadful way. I don't believe he will suffer us to be turned homeless and naked on the world. Something will turn up before we are attacked, and we will be spared, I am certain. We can't look forward for more than an hour at a time now, sometimes not a minute ahead, witness the shelling frolic, so I must resume my old habit of laying a clean dress on my bed before going to sleep, which I did every night for six weeks before the shelling of Baton Rouge, in order to run respectably, as muslin crossbar nightgowns are not suitable for day dresses. June 28. I am afraid I shall be nervous when the moment of the bombardment actually arrives. This suspense is not calculated to soothe one's nerves. A few moments since a salute was fired in honor of General Butler's arrival, when women, children, and servants rushed to the front of the houses, confident of a repetition of the shelling which occurred a month ago to-day. The children have not forgotten the scene, for they all actually howled with fear. Poor little Sarah stopped her screams to say, "'Mother, don't you wish we was dogs stead of white folks? 
in such piteous accents that we had to laugh. Don't I wish I was a dog? Sarah is right. I don't know if I showed my uneasiness a while ago, but certainly my heart has hardly yet ceased beating rather rapidly. If I knew what moment to expect the stampede I would not mind, but this way, to expect it every instant, it is too much. Again, if I knew where we could go for refuge from the shells. A window banging unexpectedly just then gave me a curious twinge, not that I thought it was the signal, oh dear no, I just thought, what, I wonder? Pshaw! Picayune Butler's coming, coming has upset my nervous system. He interrupted me in the middle of my arithmetic, and I have not the energy to resume my studies. I shall try what effect an hour's practice will have on my spirits, and will see that I have a pair of clean stockings in my stampede sack, and that the fastenings of my running bag are safe though if I expect to take either I should keep in harness constantly. How long, O oh Lord, how long? June twenty ninth, Sunday. Any more, Mr. Lincoln, any more? Can't you leave our racked homes in repose? We are all wild. Last night five citizens were arrested on no charge at all and carried down to Picayune Butler's ship. What a thrill of terror ran through the whole community. We all felt so helpless, so powerless under the hand of our tyrant, the man who swore to uphold the Constitution and the laws, who was professedly only fighting to give us all liberty, the birthright of every American, and who nevertheless has ground us down to a state where we would not reduce our Negroes, who tortures and sneers at us and rules us with an iron hand. Ah, liberty, what a humbug! I would rather belong to England or France than to the North. Bondage, woman that I am, I can never stand. Even now the Northern papers, distributed among us, taunt us with our subjection, and tell us how coolly Butler will grind them down, paying no regard to their writhing and torture, beyond tightening the bonds still more. Ah, truly, this is the bitterness of slavery, to be insulted and reviled by cowards who are safe at home and enjoy the protection of the laws, while we, captive and overpowered, dare not raise our voices to throw back the insult, and are governed by the despotism of one man, whose word is our law. And that man, they tell us, is the right man in the right place. He will develop a union sentiment among the people if the thing can be done. Come and see if he can. Hear the curse that arises from thousands of hearts at that man's name, and say if he will speedily bring us to our senses. Will he accomplish it by love, tenderness, mercy, compassion? He might have done it, but did he try? when he came he assumed his natural role as tyrant and bravely has he acted it through never once turning aside for justice or mercy this degradation is worse than the bitterness of death i see no salvation on either side no glory awaits the southern confederacy even if it does achieve its independence it will be a mere speck in the world with no weight or authority the North confesses itself lost without us, and has paid an unheard-of ransom to regain us. On the other hand, conquered, what hope is there in this world for us? Broken in health and fortune, reviled, contemned, abused by those who claim already to have subdued us, without a prospect of future support for those few of our brothers who return outcasts without home or honor, would not death or exile be preferable? Oh, let us abandon our loved home to these implacable enemies and find refuge elsewhere. Take from us property, everything, only grant us liberty. Is this rather frantic, considering I abhor politics and women who meddle with them above all?
My opinion has not yet changed. I still feel the same contempt for a woman who would talk at the top of her voice for the edification of federal officers, as though anxious to receive an invitation requesting her presence at the garrison. I can suffer and be still as far as outward signs are concerned, but as no word of this has passed my lips I give it vent in writing, which is more lasting than words, partly to relieve my heart, partly to prove to my own satisfaction that I am no coward. For one line of this, surrounded as we are by soldiers, and liable to have our houses searched at any instant, would be a sufficient indictment for high treason. Under General Williams's rule I was perfectly satisfied that whatever was done was done through necessity, and under orders from headquarters, beyond his control. We all liked him. But now, since Butler's arrival, I believe I am as frantic in secret as the others are openly. I know that war sanctions many hard things, and that both sides practice them. But now we are so completely lost in Louisiana, is it fair to jibe and taunt us with our humiliation? I could stand anything save the cowardly ridicule and triumph of their papers. Honestly, I believe if all vile abusive papers on both sides were suppressed, and some of the fire-eating editors who make a living by lying were soundly cowhided or had their ears clipped, it would do more towards establishing peace than all the bloodshedding either side can afford. I hope to live to see it, too. Seems to me more liberty is allowed to the press than would be tolerated in speech. Let us speak as freely as any paper, and see if to-morrow we do not sleep at Fort Jackson. This morning the excitement is rare. Fifteen more citizens were arrested and carried off, and all the rest grew wild with expectation. So great a martyrdom is it considered that I am sure those who are not arrested will be woefully disappointed. It is ludicrous to see how each man thinks he is the very one they are in search of. We asked a twopenny lawyer of no more importance in the community than Dophy is if it was possible he was not arrested. But I am expecting to be every instant. So much for his self-assurance. Those arrested have, some, been quietly released. Those are so smiling and mysterious that I suspect them. Some been obliged to take the oath. Some sent to Fort Jackson." Ah, Liberty, what a blessing it is to enjoy thy privileges. If some of these poor men are not taken prisoners, they will die of mortification at the slight. Our valiant governor, the brave Moore, has by order of the real governor, Moise, made himself visible at some far distant point, and issued a proclamation saying, whereas we of Baton Rouge were held forcibly in town, he therefore considered men, women, and children prisoners of war, and as such the Yankees are bound to supply us with all necessaries, and consequently any one sending us aid or comfort or provisions from the country will be severely punished. Only Moore is fool enough for such an order. Held down by the Federals, our paper money so much trash, with hardly any other to buy food and no way of earning it, threatened with starvation and utter ruin, our own friends, by way of making our burden lighter, forbid our receiving the means of prolonging life, and after generously warning us to leave town, which they know is perfectly impossible, prepare to burn it over our heads, and let the women run the same risk as the men. Penned in on one little square mile, here we await our fate like sheep in the slaughter-pen. Our hour may be at hand now, it may be to-night. We have only to wait. The booming of the cannon will announce it to us soon enough." Of the six sentenced to Fort Jackson, one is the Methodist minister, Mr. Craven. The only charge is that he was heard to pray for the Confederate States by some officers who passed his house during family prayers. According to that, which of us would escape unhung? I do not believe there is a woman in the land who closes her eyes before praying for God's blessing on the side on which her brothers are engaged. 
are we all to cease? Show me the dungeon deep enough to keep me from praying for them. The man represented that he had a large family totally dependent on him, who must starve. Let them get up a subscription, was General Butler's humane answer. I will head it myself. It is useless to say the generous offer was declined. June 30th. As a specimen of the humanity of General Butler, let me record a threat of his, uttered with all the force and meaning language can convey, and certainly enough to strike terror in the hearts of frail women, since all these men believe him fully equal to carry it into execution. Some even believe it will be done. In speaking to Mr. Solomon Benjamin of foreign intervention in our favor, he said, let England or France try it, and I'll be blank if I don't arm every negro in the South and make them cut the throat of every man, woman, and child in it. I'll make them lay the whole country waste with fire and sword and leave it desolate. Draw me a finer picture of coward, brute, or bully than that one sentence portrays. O oh, men of the North, you do your noble hearts wrong in sending such ruffians among us as representatives of a great people. Was ever a more brutal thought uttered in a more brutal way? Mother, like many another, is crazy to go away from here, even to New Orleans, but like the rest will be obliged to stand and await her fate. I don't believe Butler would dare execute his threat, for at the first attempt, thousands who are passive now would cut the brutal heart from his inhuman breast tuesday july first i heard such a good joke last night if i had belonged to the female declaiming club i fear me i would have resigned instantly through mere terror thank heaven i don't these officers say the women talk too much which is undeniable they then said they meant to get up a sewing society and place in it every woman who makes herself conspicuous by her loud talking about them. Fancy what a refinement of torture! But only a few would suffer. The majority would be only too happy to enjoy the usual privilege of sewing societies, slander, abuse, and insinuations. How some would revel in it! The mere threat makes me quake. If I could so far forget my dignity and my father's name as to court the notice of gentlemen by contemptible insult, etc., and if I should be ordered to take my seat at the sewing society, I would never hold my head up again. Member of a select sewing circle. Fancy me. I know there is never any gossip in our society, though the one over the way gets up dreadful reports. I have heard all that, but would rather try neither. Oh, how I would beg and plead! Fifty years at Fort Jackson, good kind General Butler, rather than half an hour in your sewing society. Gentle, humane ruler, spare me, and I split my throat in shouting Yankee Doodle and Hurrah for Lincoln. Any, everything, so I am not disgraced. Deliver me from your sewing society, and I'll say and do what you please. Butler told some of these gentlemen that he had a detective watching almost every house in town, and he knew everything. True or not, it looks suspicious. We are certainly watched. Every evening two men may be seen in the shadow on the other side of the street, standing there until ever so late, sometimes until after we have gone to bed. It may be that, far from home, they are attracted by the bright light and singing, and watch us for their amusement. A few nights ago so many officers passed and repassed while we were singing on the balcony that I felt as though our habit of long standing had suddenly become improper. Saturday night, having secured a paper, we were all crowding around, Lily and I reading every now and then a piece of news from opposite ends of the paper. Charlie, walking on the balcony, found five officers leaning over the fence watching us as we stood under the light through the open window. 
Hope they won't elect me to the sewing society. Thursday night, July 3rd. Another day of sickening suspense. This evening, about three, came the rumor that there was to be an attack on the town tonight, or early in the morning, and we had best be prepared for anything. I can't say I believe it, but in spite of my distrust I made my preparations. First of all I made a charming improvement in my knapsack, alias pillowcase, by sewing a strong black band down each side of the center from the bottom to the top, when it is carried back and fastened below again, allowing me to pass my arms through, and thus present the appearance of an old peddler. Miriam's I secured also, and tied all our laces in a handkerchief ready to lay it in the last thing. But the interior of my bag, what a medley it is! First, I believe, I have secured four underskirts, three chemises, as many pairs of stockings, two underbodies, the prayer book father gave me, Tennyson that Harry gave me when I was fourteen, two unmade muslins, a white mull, English grenadine trimmed with lilac, and a purple linen and nightgown. Then I must have Lavinia's daguerreotype, and how could I leave Will's when perhaps he was dead? Besides, Howells and Will Carter's were with him, and one single case did not matter. But there was Tom Barker's I would like to keep, and, oh, let's take Mr. Stone's. And I can't slight Mr. Dunnington, for these two have been too kind to Jimmy for me to forget and poor Captain Huger is dead, and I will keep his, so they all went together. A box of pens, too, was indispensable, and a case of French note-paper and a bundle of Harry's letters were added. Miriam insisted on the old diary that preceded this, and found place for it, though I am afraid if she knew what trash she was to carry she would retract before going farther. It makes me heartsick to see the utter ruin we will be plunged in if forced to run to-night. Not a hundredth part of what I most value can be saved, if I counted my letters and papers not a thousandth. But I cannot believe we will run to-night. The soldiers tell whoever questions them that there will be a fight before morning, but I believe it must be to alarm them. Though what looks suspicious is that the officers said— to whom is not stated, that the ladies must not be uneasy if they heard cannon to-night, as they would probably commence to celebrate the Fourth of July about twelve o'clock. What does it mean? I repeat I don't believe a word of it, yet I have not yet met the woman or child who is not prepared to fly. Rose knocked at the door just now to show me her preparations. Her only thought seems to be mother's silver, so she has quietly taken possession of our shoe-bag, which is a long sack for odds and ends with cases for shoes outside, and has filled it with all the contents of the silver-box. This hung over her arm, and carrying Louis and Sarah, this young Samson says she will be ready to fly. I don't believe it, yet here I sit, my knapsack serving me for a desk, my seat the chair on which I have carefully spread my clothes in order. At my elbow lies my running or treasure bag, surrounded by my kaba, filled with hairpins, starch, and a band I was embroidering, etc. Near it lie our combs, etc., and the whole is crowned by my dagger. By the way, I must add Miriam's pistol, which she has forgotten, though over there lies her knapsack ready, too, with our bonnets and veils. It is long past eleven, and no sound of the cannon. Bah! I do not expect it. I'll lay me down and sleep in peace, for thou only, Lord, makest me to dwell in safety. Good night. I wake up to-morrow the same as usual, and be disappointed that my trouble was unnecessary. End of Book Two, Part Two Book Two, Part Three of A Confederate Girl's Diary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Two, Part Three. July 4th to July 8th, 1862. July 4th. Here I am, and still alive, having wakened but once in the night, and that only in consequence of Louis and Morgan crying, nothing more alarming than that. I ought to feel foolish, but I do not. I am glad I was prepared, even though there was no occasion for it. While I was taking my early bath, Lily came to the bathhouse and told me through the weather-boarding of another battle. Stonewall Jackson has surrounded McClellan completely, and victory is again ours. This is said to be the sixth battle he has fought in twenty days, and they say he has won them all. And the seventh regiment distinguished itself, and was presented with four cannon on the battlefield in acknowledgment of its gallant conduct. Gibbs belongs to the ragged, howling regiment that rushed on the field yelling like unchained devils, and spread a panic through the army, as the northern papers said, describing the Battle of Manassas. Oh, how I hope he has escaped! And they say, Palmerston has urged the recognition of the Confederacy and an armed intervention on our side. Would it not be glorious? Oh, for peace, blessed peace, and our brothers once more. Palmerston is said to have painted Butler as the vilest oppressor, and having added he was ashamed to acknowledge him of Anglo-Saxon origin. Perhaps knowing the opinion entertained of him by foreign nations caused Butler to turn such a somersault, for a few days before his arrival here we saw a leading article in the leading Union paper of New Orleans threatening us with the arming of the slaves for our extermination if England interfered, in the same language almost as Butler used when here. Three days ago the same paper ridiculed the idea, and said such a brutal, inhuman thing was never for a moment thought of. It was too absurd. And so the world goes. We all turn somersaults occasionally. And yet I would rather we would achieve our independence alone, if possible. It would be so much more glorious. And then I would hate to see England conquer the North, even if for our sake. My love for the old Union is still too great to be willing to see it humiliated. If England would just make Lincoln come to his senses, and put an end to all this confiscation which is sweeping over everything, make him agree to let us alone and behave himself, that will be quite enough. But what a task! If it were put to the vote to-morrow to return free and unmolested to the Union or stay out, I am sure Union would have the majority. But this way, to think we are to be sent to Fort Jackson and all the other prisons for expressing our ideas, however harmless, to have our houses burned over our heads and all the prominent men hanged, who would be eager for it? unless, indeed, it was to escape even the greater horrors of a war of extermination. July 5th. Think that since the 28th of May I have not walked three squares at a time, for my only walks are to Mrs. Bruno's. It is enough to kill any one. I might as well be at Ship Island, where Butler has sentenced Mrs. Philip for laughing while the corpse of a Federal officer was passing. At least that is to be the principal charge, though I hope for the sake of Butler's soul that he had better reasons. Shocking as her conduct was, she hardly deserved two years' close confinement in such a dreadful place as that, because she happened to have no sense of delicacy and no feeling. The darkest hour is just before the day. We have had the blackest night for almost three months, and I don't see the light yet. Better days are coming. I am getting skeptical, I fear me. I look forward to my future life with a shudder. This one cannot last long. I will be up and doing before many months are past. Doing what? Why, if all father left us is lost for ever, if we are to be penniless as well as homeless, I'll work for my living. How, I wonder. I will teach. 
I know I am not capable, but I can do my best. I would rather die than be dependent. I would rather die than teach. There now, you know how I feel. Teaching before dependence, death before teaching. My soul revolts from the drudgery. I never see a governess that my heart does not ache for her. I think of the nameless, numberless insults and trials she is forced to submit to, of the hopeless, thankless task that is imposed on her, to which she is expected to submit without a murmur, of all her griefs and agony shut up in her heart, and I cry heaven help a governess. My heart bleeds for them, and... One o'clock p.m. Thus far had I reached when news came that our forces were attacking the town and had already driven the pickets in. I am well now. We all rushed to make preparations instantly. I had just finished washing my hair before I commenced writing, and had it all streaming around me, but it did not take a minute to thrust it into a loose net. Then we each put on a fresh dress except myself, as I preferred to have a linen cambric worn several times before to a clean one not quite so nice, for that can do good service when washed. The excitement is intense. Mother is securing a few of Father's most valuable papers, Lily running around after the children, and waiting for Charlie, who cannot be found. Miriam, after securing all things needful, has gone downstairs to wait the issue, and I, dressed for instant flight with my running bag tied to my waist and knapsack, bonnet, veil, etc., on the bed, occupy my last few moments at home in this profitable way. Nobody knows what it is. A regiment has been marched out to meet our troops, some say commanded by Van Dorn, which I doubt. The gunboats are preparing to second them. We hear the garrison drum and see people running, that is all. We don't know what is coming. I believe it will prove nothing after all. But— the gunboat is drawn up so as to command our street here, the guns aimed up the street just below, and if a house falls, ours will be about the first. Well, this time next year we will know all of which we are now ignorant. That is one consolation. The house will either be down or standing then. 6 p.m. We have once more subsided. How foolish all this seems! Miriam and I laughed while preparing, and laughed while unpacking. It is the only way to take such things, and we agree on that, as on most other subjects. They say the affair originated from half a dozen shots fired by some Federal soldiers through idleness, whereupon the pickets rushed in screaming Van Dorn was after them at the head of six thousand men. I have my reasons for doubting the story. It must have been something more than that to spread such a panic, for they certainly had time to ascertain the truth of the attack before they beat the long roll and sent out their troops, for if it had been Van Dorn he would have been on them before that. Whatever it was, I am glad of the excitement, for it gave me new life for several hours. I was really sick before. Oh, this life! When will it end? Evermore and forevermore shall we live in this suspense? I wish we were in the Sandwich Islands. July 7th. As we no longer have a minister, Mr. Gearlow having gone to Europe, and no papers, I am in danger of forgetting the days of the week, as well as those of the month but I am positive that yesterday was Sunday, because I heard the Sunday school bells, and Friday I am sure was the fourth, because I heard the national salute fired. I must remember that to find my dates by. Well, last night being Sunday, a son of Captain Hooper, who died in the Fort Jackson fight, having just come from New Orleans, stopped here on his way to Jackson to tell us the news, or rather to see Charlie, and told us afterwards. 
He says a boat from Mobile reached the city Saturday evening, and the captain told Mr. Lanoue that he brought an extra from the former place containing news of McClellan's surrender with his entire army, his being mortally wounded, and the instant departure of a French and English man of war from Hampton Roads with the news. That revived my spirits considerably, all except McClellan's being wounded. I could dispense with that. But if it were true, and if peace would follow, and the boys come home, oh, what bliss! I would die of joy as rapidly as I am pining away with suspense now, I am afraid. About ten o'clock, as we came up, Mother went to the window in the entry to tell the news to Mrs. Day, and while speaking saw a man creeping by under the window in the narrow little alley on the side of the house, evidently listening, for he had previously been standing in the shadow of a tree and left the street to be nearer. When Mother ran to give the alarm to Charlie, I looked down, and there the man was, looking up, as I could dimly see, for he crouched down in the shadow of the fence. Presently, stooping still, he ran fast towards the front of the house, making quite a noise in the long tangled grass. When he got near the pepper bush, he drew himself up to his full height, paused a moment as though listening, and then walked quietly towards the front gate. By that time Charlie reached the front gallery above and called to him, asking what he wanted. Without answering, the man walked steadily out, closed the gate deliberately, then, suddenly remembering drunkenness would be the best excuse, gave a lurch towards the house, walked off perfectly straight in the moonlight, until seeing Dr. Day fastening his gate, he reeled again. That man was not drunk. Drunken men cannot run crouching, do not shut gates carefully after them, would have no inclination to creep in a dim little alley merely to creep out again. It may have been one of our detectives. Standing in the full moonlight, which was very bright, he certainly looked like a gentleman, for he was dressed in a handsome suit of black. He was no citizen. Form your own conclusions. Well, after all, he heard no treason. Let him play eavesdropper if he finds it consistent with his character as a gentleman. The captain who brought the extra from Mobile wished to have it reprinted, but it was instantly seized by a federal officer who carried it to Butler, who monopolized it, so that will never be heard of again. We must wait for other means of information. The young boy who told us reminds me very much of Jimmy. He is by no means so handsome, but yet there is something that recalls him, and his voice, though more childish, sounds like Jimmy's too. I had an opportunity of writing to Lydia by him, of which I gladly availed myself, and have just finished a really tremendous epistle. Wednesday, ninth July. Poor Miriam, poor Sarah, they are disgraced again. Last night we were all sitting on the balcony in the moonlight, singing as usual with our guitar. I have been so accustomed to hear Father say in the evening, Come, girls, where is my concert? And he took so much pleasure in listening that I could not think singing in the balcony so very dreadful since he encouraged us in it. But last night changed all my ideas. We noticed Federals, both officers and soldiers, pass singly, or by twos or threes at different times, but as we were not singing for their benefit, and they were evidently attending to their own affairs, there was no necessity of noticing them at all. But about half-past nine, after we had sung two or three dozen others, we commenced Mary of Argyle. As the last word died away, while the chords were still vibrating, came a sound of clapping hands, in short. Down went every string of the guitar. Charlie cried, I told you so, and ordered an immediate retreat. Miriam objected as undignified, but renounced the guitar. Mother sprang to her feet and closed the front windows in an instant, whereupon, dignified or not, we all evacuated the gallery and fell back into the house. 
All this was done in a few minutes, and as quietly as possible, and while the gas was being turned off downstairs, Miriam and I flew upstairs. I confess I was mortified to death, very, very much ashamed, but we wanted to see the guilty party, for from below they were invisible. We stole out on the front balcony above, and in front of the house that used to be Gibbs's we beheld one of the culprits. At the sight of the creature my mortification vanished in intense compassion for his. He was standing under the tree, half in the moonlight, his hands in his pockets, looking at the extinction of light below, with the true state of affairs dawning on his astonished mind, and looking by no means satisfied with himself such an abashed creature he looked just as though he had received a kick that conscious of deserving he dared not return while he yet gazed on the house in silent amazement and consternation hands still forlornly searching his pockets as though for a reason for our behaviour from under the dark shadows of the tree another slowly picked himself up from the ground hope he was not knocked down by surprise, and joined the first. His hand sought his pockets, too, and, if possible, he looked more mortified than the other. After looking for some time at the house, satisfied that they had put an end to future singing from the gallery, they walked slowly away, turning back every now and then to be certain that it was a fact. If ever I saw two mortified, hangdog-looking men, they were these two as they took their way home. Was it not shocking? But they could not have meant it merely to be insulting, or they would have placed themselves in full view of us rather than out of sight under the trees. Perhaps they were thinking of their own homes instead of us. July 10th a proclamation is out announcing that any one talking about the war or present state of affairs will be summarily dealt with now seems to me summarily is not exactly the word they mean but it still has an imposing effect what a sad state their affairs must be in if they can't bear comment an officer arrived day before yesterday bringing the surprising intelligence that mcclellan had captured richmond and fifty thousand prisoners that is the time they talked but when we received yesterday confirmation of his being finally defeated by our troops and the capture of his railroad train twelve miles in length they forbid further mention of the subject i wonder if they expect to be obeyed what a stretch of tyranny! O oh, free America, you who uphold free people, free speech, free everything! What a foul blot of despotism rests on a once spotless name! A nation of brave men who wage war on women and lock them up in prisons for using their woman weapon, the tongue! A nation of free people who advocate despotism, a nation of brothers who bind the weaker ones hand and foot, and scourge them with military tyrants and other free brotherly institutions. What a picture! Who would not be an American? One consolation is that this proclamation and the extraordinary care they take to suppress all news, except what they themselves manufacture, proves me that our cause is prospering more than they like us to know. I do believe day is about to break. If our troops are determined to burn our houses over our heads to spite the Yankees, I wish they would hurry and have it over at once. Ten regiments of infantry are stationed at Camp Moore, and Scott's cavalry was expected at Greenwell yesterday, both preparing for an attack on Baton Rouge. If we must be beggars, let it come at once. I can't endure this suspense. End of Book Two, Part Three Book Two, Part Four of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. 
Book Two, Part Four, July Eleventh to July Twentieth, eighteen sixty two. July Eleventh. A letter from George this morning. It was written on the twentieth of June, and he speaks of being on crutches in consequence of his horse having fallen with him and injured his knee. Perhaps then he was not in the first battle of the twenty fifth. But bah! I know George too well to imagine he would keep quiet at such a moment if he could possibly stand. I am sure he was there with the rest of the Louisiana regiment. The papers say the conduct of the first Louisiana is beyond all praise. Of course George was there. And Jimmy is with him at Richmond, but whether in the army or navy or what rank if in the first he does not say. He only says he is looking remarkably well. Gibbs he had heard from in a letter dated the 16th, and up to then he was in perfect health. His last letter here was dated 10th of March, so we are thankful enough now. I was so delighted to read the accounts of the gallant 7th in some paper we fortunately procured. At Jackson's address and presentation of the battery they had so bravely won, I was beside myself with delight. I was thinking that Gibbs, of course, was the regiment, had taken the battery with his single sword, and I know not what besides. Strange to say, I have not an idea of the names of the half-dozen battles he was in in June, but believe that one to be Port Republic. June 12th, thus in the original. Brother writes that rumors of the capture of Baton Rouge by our troops have made him very uneasy about us, and he wishes us to go down to New Orleans if possible. I wish we could. The impression here is that an attack is inevitable, and the city papers found it necessary to contradict the rumor of Ruggles having occupied it already. I wish mother would go. I can see no difference there or here, except that there we will be safe for a while at least. I grow desperate when I read these northern papers reviling and abusing us, reproaching us for being broken and dispersed taunting us with their victories, sparing no humiliating name in speaking of us, and laughing as to what we'll see when we vile rebels are driven out of Virginia and the glorious Union firmly established. I can't bear these taunts. I grow sick to read these vile, insulting papers that seem written expressly to goad us into madness. There must be many humane, reasonable men in the North. Can they not teach their editors decency in this their hour of triumph? July 13th, Sunday. A profitable way to spend such a day. Being forced to dispense with church-going, I have occupied myself in reading a great deal and writing a little, which latter duty is a favorite task of mine after church on Sundays. But this evening the mosquitoes are so savage that writing became impossible, until Miriam and I instituted a grand extermination process, which we partly accomplished by extraordinary efforts. She lay on the bed with the bar half drawn over her and half looped up, while I was commissioned to fan the wretches from all corners into the pen. It was rather fatiguing, and in spite of the numbers slain, hardly recompensed me for the trouble of hunting them around the room. But still, Miriam says exercise is good for me, and she ought to know. I have been reading that old disguster Boswell. Bah! I have no patience with the toady. I suppose my mind is not yet thoroughly impregnated with the Johnsonian ether, and that is the reason why I cannot appreciate him or his work. I admire him for his patience and minuteness in compiling such trivial details. He must have been an amiable man to bear Johnson's brutal, ill-humoured remarks, but seems to me if I had not spirit enough to resent the indignity, I would at least not publish it to the world. Briefly, my opinion, which this book has only tended to confirm, is that Boswell was a vain, conceited prig, a fool of a jackanape, an insupportable sycophant. Ah, uh, whatever mean thing you please, there is no word small enough to suit him. As to Johnson, he is a surly old bear. 
in short an old brute of a tyrant. All his knowledge and attainments could not have made me tolerate him, I am sure. I could have no respect for a man who was so coarse in speech and manners, and who eat like an animal. Fact is, I am not a Boswellian or a Johnsonian either. I do not think him such an extraordinary man. I have heard many conversations as worthy of being recorded as nineteen-twentieths of his. In spite of his learning, he was narrow-minded and bigoted, which I despise above all earthly failings. Witness his tirades against Americans, calling us rascals, robbers, pirates, and saying he would like to burn us. Now I have railed at many of these ordinary women here for using like epithets for the Yankees, and have felt the greatest contempt for their absurd abuse. These poor women do not aspire to Johnsonian wisdom, and their ignorance may serve as an excuse for their narrow-mindedness, but the wondrous Johnson to rave and bellow like any Billingsgate nymph. Bah! He is an old disguster. July 14th, 3 p.m. Another pleasant excitement. News has just arrived that Scott's cavalry was having a hard fight with the Yankees eight miles from town. Everybody immediately commenced to pick up stray articles and get ready to fly, in spite of the intense heat. I am resigned, as I hardly expect a shelling. Another report places the fight fourteen miles from here. A man on horseback came in for reinforcements. Heaven help poor Howell if it is true. I am beginning to doubt half I hear. People tell me the most extravagant things, and if I am fool enough to believe them and repeat them, I suddenly discover that it is not half so true as it might be, and as they themselves frequently deny having told it, all the odium of manufacturing rests on my shoulders which have not been accustomed to bear lies of any kind. I mean to cease believing anything until it rests on the word of some responsible person. By the way, the order I so confidently believed concerning the proclamation turns out not quite so bad. I was told women were included, and it extended to private houses as well as public ones, though I fortunately omitted that when I recorded it. When I read it, it said, all discussions concerning the war are prohibited in bar-rooms, public assemblies, and street corners. As women do not frequent such places and private houses are not mentioned, I cannot imagine how my informant made the mistake, unless, like me, it was through hearing it repeated. Odious as I thought it then, I think it wise now, for more than one man has lost his life through discussions of the kind." July 17th, Thursday. It is decided that I am to go to New Orleans next week. I hardly know which I dislike most, going or staying. I know I shall be dreadfully homesick, but... Remember, and keep quiet, Sarah, I beg of you. Everything points to an early attack here. Some say this week. The Federals are cutting down all our beautiful woods near the penitentiary to throw up breastworks, some say. Cannon are to be planted on the foundation of Mr. Pike's new house. Everybody is in a state of expectation. Honestly, if Baton Rouge has to be shelled, I shall hate to miss the fun. It will be worth seeing, and I would like to be present, even at the risk of losing my big toe by a shell. But then, by going, I can save many of my clothes, and then Miriam and I can divide when everything is burned. That is one advantage, besides being beneficial by the change of air. They say the town is to be attacked to-night. I don't believe a word of it. Oh, I was so distressed this evening. They tell me Mr. Biddle was killed at Vicksburg. I hope it is not true. Suppose it was a shot from Will's battery. July 20th, Sunday. Last night the town was in a dreadful state of excitement. Before sunset a regiment that had been camped out of town came in and pitched their tents around the new theatre in front of our church. 
all was commotion and bustle, and as the pickets had been drawn in and the soldiers talked freely of expecting an attack, everybody believed it, and was consequently in rather an unpleasant state of anticipation. Their cannons were on the commons back of the church, the artillery horses tied to the wheels, while some dozen tents were placed around, filled with men who were ready to harness them at the first alarm. With all these preparations in full view, we went to bed as usual. I did not even take the trouble of gathering my things which I had removed from my peddler sack, and slept, satisfied that if forced to fly, I would lose almost everything in spite of my precaution in making a bag. Well, night passed, and here is morning, and nothing is heard yet. The attack is delayed until this evening, or to-morrow, they say. Woman though I am, I am by no means as frightened as some of these men are. I can't get excited about it. Perhaps it is because they know the danger and I do not, but I hate to see men uneasy. I have been so accustomed to brave, fearless ones who would beard the devil himself that it gives me a great disgust to see anyone less daring than father and the boys. I have been so busy preparing to go to the city that I think if the frolic should intervene and prevent my departure I would be disappointed, though I do not want to go. It would be unpleasant, for instance, to pack all I own in my trunk, and just as I place the key in my pocket to hear the shriek of Van Dorn raised again. This time it is to be Ruggles, though. I would not mind if he came before I was packed. Besides, even if I miss the fun here, they say the boats are fired into from Plaquemin, and then I have the pleasure of being in a fight anyhow. Mother is alarmed about that part of my voyage, but Miriam and I persuaded her it is nothing. Oh, if I was a man! Oh, wouldn't I be in Richmond with the boys! What is the use of all these worthless women in war times? If they attack, I shall don the breeches and join the assailants and fight, though I think they would be hopeless fools to attempt to capture a town they could not hold for ten minutes under the gunboats. How do breeches and coats feel, I wonder? I am actually afraid of them. I kept a suit of Jimmy's hanging in the armoire for six weeks waiting for the Yankees to come, thinking fright would give me courage to try it. What a seeming paradox! But I never succeeded. Lily one day insisted on my trying it, and I advanced so far as to lay it on the bed, and then carried my bird out. I was ashamed to let even my canary see me, but when I took a second look my courage deserted me, and there ended my first and last attempt at disguise. I have heard so many girls boast of having worn men's clothes, I wonder where they get the courage." To think half the men in town sat up all night in expectation of a stampede, while we poor women slept serenely. Everybody is digging pits to hide in when the ball opens. The days have dug a tremendous one. The wolves, shepherds, and some fifty others have taken the same precaution. They may as well dig their graves at once. What if a tremendous shell should burst over them and bury in the dirt those who were not killed? Oh, no, let me see all the danger and the way it is coming at once. Tomorrow or day after, in case no unexpected little incident occurs in the interval, I purpose going to New Orleans, taking father's papers and part of Miriam's and mother's valuables for safekeeping. I hate to go, but they all think I should, as it will be one less to look after if we are shelled, which I doubt. I don't know that I require much protection, but I might as well be agreeable and go. Oof! how I will grow homesick before I am out of sight! Midnight. Here we go, sure enough. At precisely eleven o'clock, while we were enjoying our first dreams, we were startled by the long roll which was beat half a square below us. At first I only repeated the roll of the drum, without an idea connected with it. But hearing the soldiers running, in another instant I was up and was putting on my stockings when Miriam ran in in her nightgown. The children were roused and dressed quickly, and it did not take us many instants to prepare. 
the report of two shots and the tramp of soldiers, cries of double quick and sound as of cannon moving, rather hastening our movements. Armoirs, bureaus, and everything else were thrown open, and Miriam and I hastily packed our sacks with any articles that came to hand, having previously taken the precaution to put on everything fresh from the armoire. We have saved what we can, but I find myself obliged to leave one of my new muslins I had just finished, as it occupied more room than I can afford, the body of my lovely lilac and my beauteous white mull. But then I have saved eight half-made linen chemises. That will be better than the outward show. Here comes an alarm of fire, at least a dreadful odor of burning cotton, which has set everybody wild with fear that conflagration is to be added to these horrors. The cavalry swept past on their way to the river ten minutes ago, and here comes the news that the gunboats are drawing up their anchors and making ready. Well, here an hour has passed. Suppose they do not come after all. I have been watching two sentinels at the corner who are singing and dancing in the gayest way. One reminds me of Gibbs. I have seen him dance that way often. I was glad to see a good-humoured man again. I wish I was in bed. I am only sitting up to satisfy my conscience, for I have long since ceased to expect a real bombardment. If it must come, let it be now. I am tired of waiting." A crowd of women have sought the protection of the gunboats. I am distressed about the Brunos. Suppose they did not hear the noise. Oh, girls, if I was a man, I wonder what would induce me to leave you four lone, unprotected women sleeping in that house, unconscious of all this. Is manhood a dream that is past? Is humanity an idle name? fatherless brotherless girls if i was honored with the title of man i do believe i would be fool enough to run around and wake you at least not another word though i shall go mad with rage and disgust i am going to bed this must be a humbug morgan came running in once more in his night gear begging lily to hear his prayers in answer to her why you have said them to-night he says "'Yes, but I've been getting up so often. "'Poor child, no wonder he is perplexed. "'One hour and a half of this nonsense, and no result known. "'We are told the firing commenced and the pickets were driven in twenty minutes before the long roll beat. "'End of Book Two, Part Four. Book Two, Part Five of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Two, Part Five, July twenty first to July twenty fourth, eighteen sixty two. July 21st. It is impossible to discover the true story of last night's alarm. Some say it was a gang of negroes who attacked the pickets in revenge for having been turned out of the garrison. Others say it was a number of our soldiers who fired from the bushes. And the most amusing story is that they took alarm at an old white horse, which they killed, mistaking him for the Confederates. One regiment has refused to do picket duty, and the story runs among these poor soldiers that our army, which is within a mile, is perfectly overwhelming. The excitement still continues. I have been writing to the Brunos the news confirming the death of McClellan, the surrender of his army, and the good tidings of our ram's recent exploits above Vicksburg, and her arriving safely under the guns there. If we could keep all the dispatches that have passed between us since the Battle of the Forts, what a collection of absurdity and contradiction it would be! Forts have been taken. Their ships have passed. Fort safe. Yankees at our mercy. Ships at New Orleans. City to be bombarded in twelve hours. Fort surrendered. City under British protection. No, it isn't. City surrendered. 
Mistake! Baton Rouge to be burned when Yankee ships come! And so on, sometimes three times a day, each dispatch contradicting the other, and all equally ridiculous. The crowd here seems to increase. The streets are thronged with the military, and it will soon be impossible to go even to Mrs. Bruno's, which will be a great privation to me. Five thousand are to come next week, and then it will be really impossible to go in the streets. July 22nd, Tuesday. Another such day, and there is the end of me. Charlie decided to send Lily and the children into the country early tomorrow morning and get them safely out of this doomed town. Mother, Miriam, and I were to remain here alone. Take the children away, and I can stand whatever is to come, but this constant alarm with five babies in the house is too much for any of us. So we gladly packed their trunks and got them ready, and then news came pouring in. First a negro man just from the country told Lily that our soldiers were swarming out there, that he had never seen so many men. Then Dina wrote us that a Mrs. Bryan had received a letter from her son, praying her not to be in Baton Rouge after Wednesday morning, as they were to attack to-morrow. Then a man came to Charlie and told him that though he was on parole, yet as a mason he must beg him not to let his wife sleep in town to-night, to get her away before sunset. But it is impossible for her to start before morning. Hearing so many rumors, all pointing to the same time, we began to believe there might be some danger. So I packed all necessary clothing that could be dispensed with now in a large trunk for Mother, Miriam, and me, and got it ready to send out in the country to Mrs. Williams. All told, I have but eight dresses left, so I'll have to be particular. I am wealthy compared to what I would have been Sunday night, for then I had but two in my sack, and now I have my best in the trunk. If the attack comes before the trunk gets off, or if the trunk is lost, we will verily be beggars, for I pack well, and it contains everything of any value in clothing. The excitement is on the increase, I think. Everybody is crazy to leave town. Thursday, July 24th. Yes, that must be the date, for one day and two nights have passed since I was writing here. Where shall I begin the story of my wanderings? I don't know that it has a beginning. It is all so hurried and confused. But it was Tuesday evening that the Federals were seized with a panic which threw the whole town in alarm. They said our troops were within eight miles, ten thousand in number. The report was even started that the advance guard was skirmishing with the Federals. The shots were heard distinctly. A dozen people were ready to swear. The Yankees struck their tents, galloped with their cannon through the streets with the most terrific din, troops passed at double quick on their way to the garrison, everything was confusion. Mr. Tunnard told us yesterday he was present when part of them reached the gate of the garrison, and saw one of the officers spring forward waving his sword, and heard him cry, "'Trot men, gallop, I say! Damn you, run in!' with a perfect yell at the close. Whereupon all lookers-on raised a shout of laughter, for the man was frightened out of his wits. A Federal officer told him that their fright was really a disgrace, and if one thousand of our men had come in town, the whole thirty-five hundred would have been at their mercy. Even the naval officers denounce it as the most errant piece of cowardice. For instead of marching their troops out to meet ours, they all rushed into the garrison, where, if attacked, their only retreat would have been into the river. The gunboats were ordered into the middle of the stream in front of the garrison, and cooped up there these valiant men awaited the assault in such trepidation that yesterday they freely said the force could be purchased for fifty cents. They are so ashamed of their panic. Imagine what effect this had on the inhabitants. Soon an exodus took place in the direction of the asylum, and we needs must follow the general example and run, too. In haste we packed a trunk with our remaining clothes, what we could get in, and the greatest confusion prevailed for an hour. 
Beatrice had commenced to cry early in the evening, and redoubled her screams when she saw the preparations, and Louis joining in, they cried in concert until eight o'clock, when we finally got off. What a din! Lily looked perfectly exhausted. That look on her face made me heartsick. Miriam flew around everywhere. Mother always had one more article to find, and the noise was dreadful, when white and black assembled in the hall, ready at last. Charlie placed half of the trunks on the dray, leaving the rest for another trip, and we at last started off. Besides the inevitable running bag tied to my waist, on this stifling night I had my sunbonnet, veil, comb, toothbrush, kaba, filled with dozens of small articles, and dagger to carry, and then my heart failed me when I thought of my guitar, so I caught it up in the case, and remembering father's heavy inkstand, I seized that, too, with two fans. If I was asked what I did with all these things, I could not answer. Certain it is I had every one in my hands, and was not very ridiculous to behold. Seventeen in number, counting white and black, our procession started off, each loaded in their own way. The soldiers did not scruple to laugh at us. Those who were still waiting in front of the churches to be removed laughed heartily and cried, "'Hello! Where are you going? Running? Good-bye!' Fortunately they could not see our faces, for it was very dark. One stopped us under a lamp-post and wanted us to go back. He said he knew we were to be attacked, for the Confederates were within five miles, but we were as safe at home as at the asylum. He was a very handsome, respectable-looking man, though dirty, as Yankee soldiers always are, and in his shirt-sleeves besides. We thanked him for his kindness and went on. All stopped at the Brunos to see they were ready to fly, but the two parties were so tremendous that we gladly divided, and Miriam and I remained with them until they could get ready, while our detachment went on. Wagons, carts, every vehicle imaginable, passed on to places of safety, loaded with valuables, while women and children hurried on, on foot. It took the Brunos as long to prepare as it did us. I had to drag Sophie out of her bed, where she threw herself, vowing she would not run. And after an interminable length of time we were at last ready and started, with the addition of Mrs. Lukes and her sons in our train. The volunteer, whose sole duty seems to be to watch the Brunos, met us as we got out. He stopped as he met the first, looked in silence until Sophie and I passed, and then burst out laughing. No wonder! What a walk it was! Nobody hesitated to laugh, even though they meant to run themselves, and we made fun of each other, too, so our walk was merry enough. When we reached there the asylum was already crowded, at least it would have been a crowd in any other place, though a mere handful in such a building. The whole house was illuminated, up to the fifth story, and we were most graciously received by the director, who had thrown the whole house open to whoever chose to come, and exerted himself to be accommodating. It looked like a tremendous hotel where everyone is at home. Not a servant or one of the deaf and dumb children was to be seen. We had all the lower story to ourselves." Wasn't it pleasant to unload and deposit all things in a place of safety? It was a great relief. Then we five girls walked on the splendid balcony which goes around the house until we could no longer walk, when I amused myself by keeping poor Sophie standing, since she would not sit down like a Christian, but insisted on going to bed like a lazy girl as she is. When I finally let her go, it did not take her many minutes to undress, and soon we were all ready for bed. The Brunos had beds on the parlor floor across the wide hall. We had a room opposite, and next to ours Lily and the children were all sleeping soundly. I ran the blockade of the hall in my nightgown, and had a splendid romp with the girls after rolling Sophie out of bed and jerking Nettie up. Mother and Mrs. Bruno cried, Order! laughing, 
but they came in for their share of the sport, until an admiring crowd of females at the door told us by their amused faces they were enjoying it too. So I ran the gauntlet again and got safely through the hall, and after a few more inroads, in one of which Miriam accompanied me, and on which occasion I am sure we were seen in our nightgowns, we finally went to bed. I won't say went to sleep, for I did not pretend to doze. All our side of the house had bars, except me, and the mosquitoes were unendurable. So I watched Mother and Miriam in their downy slumbers, and lay on my hard bed for hours, fighting the torments with bare arms. Every now and then I heard a stir among the females above, indicating that some few were anticipating a panic. Once they took a rush from the fourth story, and cried they heard the cannon, twenty guns had been fired, etc. I lay still, determined not to believe it, and presently all subsided. I lay there for hours longer, it seemed, when Nettie at last wandered in disconsolate to find if we were asleep, for with the exception of Sophie they too had been awake all night. I went to the parlor with her when she, Dina, and I decided to dress at once and sit on the balcony, since sleep was hopeless. Behold me in a blue muslin flounced to the waist, with a cape too. What a running costume! Miriam only had time to take off her white dress before starting. All dressed, we went to the northwest corner, as far as possible from the rest of the household, and sat in a splendid breeze for hours. It was better than fighting insatiable mosquitoes, so there we sat talking through the greater part of a night which seemed to have borrowed a few additional hours for our benefit. We'll have no leap year in sixty-four. The twenty-four extra hours were crowded in on that occasion, I think. We discussed our favorite books, characters, authors, repeated scraps here and there of the mock sentimental, talked of how we would one day like to travel and where we would go, discussed love and marriage, and came to the conclusion neither was the jest it was thought to be. Oh, wise young women! Poor Nettie retired in despair, and we two watched alone for hours longer. The sun must have been arrested by some Joshua on the road, couldn't make me believe it was doing its duty as usual. We wandered around the balconies, through the grounds in the dim starlight, for it was cloudy, and finally, beholding a faint promise of morning, sat still and waited for the coming of the lazy sun. What was still more aggravating was that every time we looked in at the others showed them sleeping peacefully. Miriam lay her full length with outstretched arms, the picture of repose, looking so comfortable. When the sun finally made his appearance, he was out on a spree, I found, for his eyes were not half opened, and he looked dull and heavy as he peeped from behind his bed curtains. Others began to stir, and in an hour more we were ready to leave. Those who had slept came out with swelled eyes and drowsy looks, while we three, who had been up all night, were perfectly calm, though rather pale, but I am seldom otherwise. Were we not thankful to see home still standing? I did not feel tired much, but somehow, when it struck half-past six, and I found myself alone here, Miriam having stopped at Mrs. Day's, I suddenly found myself divested of my flounces and most other articles, and involuntarily going towards the bed. I could not sleep, wasn't thinking of such a thing, meant to— There was an end of my soliloquy. Where I went I don't know. As the clock struck eight I got up as unaccountably, and discovered I had lost all idea of time in sleep. If it had not been for the clock, I should have said I had slept a day and a night, and it was now Thursday morning. A giant refreshed, I rose from my slumbers, took a hasty cup of coffee, and set to work packing Lily's trunk, for I was crazy to see the children off as soon as possible. It was no short work, but we all hurried, said good-bye, and saw them go with a feeling of relief. 
By the experience of the night before, we knew that when the real moment came it would be impossible to get them off in time to escape danger. Poor Lily, we miss her sadly, but are thankful to know that she is out of danger with her poor little children. She looked heartbroken at the idea of leaving us alone, but then when one weak woman has five small babies to take care of, is it fair to impose three big ones on her? I'd never stay here if she sacrificed her children to take care of us who need no protection. I was very lazy after they left, and sat reading until a note was brought from Charlie saying they were safe beyond the lines. Last night came another alarm. Some fifty cannon were fired somewhere above. Reports came that a body of our troops were a few miles out, so a thousand of these men took courage and went out to reconnoiter. Mrs. Bruno and Mother insisted on going again to the asylum for protection against the coming attack, though we at first begged and pleaded to stay at home. But we had to follow, and I don't think any of us were in the best of humours, as we were all conscious of doing a foolish thing. We were cordially received again, and got quite gay. Sleeping accommodations no better than before, as far as I was concerned. Sophie, Miriam, and I had but one bar between us, so we placed two mattresses side by side, and by dint of chairs and strings, stretched the net as far as possible over them. Those two were well enough, but to my share fell a baby's mattress, two feet by four, placed between the wall and the other great bed, with the end of the bar a foot above my face and one sheet to do the duty of two. However, they had only one also. Well, I believe I am tall, so my bed did not fit me. As it was two inches higher than theirs, there was no sharing. In spite of a heavy rain that was now pouring, my warm place was intolerable, and the perspiration streamed from my face so as to be disagreeable, to say the least. It drove me to walk in my sleep, I am afraid, for I have an indistinct recollection of finding myself standing at the window trying to breathe. It was a very, very little piece of sleep I got after all, and that little by no means refreshing. Up at sunrise again, but it took some time to get ready, for I had to get some clothes out of the trunk to send home. Well, ever since I reached here I have been writing, and I am ashamed to say how long it is. As the time grows more exciting, my book grows shorter to my great distress. What will I do? We all vowed that would be the last time we would run until we heard the cannon, or had some better reason than a Yankee panic to believe the Confederates were coming, though if we listened to Mother she would go there every night if this lasted for a whole year. Kind Philly Nolan wrote, insisting on our staying with them on the plantation until it was over, but we cannot do it. The time is too uncertain. If we knew it was to come this week, we might stay that long with her, but to go for an indefinite period, Miriam and I would not hear of. I have kept for the last a piece of news I received with thankfulness when I finally heard it. For though known to the whole family and all the town on Tuesday night, no one thought it worth while to tell me until I heard it by accident last evening. It was that a Mr. Bell, writing to his wife, says Gibbs asked him to send word to mother that he, George, and Jimmy were in the fight of the 10th and 11th, and all safe. God be praised. End of Book Two, Part Five Book Two, Part Six of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Two, Part Six, July twenty fifth to July twenty eighth, eighteen sixty two. July 25th. An old man stopped here just now in a carriage and asked to see me. Such a sad, sick old man. 
He said his name was Caldwell, and that passing through East Feliciana, Mrs. Flynn had asked him to deliver a message to us. Had we heard from our brothers? I told him the message from Mr. Bell. He commenced crying. There was one of them, he said, who got hurt. I held my breath and looked at him. He cried still more, and said, yes, it was Gibbs, in the hand, not dangerous, but— here I thought he meant to tell me worse. Perhaps he was dead, but I could not speak, so he went on, saying Lydia and the general had gone on to Richmond instantly, and had probably reached there before to-day. He took so long to tell it, and he cried so, that I was alarmed, until I thought perhaps he had lost one of his own sons, but I dared not ask him. Just then one of the horses fell down with sunstroke, and I begged the old gentleman to come in and rest until they could raise the horse, but he said no, he must go on to the river. He looked so sick that I could not help saying he looked too unwell to go beyond, and I wished he would come in. But he burst into tears, saying, Yes, my child, I am very, very sick, but I must go on. Poor old man with his snow-white beard! July 27th. I have my bird back. As I waked this morning, I heard a well-known chirp in the streets, and called to mother I knew it was Jimmy. Sure enough, it is my bird. Lucy Daig has had him ever since the shelling, as a negro caught it that day and gave it to her. July 29th. This town, with its ten thousand soldiers, is more quiet than it was with the old population of seven thousand citizens. With this tremendous addition it is like a graveyard in its quiet at times. These poor soldiers are dying awfully. Thirteen went yesterday. On Sunday the boats discharged hundreds of sick at our landing. Some lay there all afternoon in the hot sun, waiting for the wagon to carry them to the hospital, which task occupied the whole evening. In the meantime these poor wretches lay uncovered on the ground in every stage of sickness. Cousin Will saw one lying dead without a creature by to notice when he died. Another was dying and muttering to himself as he lay too far gone to brush the flies out of his eyes and mouth, while no one was able to do it for him. Cousin Will helped him, though. Another, a mere skeleton, lay in the agonies of death, too, but he evidently had kind friends, for several were gathered around holding him up and fanning him, while his son leaned over him, crying aloud. Tish says it was dreadful to hear the poor boy's sobs. All day our vis-a-vis, -vis, Bombstark, with his several aides, plies his hammer. All day Sunday he made coffins, and says he can't make them fast enough. Think, too, he is by no means the only undertaker here. Oh, I wish these poor men were safe in their own land. It is heartbreaking to see them die here like dogs, with no one to say Godspeed. The Catholic priest went to see some some time ago, and going near one who lay in bed, said some kind thing, when the man burst into tears and cried, Thank God I have heard one kind word before I die. In a few minutes the poor wretch was dead. July 31st. I believe I forgot to mention one little circumstance in my account of that first night at the deaf and dumb asylum, which at the time struck me with extreme disgust. That was seeing more than one man who had no females or babies to look after, who sought there a refuge from the coming attack. At daylight one dapper young man in fashionable array came stepping lightly on the gallery, carrying a neat carpet-bag in his hand. I hardly think he expected to meet two young ladies at that hour. I shall always believe he meant to creep away before any one was up, for he certainly looked embarrassed when we looked up, though he assumed an air of indifference and passed by bravely swinging his sack, but I think he wanted us to believe he was not ashamed. I dare say it was some little clerk in his holiday attire, but I can't say what contempt I felt for the creature." 
"'Honestly, I believe the women of the South are as brave as the men who are fighting, and certainly braver than the home guard. I have not yet been able to coax myself into being as alarmed as many I could name are. They say it is because I do not know the danger. Swat! I prefer being brave through ignorance to being afraid in consequence of my knowledge of coming events. Thank heaven my brothers are the bravest of the brave. I would despise them if they shrunk back, though Lucifer should dispute the path with them. Well, all men are not Morgan boys. They tell me cowards actually exist, though I hope I never met one. The poor men that went to the asylum for safety might not have what Lavinia calls a moral backbone. No wonder, then, they tumbled in there. Besides, I am told half the town spent the night on the banks of the river on that occasion, and perhaps these unfortunates were subject to colds and preferred the shelter of a good roof. Poor little fellows! How I longed to give them my hoops, corsets, and pretty blue organdy in exchange for their boots and breeches! Only I thought it was dangerous, for suppose the boots had been so used to running that they should prance off with me, too! why it would ruin my reputation. Miss Morgan in petticoats is thought to be as brave as any other man, but these borrowed articles might make her fly as fast as any other man, too, if panic is contagious, as the Yankees here have proved. One consolation is that all who could go with any propriety, and all who are worthy of fighting among those who believed in the South, are off at the seat of war, it is only trash and those who are obliged to remain for private reasons who still remain let us count those young individuals as trash and step over them only ask heaven why you were made with a man's heart and a female form and those creatures with beards were made as bewitchingly nervous august second saturday i had thought my running days were over so little did I anticipate another stampede that I did not notice the report of the attack that was prophesied for night before last, and went to bed without gathering my clothes. But to-day comes a hasty note from Charlie, telling us to leave instantly, as General Breckinridge is advancing with ten thousand men to attack us, and at twelve midnight yesterday was within thirty-four miles. He begged us to leave to-day. There would be trouble before to-morrow night. It was so earnest, and he asserted all so positively, that we are going to Phillies this evening to stay a week, as they say eight days will decide. Ah, me, our beautiful town! Still, I am skeptical. If it must be, pray heaven that the blow comes now. Nothing can be equal to suspense. These poor men— are they not dying fast enough? Will Baumstark have orders for an unlimited supply of coffins next week? Only Charlie's family, ours, and the Brunos know it. He enjoined the strictest secrecy, though the Brunos sent to swear Mrs. Luke's in, as she, like ourselves, has no protector. I would like to tell everybody, but it will warn the Federals. I almost wish we too had been left in ignorance— it is cruel to keep it to ourselves. I believe the Yankees expect something. They say they have armed fifteen hundred Negroes. Foes and insurrection in town, assailing friends outside. Nice time. Our cavalry has passed the A-meet. Poor Charlie has come all the way to the ferry landing on the other side to warn us. If we do not take advantage, it will not be for want of knowing what is to come. How considerate it was in him to come such a long way! I am charmingly excited. If I only had a pair of breeches, my happiness would be complete. Let it come. I lose all, but in heaven's name let us have it over at once. My heart fails when I look around, but spit fire and have an end to this at once. Liberty forever, though death be the penalty. Treason! Here lies my pass at my elbow, in which has been gratuitously inserted that parties holding it are considered to give their parole not to give information, countenance, aid, or support to the so-called confed S. 
as I did not apply for it, agree to the stipulation, or think it by any means proper, I don't consider it binding. I could not give my word for doing what my conscience tells me is right. I cross with this book full of treason. It countenances the C.S. Shall I burn it? That is a stupid ruse. They are too wise to ask you to subscribe to it. They just append it. August 3rd. Westover. Enfin nous sommes arrivés. And after what a trip! As we reached the ferry I discovered I had lost the pass and had to walk back and search for it, aided by Mr. Tunnard, who met me in my distress, as it has always been his luck to do. But somebody had already adopted the valuable trifle, so I had to rejoin Mother and Miriam without it. The guard resolutely refused to let us pass until we got another, so off flew Mr. Tunnard to procure a second, which was vastly agreeable, as I knew he would have to pay twenty-five cents for it, Yankees having come down as low as that to procure money. But he had gone before we could say anything, and soon returned with the two bits worth of leave of absence. Then we crossed the river in a little skiff after sundown, in a most unpleasant state of uncertainty as to whether the carriage was waiting at the landing for us, for I did not know if Philly had received my note, and there was no place to go if she had not sent for us. However, we found it waiting, and leaving Mother and Miriam to pay the ferry, I walked on to put our bundles in the carriage. A man stepped forward, calling me by name, and giving me a note from Charlie before I reached it, and as I placed my foot on the step, another came up and told me he had left a letter at home for me at one o'clock. I bowed yes. It was from Howell, must answer to-morrow. He asked me not to mention it was him. A little servant had asked his name, but he told her it was none of her business. I laughed at the refined remark, and said I had not known who it was. He would hardly have been flattered to hear I had not even inquired. He modestly said that he was afraid I had seen him through the window. Oh, no, I assured him. Well, please, anyhow, don't say it's me, he pleaded most grammatically. I answered, smiling, I did not know who it was then. I know no more now, and if you choose, I shall always remain in ignorance of your identity. He burst out laughing, and went off with, Oh, do, Miss Morgan, forget all about me, as though it was a difficult matter. Who can he be? We had a delightful drive in the moonlight, though it was rather long, and it was quite late when we drove up to the house, and were most cordially welcomed by the family. We sat up late on the balcony, listening for the report of cannon, which, however, did not come. Baton Rouge is to be attacked to-morrow, they say. Pray heaven it will all be over by that time. Nobody seems to doubt it over here. A while ago a long procession of guerrillas passed a short distance from the house, looking for a party of Yankees they heard of in the neighborhood, and waved their hats for lack of handkerchiefs to us as we stood on the balcony. I call this writing under difficulties. Here I am employing my knee as a desk, a position that is not very natural to me, and by no means comfortable. I feel so stupid from want of sleep last night that no wonder I am not even respectably bright. I think I shall lay aside this diary with my pen, I have procured a nicer one, so I no longer regret its close. What a stupid thing it is! As I look back, how faintly have I expressed things that produced the greatest impression on me at the time, and how completely have I omitted the very things I should have recorded! Bah! It is all the same trash, and here is an end of it for this volume— whose stupidity can only be equalled by the one that precedes and the one that is to follow it. But who expects to be interesting in war times? If I kept a diary of events, it would be one tissue of lies. Think, there was no battle on the 10th or 11th, McClellan is not dead, and Gibbs was never wounded. After that, who believes in reliable information? Not I. End of Book Two
Book Three, Part One of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Three, Part One. August Fourth to August Eighth, eighteen sixty two. Westover, Monday, August 4th, 1862. Here we are at Dr. Nolan's plantation, with Baton Rouge lying just seven miles from us to the east. We can surely hear the cannon from here. They are all so kind to us that I ought to be contented, but still I wish I was once more at home. I suppose it is very unreasonable in me, but I cannot help it. I miss my old desk very much. It is so awkward to write on my knee that I cannot get used to it. Mine is a nice little room upstairs, detached from all the rest, for it is formed by a large dormer window looking to the north, from which I have seen a large number of gorillas passing and repassing in their rough costumes constantly. I enjoy the fresh air and all that, but pleasant as it is, I wish I was at home and all the fuss was over. Virginia Nolan and Miriam are already equipped in their riding costumes, so I must lay this down and get ready to join them in a scamper across the fields. How delighted I will be to get on a horse again! August 5th. About half-past nine, as we got up from the breakfast table, a gorilla told us the ram Arkansas was lying a few miles below, on her way to cooperate with Breckenridge, whose advance guard had already driven the pickets into Baton Rouge. Then we all grew wild with excitement. Such exclamations! Such delight that the dreadful moment had at last arrived! And yet you could see each stop as we rejoiced to offer up a prayer for the preservation of those who were risking their lives at that moment. Reason and all else was thrown aside, and we determined to participate in the danger if there was any to be incurred. Mother threatened us with shot and shell and bloody murder, but the loud report of half a dozen cannon in slow succession only made us more determined to see the fun. So Lily Nolan and Miss Walters got on horseback, and Philly, Ginny, Miriam, and I started off in the broiling sun, leaving word for the carriage to overtake us. When we once got in, the driver, being as crazy as we, fairly made his horses run along the road to catch a glimpse of our ram. When miles below she came in sight, we could no longer remain in the carriage, but mounted the levee and ran along on foot until we reached her, when we crossed to the outer levee, and there she lay at our feet. And nothing in her, after all. There lay a heavy, clumsy, rusty, ugly flatboat with a great square box in the center, while great cannon put their noses out at the sides and in front. The decks were crowded with men rough and dirty, jabbering and hastily eating their breakfast. That was the great Arkansas. God bless and protect her and the brave men she carries. While there a young man came up, and in answer to Philly's inquiries about her father, who, having gone to town yesterday to report, being paroled, had written last night to say no passes were granted to leave town, the young fellow informed her so pleasantly that her father was a prisoner, held as hostage for Mr. Castle. Poor Philly had to cry. So to be more agreeable, he told her, yes, he had been sent to a boat lying at the landing and ran the greatest risk, as the ram would probably sink the said boat in a few hours. How I hated the fool for his relish of evil tidings! But never mind our wild expedition or what came of it. Am I not patient? Ever since I commenced to write, the sound of a furious bombardment has been ringing in my ears, and beyond an occasional run to see the shells fly through the air, their white smoke rather, I have not said a word of it. The girls have all crowded on the little balcony up here towards town, and their shrieks of, There it goes! Listen! Look at them! Rise above the sound of the cannon, and occasionally draw me out too. 
but I sit here listening and wonder which report precedes the knocking down of our home, which shell is killing someone I know and love. Poor Tish and Dophy, where are they? And, oh, I hope they did not leave my birdie Jimmy to die in his cage. I charged them to let him loose if they could not carry him. Dophy will be so frightened. I hope they are out of danger. Oh, my dear home, shall I ever see you again? And the Brunos, oh, how I hope they are safe. These loud cannon make me heartsick, and yet I am so excited. How rapidly they answer each other. I am told the attack commenced at five this morning and lasted three hours. Those girls are shouting that Baton Rouge must be on fire from the volume of smoke in that direction. How they scream as the balls go up to show it to each other. I think I'll take a look, too. We are all going four or five miles through this warm sun to be nearer the scene of action. Any one might know there was no white man on the premises. There is the carriage. Oh, I am so seasick. What will I be before we get back? August 6th. We six madcaps got in the carriage and buggy and rode off in search of news. We took a quantity of old linen rags along, and during the whole drive our fingers were busy making lint. Once we stopped at a neighbor's to gather the news, but that did not interfere with our labors at all. Four miles from here we met a crowd of women flying, and among them recognized Mrs. Lanou and Noemi. A good deal of loud shouting brought them to the carriage in great surprise to see us there. They were running from the plantation where they had taken refuge, as it was not safe from the shells, as the gunboats had proved to them. The reports we had heard in the morning were from shots fired on this side of the river by them, in hopes of hurting a guerrilla or two. Noemi told us that two western regiments had laid down their arms, and General Williams had been killed by his own men. She looked so delighted, and yet it made me sick to think of his having been butchered so. Philly leaned out and asked her, as she asked everybody, if she knew anything about her father. Noemi, in her rapture over that poor man's death, exclaimed, "'Don't know a word about him. No Williams was cut to pieces, though.' And that is all we could learn from her. We went on until we came in sight of Baton Rouge. There it stood, looking so beautiful against the black, lowering sky, that I could not but regret its fate. We could see the garrison, state house, asylum, and all that, but the object of the greatest interest to me was the steeple of the Methodist church, for to the right of it lay home. While looking at it, a negro passed who was riding up and down the coast collecting lint, so I gave him all we had made and commenced some more. Presently we met Mr. Phillips, to whom Philly put the same question. He is on the Laurel Hill, a prisoner. Confound that negro, where did he go? And so on, each answer as far as concerned her seeming a labor, but the part relating to the servant very hearty. Poor Philly complained that everybody was selfish, thought only of their own affairs, and did not sympathize with her. Yes, my dear, I silently assented, for it was very true. Everyone seemed to think of their own interests alone. It was late before we got home, and then we had great fun in watching shells which we could dimly trace against the clouds, falling in what must have been the garrison. Then came a tremendous fire above, which may have been a boat, I don't know. I hear a tremendous firing again, and from the two volumes of smoke should judge it was the Arkansas and the Essex trying their strength at a distance. We are going down to see what's the fun. It would be absurd to record all the rumors that have reached us, since we can rely on none. They say we fought up to nine last night and occupied the garrison for five minutes when the shells forced us to abandon it. Also that four regiments laid down their arms, that the Federals were pursued by our men to the river, driven to the gunboats, and pushed off to prevent the western men from coming aboard. An eyewitness from this side reports that General Williams, 
they say, was forcibly held before a cannon and blown to pieces. For the sake of humanity, I hope this is false. Oh, what a sad day this is for our country! Mother disapproved so of our going to the levee to see the fight that we consented to remain, though Miriam and Jinny jumped into the buggy and went off alone. Presently came tidings that all the planters near Baton Rouge were removing their families and negroes, and that the Yankees were to shell the whole coast from there up to here. Then Philly, Lily Nolan, and I jumped in the carriage that was still waiting, and ran after the others to bring them back before they got in danger. But when we reached the end of the long lane, we saw them standing on the high levee wringing their hands and crying. We sprang out and joined them, and there, way at the bend, lay the Arkansas on fire. All except myself burst into tears and lamentations, and prayed aloud between their sobs. I had no words or tears. I could only look at our sole hope burning, going, and pray silently. Oh, it was so sad! Think, it was our sole dependence! and we five girls looked at her as the smoke rolled over her, watched the flames burst from her decks, and the shells as they exploded one by one beneath the water, coming up in jets of steam. And we watched until down the road we saw crowds of men toiling along toward us. Then we knew they were those who had escaped, and the girls sent up a shriek of pity. On they came, dirty, half-dressed, some with only their guns, others, a few, with bundles and knapsacks on their backs, grimy and tired, but still laughing. We called to the first and asked if the boat were really afire. They shouted, Yes, and went on, talking still. Presently one ran up and told us the story, how yesterday their engine had broken, and how they had labored all day to repair it how they had succeeded and had sat by their guns all night, and this morning as they started to meet the Essex the other engine had broken, how each officer wrote his opinion that it was impossible to fight her with any hope of success under such circumstances, and advised the captain to abandon her, how they had resolved to do so, had exchanged shots with the Essex across the point, and the first of the latter, only one also, had set ours afire, when the men were ordered to take their side-arms. They thought it was to board the Essex, assembled together, when the order was given to fire the Arkansas and go ashore, which was done in a few minutes. Several of the crew were around us then, and up and down the road they were scattered still in crowds. Miriam must have asked the name of some of the officers, for just then she called to me, "'He says that is Mr. Reed.' I looked at the foot of the levee and saw two walking together. I hardly recognized the gentleman I was introduced to on the McRae in the one that now stood below me in rough sailor pants, a pair of boots, and a very thin and slazy leal undershirt. That is all he had on except an old straw hat, and, yes, he held a primer. I did not think it would be embarrassing to him to meet me under such circumstances. I only thought of Jimmy's friend as escaping from a sad fate. So I rushed down a levee twenty feet high, saying, "'Oh, Mr. Reed, you won't recognize me, but I am Jimmy's sister.' He blushed modestly, shook my hand as though we were old friends, and assured me he remembered me, was glad to meet me, etc., then Miriam came down and talked to him, and then we went to the top of the levee where the rest were, and watched the poor Arkansas burn. By that time the crowd that had gone up the road came back, and we found ourselves in the center of two hundred men, just we five girls, talking with the officers around us as though they were old friends. You could only guess they were officers, for a dirtier, more forlorn set I never saw, not dirty, either. They looked clean, considering the work they had been doing. Nobody introduced anybody else. We all felt like brothers and sisters in our common calamity. There was one handsome Kentuckian, whose name I soon found to be Talbot, 
who looked charmingly picturesque in his coarse cottonade pants, white shirt, straw hat, black hair, beard, and eyes, with rosy cheeks. He was a graduate of the Naval Academy some years ago. Then another jolly-faced young man from the same academy pleased me, too. He, the doctor, and the captain were the only ones who possessed a coat in the whole crowd, the few who saved theirs carrying them over their arms. Mr. Reed more than once blushingly remarked that they were prepared to fight and hardly expected to meet us, but we pretended to think there was nothing unusual in his dress. I can understand, though, that he should feel rather awkward. I would not like to meet him if I was in the same costume. They all talked over their loss cheerfully as far as the loss of money, watches, clothes were concerned, but they were disheartened about their boat. One threw himself down near my feet, saying, Me voila, I have saved my gun, et puis the clothes that I stand in, and laughed as though it were an excellent joke. One who had been on the Merrimack chiefly regretted the loss of the commission appointing him there, though he had not saved a single article. The one with the jolly face told me Will Pinckney was among those attacking Baton Rouge, and assured him he expected to take supper there last night. He thought it would be with us, I know. I hope he is safe. After a while the men were ordered to march up the lane to some resting spot it is best not to mention here, and straggled off. But there were many sick among them, one wounded at Vicksburg, and we instantly voted to walk the mile and three-quarters home and give them the carriage and buggy. But long after they left we stood with our new friends on the levee watching the last of the Arkansas, and saw the Essex and two gunboats crowded with men cautiously turn the point and watch her burn. What made me furious was the thought of the glowing accounts they would give of their capture of the Arkansas. Capture, and they fired a shot apiece, for all the firing we heard was the discharge of her guns by the flames. We saw them go back as cautiously, and I was furious knowing the accounts they would publish of what we ourselves had destroyed. We had seen many shells explode and one magazine, and would have waited for the other if the clouds had not threatened rain speedily. But we had to leave her a mere wreck, still burning, and started off on our long walk. In our hurry I had brought neither handkerchief nor gloves, but hardly missed either, I was so excited. Mr. Talbot walked home with me, and each of the others with someone else. He had a small bundle and a sword, and the latter I insisted on carrying. It was something to shoulder a sword made for use rather than for ornament, so I would carry it. He said he would remember who had carried it, and the recollection would give it a new value in his eyes, and I might rest assured it should never be disgraced after that, and all that sort of thing, of course, as it is usual to say on such occasions but I shouldered the sword bravely, determined to show my appreciation of the sacrifice they had made for us, in coming to our rescue on a boat they had every reason to believe was unsafe. I liked Mr. Talbot. He made himself very agreeable in that long walk. He asked permission to send me a trophy from the first action in which he used that sword, and didn't I say yes. He thought Southern men had every encouragement in the world from the fact that the ladies welcomed them with great kindness in victory or defeat, insinuating he thought they hardly deserved our compassion after their failure on the Arkansas. But I stoutly denied that it was a failure. Had they not done their best? Was it their fault the machinery broke? And in defeat or victory were they not still fighting for us? Were we the less grateful when they met with reverse? Oh, didn't I laud the southern men with my whole heart, and I think he felt better for it, too. Yes, I like him. We all met at the steps, and water was given to our cavaliers, who certainly enjoyed it. We could not ask them in, as Dr. Nolan is on his parole, but Philly intimated that if they chose to order they might do as they pleased, as women could not resist armed men. 
So they took possession of the sugar house and helped themselves to something to eat, and were welcome to do it, since no one could prevent. But they first stood talking on the balcony gaily, and we parted with many warm wishes on both sides, insisting that if they assisted at a second attack on Baton Rouge they must remember our house was at their service, wounded or in health. And they all shook hands with us, and looked pleased, and said, God bless you, and good-bye. Evening. I heard a while ago the doctor of the ram, who brought back the buggy, say the Arkansas's crew were about leaving. So remembering poor Mr. Reed had lost everything, mother, suggesting he might need money, gave me twenty dollars to put in his hands as some slight help towards reaching his destination. Besides, coming from Jimmy's mother, he could not have been hurt. But when I got down he was far up the lane, walking too fast for me to overtake him. Then I tried to catch Mr. Stevenson to give it to him for me, but failed. Presently we saw, I am afraid to say, how many wagons loaded with them coming from the sugar house. So Philly, Lily, and I snatched up some five bottles of gin between us, and ran out to give it to them. A rough old sailor received mine with a flood of thanks, and the others gave theirs to those behind. An officer rode up, saying, "'Ladies, there is no help for it. The Yankee cavalry are after us, and we must fight them in the corn. Take care of yourselves.' We shouted, "'Yes,' told them to bring in the wounded, and we would nurse them. Then the men cried, "'God bless you,' and we cried, "'Hurrah for the Arkansas's crew, and fight for us.' Altogether it was a most affecting scene. Philly, seeing how poorly armed they were, suggested a gun, which I flew after and delivered to a rough old tar. When I got out, the cart then passing held Mr. Talbot, who smiled benignly and waved his hat like the rest. He looked still better in his black coat, but the carts reminded me of what the guillotine days must have been in France. He shouted, "Goodbye." we shouted, "'Come to us if you are wounded.' He smiled and bowed, and I cried, "'Use that sword!' Whereupon he sprang to his feet and grasped the hilt as though about to commence. Then came other officers, Mr. Scales, Mr. Barbloud, etc., who smiled recognition, stopped the wagon as Philly handed up a plate of bread and meat, and talked gaily as they divided it until the captain rode up. "'On, gentlemen, not a moment to lose.' Then the cart started off, the empty plate was flung overboard, and they rode off waving hats and crying, "'God bless you, ladies,' in answer to our repeated offers of taking care of them if they were hurt. And they have gone to meet the Yankees, and I hope they won't, for they have worked enough to-day, and from my heart I pray God prosper those brave men. August 7th. Last night, shortly after we got in bed, we were aroused by loud cannonading towards Baton Rouge, and running out on the small balcony up here, saw the light of a great fire in that direction. From the constant reports and the explosion of what seemed to be several powder magazines, we imagined it to be either the garrison or a gunboat. Whatever it was, it was certainly a great fire." We all ran out in our nightgowns and watched for an hour in the damp air, I without even shoes. We listened to the fight for a long while until the sound ceased, and we went back to bed. Evening. I am so disheartened. I have been listening with the others to a man who was telling us about Baton Rouge until I am heartsick. He says the Yankees have been largely reinforced, and are prepared for another attack which will probably take place to-morrow, that the fight was a dreadful one, we driving them in and losing twelve hundred to their fifteen hundred. It must have been awful, and that our troops have resolved to burn the town down since they cannot hold it under the fire of the gunboats. August 8th, Friday Again last night, about nine, we heard cannon in Baton Rouge, and watched the flashes, which preceded the reports by a minute at least, for a long time. 
We must have seen our own firing. Perhaps we wanted to find out the batteries of the enemy. It was not the most delightful thing imaginable to watch what might be the downfall of our only home, and then to think each ball might bring death to someone we love. Ah, no, it was not pleasant. Miriam and I have many friends in Breckenridge's division, I expect, if we could only hear the names of the regiments. The fourth is certainly there, and poor Will, I wonder if he has had his supper yet. I have been thinking of him ever since Mr. Scales told me he was there, and praying myself sick for his safety and that of the rest. I shut my eyes at every report and say, Oh, please, poor Will, and the others, too and when I don't hear the cannon, I pray to be in advance of the next. It is now midday, and again we hear firing, but have yet to learn the true story of the first day's fight. Preserve me from the country in such stirring days. We might as well be in Europe as to have the Mississippi between us and town. By unanimous consent the little lane in front of the house has been christened Gorilla Lane, and the long one leading to the river, Arkansas. What an episode that was in our lives! The officers go by the name of Miriam's, Ginny's, Sarah's, as though they belonged to each. Those girls did me the meanest thing imaginable. Mr. Talbot and I were planning a grand combined attack on Baton Rouge, in which he was to command a fleet and attack the town by the river, while I promised to get up a battalion of girls and attack them in the rear. We had settled it all except the time, when just then all the others stopped talking. I went on, and now it is only necessary for you to name the day. Here the girls commenced to giggle, and the young men tried to suppress a smile. I felt annoyed, but it did not strike me until after they had left that I had said anything absurd. What evil imaginations they must have if they could have fancied I meant anything except the battle! End of Book Three, Part One Book Three, Part Two of A Confederate Girl's Diary This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson Book Three, Part Two, August Ninth to August Thirteenth, 1862 August Ninth. To our great surprise, Charlie came in this morning from the other side. He was in the battle, and General Carter, and dozens of others that we did not think of. See the mountain reduced to a molehill. He says, though the fight was desperate, we lost only eighty-five killed and less than a hundred and fifty wounded, and we had only twenty-five hundred against the Yankees' four thousand five hundred. There is no truth in our having held the garrison even for a moment, though we drove them down to the river in a panic. The majority ran like fine fellows, but a main regiment fought like devils. He says Will and Thompson Bird set fire to the Yankee camp with the greatest alacrity, as though it were rare fun. General Williams was killed as he passed Piper's by a shot from a window supposed to have been fired by a citizen. Someone from town told him that the Federals were breaking in the houses, destroying the furniture, and tearing the clothes of the women and children in shreds like maniacs. Oh, my home! I wonder if they have entered ours. What a jolly time they would have had over all the letters I left in my desk. Butler has ordered them to burn Baton Rouge if forced to evacuate it. Looks as though he was not so sure of holding it. Miss Turner told Miriam that her mother attempted to enter town after the fight to save some things, when the gallant Colonel Dudley put a pistol to her head, called her an old she-devil, and told her he would blow her d brains out if she moved a step, that anyhow none but we d women had put the men up to fighting, and we were the ones who were to blame for the fuss. There is no name he did not call us. August 10th, Sunday. Is this really Sunday? 
never felt less pious or less seriously disposed. Listen to my story, and though I will, of course, fall far short of the actual terror that reigned, yet it will show it in a lukewarm light that can at least recall the excitement to me. To begin, then, last evening, about six o'clock, as we sat reading, sewing, and making lint in the parlour, we heard a tremendous shell whizzing past, which those who watched said passed not five feet above the house. Of course there was a slight stir among the unsophisticated, though we who had passed through bombardments, sieges, and alarms of all kinds coolly remarked, a shell, and kept quiet. The latter class was not very numerous. It was from one of the three Yankee boats that lay in the river close by, the Essex and two gunboats, which were sweeping teams, provisions, and negroes from all the plantations they stopped at from Baton Rouge up. The negroes, it is stated, are to be armed against us as in town, where all those who manned the cannon on Tuesday were for the most part killed, and served them right. Another shell was fired at a carriage containing Mrs. Durald and several children, under pretense of discovering if she was a gorilla, doubtless. Fortunately she was not hurt, however. By the time the little emeute had subsided, determined to have a frolic, Miss Walters, Ginny, and I got on our horses and rode off down the Arkansas Lane, to have a gallop and a peep at the gunboats from the levee. But Mother's entreaties prevented us from going that near, as she cried that it was well known they fired at every horse or vehicle they saw in the road, seeing a thousand gorillas in every puff of dust, and we were sure to be killed, murdered, and all sorts of bloody deaths awaited us. So to satisfy her we took the road about a mile from the river, in full view, however. We had not gone very far before we met a Mr. Watson, a plain farmer of the neighborhood, who begged us to go back. "'You'll be fired on, ladies, sure. You don't know the danger. Take my advice and go home as quick as possible before they shell you. They shot buggies and carriages, and of course they won't mind horses with women. Please go home.' But Jinny, who had taken a fancy to go on, acted as spokeswoman, and determined to go on in spite of his advice. So, nothing loath to follow her example, we thanked him and rode on. Another met us, looked doubtful, said it was not so dangerous if the Yankees did not see the dust, but if they did we would be pretty apt to see a shell soon after. Here was frolic. So we rode on some mile or two beyond, but failing to see anything startling, turned back again. About two miles from here we met Mr. Watson coming at full speed. The ladies, he said, had sent him after us in all haste. There was a report that the whole coast was to be shelled. A lady had passed, flying with her children. The carriage was ordered out. They were only waiting for us to run too. We did not believe a word of it, and were indignant at their credulity, as well as determined to persuade them to remain where they were if possible. When told their plan was to run to the house formerly used as a guerrilla camp, we laughed heartily. Suppose the Yankees fired a shell into it to discover its inhabitants. The idea of choosing a spot so well known. And what fun in running to a miserable hole when we might sleep comfortably here. I am afraid rebellion was in the air. Indeed, an impudent little negro who threw open the gate for us interrupted Jinny in the midst of a tirade with a sly, Here's the beginning of a little fuss. We found them all crazy with fear. I did not say much. I was too provoked to trust myself to argue with so many frightened women. I only said I saw no necessity. Jinny resisted, but finally succumbed. Mr. Watson, whom we had enlisted on our side also, said it was by no means necessary, but if we were determined we might go to his house about four miles away and stay there. It was very small, but we were welcome. We had in the meantime thrown off our riding skirts and stood just in our plain dresses, though the others were freshly dressed for an exodus. Before the men left the carriage came, though by that time we had drawn half the party on our side. We said we would take supper and decide after, so he went off. 
In a few moments a rocket went up from one of the boats, which attracted our attention. Five minutes after we saw a flash directly before us. See it? Lightning, I expect, said Philly. The others all agreed, but I kept quiet, knowing that some at least knew what it was as well as I, and determined not to give the alarm, for I was beginning to feel foolish. Before half a minute more came a tearing, hissing sound, a skyrocket whose music I had heard before. Instantly I remembered my running bag and flew upstairs to get it, escaping just in time from the scene which followed on the gallery which was afterwards most humorously described to me. But I was out of hearing of the screams of each, and yet I must have heard them, neither saw Miss Walters tumble against the wall, nor mother turn over her chair, nor the general melee that followed in which Mrs. Walters, trying to scale the carriage, was pulled out by Uncle Will, who shouted to his plunging horses first, then to the other unreasoning creatures, "'Woe there! Tain't safe! Take to the fields! Take to the woods! Run to the sugar-house! Take to your heels!' in a frenzy of excitement. I escaped all that, and was putting on my hoops and hastily catching up any article that presented itself to me in my speed, when the shell burst over the roof and went rolling down on the gallery according to the account of those then below. Two went far over the house out of sight. All three were seen by Mr. Watson, who came galloping up in a few moments, crying, "'Ladies, for God's sake, leave the house!' Then I heard mother calling, "'Sarah, you will be killed! Leave your clothes and run!' and a hundred ejaculations that came too fast for me to answer except by an occasional, "'Coming, if you will send me a candle!' Candle was the same as though I had demanded a hand-grenade, in my mother's opinion, for she was sure it would be the signal for a bombardment of my exposed room. So I tossed down my bundle, swept combs and hairpins into my bosom, all points up, and ravished a candle from someone. How quickly I got on then! I saved the most useless of articles with the greatest zeal, and probably left the most serviceable ones. One single dress did my running bag contain, a white linen cambric with a tiny pink flower, the one I wore when I told Hal good-bye for the last time. The others I left. When I got down with my knapsack, Mother, Philly, and Mrs. Walters were at Randallson's Landing, August 11th. I don't mean those ladies were, but that I am at present. I'll account for it after I have disposed of the stampede. Imagine no interruption and continue. In the carriage, urging Uncle Will to hurry on, and I had hardly time to thrust my sack under their feet before they were off. Lily and Miss Walters were already in the buggy, leaving Jinny and me to follow on horseback. I ran up after my riding skirt, which I was surprised to find behind a trunk, and rolled up in it was my running bag with all my treasures. I was very much provoked at my carelessness. Indeed, I cannot imagine how it got there, for it was the first thing I thought of. When I got back there was no one to be seen except Jinny and two negroes who held our horses, and who disappeared the instant we were mounted. With the exception of two women who were running to the woods, we were the only ones on the lot, until Mr. Watson galloped up to urge us on. Again I had to notice this peculiarity about women, that the married ones were invariably the first to fly in time of danger, and always leave the young ones to take care of themselves. Here were our three matrons, prophesying that the house would be burnt, the Yankees upon us, and all murdered in ten minutes, flying down the gorilla lane, and leaving us to encounter the horrors they foretold alone. It was a splendid gallop in the bright moonlight over the fields, only it was made uncomfortable by the jerking of my running-bag, until I happily thought of turning it before. A hard ride of four miles in about twenty minutes brought us to the house of the man who so kindly offered his hospitality. It was a little hut, about as large as our parlour, and already crowded to overflowing, as he was entertaining three families from Baton Rouge can't imagine where he put them either. 
but it seems to me the poorer the man and the smaller the house, the greater the hospitality you meet with. There were so many of us that there was not room on the balcony to turn. The man wanted to prepare supper, but we declined, as Philly had sent back for ours which we had missed. I saw another instance of the pleasure the vulgar take in the horrible. A Mr. Hill, speaking of Dr. Nolan, told Philly he had no doubt he had been sent to New Orleans on the Whiteman that had carried General Williams's body, and that every soul had gone down on her. Fortunately, just then the overseer brought a letter from him, saying he had gone on another boat, or the man's relish of the distressing might have been gratified. It was so crowded there that we soon suggested going a short distance beyond to Mr. Lobdell's and staying there for the night, as all strenuously objected to our returning home, as there was danger from prowling Yankees. So we mounted again, and after a short ride we reached the house, where all were evidently asleep. But necessity knows no rules, and the driver soon aroused an old gentleman who came out and invited us in. A middle-aged lady met us and made us perfectly at home by leaving us to take care of ourselves. Most people would have thought it indifference, but I knew it was manque de savoir-faire merely and preferred doing as I pleased. If she had been officious I would have been embarrassed. So we walked in the moonlight, Ginny and I, while the rest sat in the shade, and all discussed the fun of the evening, those who had been most alarmed laughing loudest. The old gentleman insisted that we girls had been the cause of it all, that our white bodies, I wore a Russian shirt, and black skirts could easily have caused us to be mistaken for men, that at all events three or four people on horseback would be a sufficient pretext for firing a shell or two. In short, young ladies, he said, there is no doubt in my mind you were mistaken for gorillas, and that they only wanted to give you time to reach the woods, where they heard they have a camp, before shooting at you. In short, take my advice and never mount a horse again when there is a Yankee in sight. We were highly gratified at being mistaken for them, and pretended to believe it was true. I hardly think he was right, though. It is too preposterous." Pourtant, Sunday morning the Yankees told a negro they did not mean to touch the house, but were shooting at some guerrillas at a camp just beyond. We know the last guerrilla left the parish five days ago. Our host insisted on giving us supper, though Philly represented that ours was on the road, and by eleven o'clock, tired alike of moonlight and fasting, we gladly accepted, and rapidly made the preserves and batter-cakes fly. Ours was a garret room, well furnished, abounding in odd closets and corners, with curious dormer windows that were reached by long little corridors. I should have slept well, but I lay awake all night. Mother and I occupied a narrow single bed with a bar of the thickest, heaviest material imaginable. Suffocation awaited me inside, gnats and mosquitoes outside. In order to be strictly impartial, I lay awake to divide my time equally between the two attractions, and I think I succeeded pretty well. So I spent the night on the extreme edge of the bed, never turning over, but fanning mother constantly. I was not sorry when daybreak appeared, but dressed and ascended the observatory to get a breath of air. Below me I beheld four wagons loaded with the young Mrs. Lobdell's baggage, the Yankees had visited them in the evening, swept off everything they could lay their hands on, and with a sick child she was obliged to leave her house in the night and fly to her father-in-law. I wondered at their allowing her four wagons of trunks and bundles. It was very kind. If I were a Federal I think it would kill me to hear the whisper of, Hide the silver, wherever I came." Their having frequently relieved families of such trifles, along with the negroes, teams, etc., has put others on their guard now. As I sat in the parlor in the early morning, Mrs. Walters, en blouse volante, and all échevelée, came in to tell me of Mr. Lobdell's misfortunes. They took his negroes, right hand up, his teams, left hand up, his preserves, 
both hands clutching her hair, they swept off everything except four old women who could not walk. They told him if he didn't come report himself, they'd come fetch him in three days. They beggared him, both eyes rolling like a ship in a storm. I could not help laughing. Mr. Bird sat on the gallery and had been served in the same way, with the addition of a pair of handcuffs for a little while. It was not a laughing matter, but the old lady made it comical by her gestures. When we suggested returning there was another difficulty. All said it was madness that the Yankees would sack the house and burn it over our heads. We would be insulted, etc., I said no one yet had ever said an impudent thing to me, and Yankees certainly would not attempt it, but the old gentleman told me I did not know what I was talking about, so I hushed, but determined to return. Ginny and I sat an hour on horseback waiting for the others to settle what they would do, and after having half roasted ourselves in the sun they finally agreed to go too, and we set off in a gallop which we never broke until we reached the house, which to our great delight we found standing and not infested with Yankees. Linwood, August 12th. Another resting place, out of reach of shells for the first time since last April. For how long, I wonder? For wherever we go we bring shells and Yankees. Would not be surprised at a visit from them out here now. Let me take up the thread of that never-ending story and account for my present position. It all seems tame now, but it was very exciting at the time. As soon as I threw down bonnet and gloves I commenced writing, but before I had halfway finished, Mother, who had been holding a consultation downstairs, ran up to say the overseer had advised us all to leave as the place was not safe, and that I must pack up instantly, as, unless we got off before the Essex came up, it would be impossible to leave at all. All was commotion. Everyone flew to pack up. Philly determined to go to her friends at Grosse Tete, and insisted on carrying us off with her. But I determined to reach Miriam and Lily, if possible, rather than put the Federal Army between us. All en déshabillé, I commenced to pack our trunk, but had scarcely put an article in when they cried the Essex was rounding the point, and our last opportunity passing away. Then I flew, and by the time the boat got opposite to us the trunk was locked and I sat on it, completely dressed, waiting for the wagon. We had then to wait for the boat to get out of sight to avoid a broadside, so it was half-past ten before we set off, fortified by several glasses of buttermilk apiece. All went in the carriage except Ginny, Lily Nolan, and me, and we perched on the baggage in the wagon. Such stifling heat! The wagon jarred dreadfully, and seated at the extreme end on a wooden trunk traversed by narrow slats, Ginny and I were jolted until we lost our breath all down the Arkansas Lane, when we changed for the front part. I shall never forget the heat of that day. Four miles beyond, the carriage stopped at some house, and still determined to get over the river, I stepped into the little cart that held our trunks, drove up to the side of it, and insisted on Mother's getting in rather than going the other way with Philly. I had a slight discussion and overcame Mother's reluctance to Philly's objections with some difficulty, but finally prevailed on the former to get into the cart and jolted off amid a shower of reproaches, regrets, and good-byes. I knew I was right, though, and the idea reconciled me to the heat, dust, jarring, and gunboat that was coming up behind us. Six miles more brought us to Mr. Kane's, where we arrived at two o'clock, tired, dirty, and almost unrecognizable. We were received with the greatest cordiality in spite of that. Mother knew both him and his wife, but though I had never seen either, the latter kissed me as affectionately as though we had known each other. It was impossible to cross when the gunboat was in sight, so they made us stay with them until the next morning. A bath and clean clothes soon made me quite presentable, and I really enjoyed the kindness we met with, in spite of a tearing headache, and a distended feeling about the eyes, as though I never meant to close them again. 
the consequence of my vigil, I presume. Oh, those dear, kind people! I shall not soon forget them. Mr. Kane told Mother he believed he would keep me, at all events he would make an exchange and give her his only son in my place. I told him I was willing, as Mother thought much more of her sons than of her daughters. I forgot to say that we met General Allen's partner a mile or two from Dr. Nolan's, who told us it was a wise move, that he had intended recommending it. All he owned had been carried off, his plantation stripped. He said he had no doubt that all the coast would be ravaged, and they had promised to burn his and many other houses, and Dr. Nolan's, though it might possibly be spared in consideration of his being a prisoner and his daughter being unprotected, would most probably suffer with the rest, but even if spared it was no place for women. He offered to take charge of us all and send the furniture into the interior before the Yankees should land, which Philly gladly accepted. What a splendid rest I had at Mrs. Kane's! I was not conscious of being alive until I awaked abruptly in the early morning with a confused sense of having dreamed something very pleasant. Mr. Kane accompanied us to the ferry some miles above, riding by the buggy, and leaving us under care of Mr. Randelson, after seeing us in the large flat, took his leave. After an hour spent at the hotel after landing on this side, we procured a conveyance and came on to Mr. Elder's, where we astonished Lily by our unexpected appearance very much. Miriam had gone over to spend the day with her, so we were all together and talked over our adventures with the greatest glee. After dinner Miriam and I came over here to see them all, leaving the others to follow later. I was very glad to see Helen Carter once more. If I was not, I hope I may live in Yankee land, and I can't invoke a more dreadful punishment than that. Well, here we are, and heaven only knows our next move, but we must settle on some spot which seems impossible in the present state of affairs, when no lodgings are to be found. I feel like a homeless beggar. Will Pinckney told them here that he doubted if our house were still standing, as the fight occurred just back of it, and every volley directed towards it. He says he thought of it every time the cannon was fired, knowing where the shot would go. August 13th. I am in despair. Miss Jones, who has just made her escape from town, brings a most dreadful account. She, with seventy-five others, took refuge at Dr. Enders's, more than a mile and a half below town, at Hall's. It was there we sent the two trunks containing father's papers and our clothing and silver. Hearing that guerrillas had been there, the Yankees went down, shelled the house in the night, turning all those women and children out, who barely escaped with their clothing, and let the soldiers loose on it. They destroyed everything they could lay their hands on, if it could not be carried off, broke open armoires, trunks, sacked the house, and left it one scene of devastation and ruin. They even stole Miss Jones's braid. She got here with nothing but the clothes she wore. This is a dreadful blow to me. Yesterday I thought myself beggared when I heard that our house was probably burnt, remembering all the clothing, books, furniture, etc. that it contained. But I consoled myself with the recollection of a large trunk packed in the most scientific style, containing quantities of nightgowns, skirts, chemises, dresses, cloaks, in short our very best, which was in safety. Winter had no terrors when I thought of the nice warm clothes. I only wished I had a few of the organdy dresses I had packed up before wearing. And now it is all gone, silver, father's law papers, without which we are beggars, and clothing, nothing left. I could stand that, but as each little article of Harry's came up before me, I had put many in the trunk, I lost heart. They may clothe their negro women with my clothes, since they only steal for them, but to take things so sacred to me. Oh, my God, teach me to forgive them. Poor Miss Jones! 
They went into her clothes bag and took out articles which were certainly of no service to them, for mere deviltry. There are so many sufferers in this case that it makes it still worse. The plantation just below was served in the same way, whole families fired into before they knew of the intention of the Yankees. Was it not fine sport? I have always been an advocate of peace, if we could name the conditions ourselves. But I say war to the death. I would give my life to be able to take arms against the vandals who are laying waste to our fair land. I suppose it is because I have no longer anything to lose that I am desperate. Before I always opposed the burning of Baton Rouge as a useless piece of barbarism in turning out five thousand women and children on the charity of the world, but I noticed that those who had no interest there warmly advocated it. Lily Nolan cried loudly for it, thought it only just, but the first shell that whistled over her father's house made her crazy with rage. The brutes, the beasts, how cruel, wicked, etc. It was too near home for her then. There is the greatest difference between my property and yours. I notice that the further I get from town, the more ardent are the people to have it burned. It recalls very forcibly Thackeray's cut in the Virginians when speaking of the determination of the rebels to burn the cities. He says he observed that all those who were most eager to burn New York were inhabitants of Boston, while those who were most zealous to burn Boston had all their property in New York. It is true all the world over, and I am afraid I am becoming indifferent about the fate of our town. Anything so it is speedily settled. Tell me it would be of service to the Confederacy, and I would set fire to my home, if still standing, willingly. But would it? End of Book Three, Part Two Book Three, Part Three of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Three, Part Three, August 17th to August 24th, 1862. August 17th. Another Sunday. Strange that the time, which should seem so endless, flies so rapidly. Miriam complains that Sunday comes every day, but though that seems a little too much, I insist it comes twice a week. Let time fly, though, for each day brings us so much nearer our destiny, which I long to know. Thursday we heard from a lady just from town that our house was standing the day before, which somewhat consoled us for the loss of our silver and clothing, but yesterday came tidings of new afflictions. I declare we have acted out the first chapter of Job, all except that verse about the death of his sons and daughters. God shield us from that. I do not mind the rest." While he was yet speaking, another came in and said, Thy brethren and kinsmen gathered together to wrest thine abode from the hand of the Philistines, which pressed sore upon thee, when, lo, the Philistines sallied forth with fire and sword, and laid thine habitation waste and desolate, and I only am escaped to tell thee. Yes, the Yankees, fearing the Confederates might slip in unseen, resolved to have full view of their movements, so put the torch to all eastward, from Colonel Mata's to the Advocate. That would lay open a fine tract of country alone, but unfortunately it is said that once started it was not so easy to control the flames, which spread considerably beyond their appointed limits. Some say it went as far as Florida Street. If so, we are lost, as that is a half-square below us. For several days the fire has been burning, but very little can be learned of the particulars. I am sorry for Colonel Mata. Such a fine brownstone front, the finest in town. Poor Minna, poverty will hardly agree with her. As for our home, I hope against hope. 
I will not believe it is burnt until somebody declares having been present on that occasion. Yet so many frame houses on that square must have readily caught fire from the sparks. Wicked as it may seem, I would rather have all I own burned than in the possession of the negroes. Fancy my magenta organdy on a dark beauty. Bah, I think the sight would enrage me. Miss Jones's trials are enough to drive her crazy. She had the pleasure of having four officers in her house, men who sported epaulettes and red sashes, accompanied by a negro woman, at whose disposal all articles were placed. The worthy companion of these gentlemen walked around selecting things with the most natural airs and graces. This, she would say, we must have, and some of those books, you know, and all the preserves, and these chairs and tables, and all the clothes, of course, and, yes, the rest of these things. So she would go on, the gentleman assuring her she had only to choose what she wanted, and that they would have them removed immediately. Madame thought they really must have the wine, and those handsome cut-glass goblets. I hardly think I could have endured such a scene, to see all I owned given to negroes, without even an accusation being brought against me of disloyalty. One officer departed with a fine velvet cloak on his arm. Another took such a bundle of Miss Jones's clothes that he had to have it lifted by someone else on his horse, and rode off holding it with difficulty. This I heard from herself yesterday, as I spent the day with Lily and Mother at Mr. Elder's, where she is now staying. Can anything more disgraceful be imagined? They all console me by saying there is no one in Baton Rouge who could possibly wear my dresses without adding a considerable piece to the belt. But that is nonsense. Another pull at the corset strings would bring them easily to the size I have been reduced by nature and bones. Besides, oh horror, suppose instead they should let in a piece of another color. That would annihilate me. Pshaw! I do not care for the dresses. If they had only left me those little articles of father's and Harry's. But that is hard to forgive." August 19th. Yesterday, two colonels, Shields and Bro, both of whom distinguished themselves in the Battle of Baton Rouge, dined here. Their personal appearance was by no means calculated to fill me with awe, or even to give one an idea of their rank, for their dress consisted of merely cottonade pants, flannel shirts, and extremely short jackets, which, however, is rapidly becoming the uniform of the Confederate States. Just three lines back, three soldiers came in to ask for molasses. I was alone downstairs, and the nervous trepidation with which I received the dirty, coarsely clad strangers, who, however, looked as though they might be gentlemen, has raised a laugh against me from the others who looked down from a place of safety. I don't know what I did that was out of the way. I felt odd receiving them as though it was my home, and having to answer their questions about buying, by means of acting as telegraph between them and Mrs. Carter. I confess to that. But I know I talked reasonably about the other subjects. Playing hostess in a strange house— of course it was uncomfortable, and to add to my embarrassment, the handsomest one offered to pay for the milk he had just drunk. Fancy my feelings as I hastened to assure him that General Carter never received money for such things, and from a soldier besides it was not to be thought of. He turned to the other, saying, "'In Mississippi we don't meet with such people. Miss, they don't hesitate to charge four bits a canteen for milk.' They take all they can. They're not like you Louisianians. I was surprised to hear him say it of his own state, but told him we thought here we could not do enough for them. August 20th. Last evening, after hard labor at pulling molasses candy, needing some relaxation after our severe exertions, we determined to have some fun though the sun was just setting in clouds as watery as New Orleans milk, and promised an early twilight. 
All day it had been drizzling, but that was nothing. So Anna Badger, Miriam, and I set off through the mud to get up the little cart to ride in, followed by cries from the elder ladies of, "'Girls, soap is a dollar and a half a bar. Starch a dollar a pound. Take up those skirts.' We had all started stiff and clean, and it did seem a pity to let them drag, so up they went. You can imagine how high, when I tell you my answer to Anna's question as to whether hers were in danger of touching the mud was, not unless you sit down. The only animal we could discover that was not employed was a poor old pony, most appropriately called Tom Thumb, and him we seized instantly, together with a man to harness him. We accompanied him from the stable to the quarter where the cart was, through mud and water, urging him on with shouts and cries, and laughing until we could laugh no longer at the appearance of each. The cart had been hauling wood, but that was nothing to us. In we tumbled, and with a driver as diminutive as the horse, started off for Mr. Elder's, where we picked up all the children to be found, and went on. All told we were twelve drawn by that poor horse who seemed at each step about to undergo the ham process and leave us his hindquarters while he escaped with the four ones and harness i dare say we never enjoyed a carriage as much though each was holding a muddy child riding was very fine but soon came the question how shall we turn which was not so easily solved for neither horse nor boy understood it in the least Every effort to describe a circle brought us the length of the cart farther up the road, and we promised fair to reach Bayou Serra before morning at that rate. At last, after fruitless efforts to dodge under the harness and escape, Pony came to a standstill and could not be induced to move. The children took advantage of the pause to tumble out, but we sat still. Bogged, and it was very dark already. "'Wouldn't we get it when we got home?' Anna groaned. "'Uncle Albert!' Miriam laughed. "'The General!' I sighed. "'Mrs. Carter!' We knew what we deserved, and darker and darker it grew, and Pony still inflexible. At last we beheld a buggy on a road nearby, and in answer to Morgan's shouts of, "'Uncle! Uncle! Come turn our cart!' A gentleman jumped out and in an instant performed the Herculean task. Pony found motion so agreeable that it was with the greatest difficulty we prevailed on him to stop, while we fished seven children out of the mud as they pursued his flying hoofs. Once more at Mr. Elder's we pitched them out without ceremony and drove home as fast as possible, trying to fancy what punishment we would receive for being out so late. Miriam suggested, as the most horrible one, being sent to bed supperless. Anna's terror was the general's displeasure. I suggested being deprived of rides in future, when all agreed that mine was the most severe yet. So as we drove around the circle, those two set up what was meant for a hearty laugh to show they were not afraid, which, however, sounded rather shaky to me. I don't think any of us felt like facing the elders. Miriam suggested anticipating our fate by retiring voluntarily to bed. Anna thought we had best run up and change our shoes anyway. But at last, with her daredevil laugh, Miriam sauntered into the room where they all were, followed by us, and thrusting her wet feet into the fire that was kindled to drive away the damp, followed also by us, commenced a laughable account of our fun, in which we, of course, followed too. If I had fancied we were to escape scot-free, we would most surely have got a scolding. It is almost an inducement to hope always for the worst. The general did not mention the hour, did not prohibit future rides. While we were yet toasting, a negro came in with what seemed a banknote and asked his master to see how much it was, as one of the women had sold some of her watermelons to the three soldiers of the morning, who had given that to her for a dollar. The general opened it. It was a pass. So vanish all faith in human nature. 
They looked so honest. I could never have believed it of them. But it looked so much like the shin plasters we are forced to use that no wonder they made the mistake. To discover who had played so mean a trick on the poor old woman, the general asked me if I could decipher the name. I threw myself on my knees by the hearth, and by the flickering light read, S. Kimes, by order of C. H. Lusenberg, Provost Marshal, Onolona, Mississippi, with a gasp of astonishment that raised a burst of laughter against me. Thought he was taken prisoner long ago. At all events, I didn't know he had turned banker, or that his valuable autograph was worth a dollar. August 21st. Miriam and mother are going to Baton Rouge in a few hours to see if anything can be saved from the general wreck. From the reports of the removal of the penitentiary machinery, state library, Washington statue, etc., we presume that that part of the town yet standing is to be burnt like the rest. I think, though, that mother has delayed too long. However, I dreamed last night that we had saved a great deal in trunks, and my dreams sometimes come true. Waking with that impression, I was surprised a few hours after to hear mother's sudden determination. But I also dreamed I was about to marry a federal officer. That was in consequence of having answered the question whether I would do so with an emphatic yes if I loved him, which will probably ruin my reputation as a patriot in this parish. Bah! I am no bigot or fool either." August 23rd. Yesterday, Anna and I spent the day with Lily, and the rain in the evening obliged us to stay all night. Dr. Perkins stopped there and repeated the same old stories we have been hearing about the powder placed under the state house and garrison to blow them up if forced to evacuate the town. He confirms the story about all the convicts being set free and the town being pillaged by the Negroes and the rest of the Yankees. He says his own slaves told him they were allowed to enter the houses and help themselves, and what they did not want the Yankees either destroyed on the spot or had it carried to the garrison and burned. They also bragged of having stopped ladies on the street, cut their necklaces from their necks, and stripped the rings from their fingers without hesitation. It may be that they were just bragging to look great in the eyes of their masters. I hope so for heaven help them if they fall into the hands of the Confederates, if it is true. I could not record all the stories of wanton destruction that reached us. I would rather not believe that the Federal Government could be so disgraced by its own soldiers. Dr. Day says they left nothing at all in his house, and carried everything off from Dr. Enders's. He does not believe we have a single article left in ours. I hope they spared Miriam's piano. But they say the soldiers had so many that they offered them for sale at five dollars apiece. We heard that the town had been completely evacuated, and all had gone to New Orleans except three gunboats that were preparing to shell before leaving. This morning Withers's battery passed Mr. Elder's on their way to Port Hudson and stopped to get water. There were several buckets served by several servants, but I took possession of one to their great amusement. What a profusion of thanks over a can of water! It made me smile, and they smiled to see my work, so it was all very funny. It was astonishing to see the number of Yankee canteens in the possession of our men. Almost all those who fought at Baton Rouge are provided with them. In their canvas and wire cases, with neat stoppers, they are easily distinguished from our rough, flat, tin ones. I declare I felt ever so important in my new situation as waiting-maid. There is very little we would not do for our soldiers, though. There is mother, for instance, who got on her knees to bathe the face and hands of a fever-struck soldier of the Arkansas, while the girls held the plates of those who were too weak to hold them and eat at the same time. Blessed is the Confederate soldier who has even toothache when there are women near. What sympathies and remedies are volunteered? 
I always laugh, as I did then, when I think of the supposed wounded man those girls discovered on that memorable Arkansas day. I must first acknowledge that it was my fault, for seized with compassion for a man supported by two others who headed the procession, I cried, "'Oh, look, he is wounded!' "'Oh, poor fellow!' screamed the others, while tears and exclamations flowed abundantly, until one of the men, smiling humorously, cried out, "'Nothing the matter with him!' and on nearer view I perceived it was laziness, or perhaps something else, and was forced to laugh at the streaming eyes of those tender-hearted girls. August 24th, Sunday. Soon after dinner yesterday two soldiers stopped here and requested permission to remain all night. The word soldier was enough for us, and without even seeing them, Anna and I gladly surrendered our room, and said we would sleep in Mrs. Badger's instead. However, I had no curiosity to see the heroes, and remained up here reading, until the bell summoned me to supper, when I took my seat without looking at them, as no introduction was possible from their having refrained from giving their names. Presently I heard the words, that retreat from Norfolk was badly conducted. I looked up and saw before me a rather good-looking man, covered with the greatest profusion of gold cloth and buttons, for which I intuitively despised him. The impulse seized me, so I spoke. Were you there? No, but nearby. I was there with the first Louisiana for most a year. Do you know George Morgan? No, George. Yes, indeed. You are his sister. This was an assertion, but I bowed assent, and he went on. Thought so from the resemblance. I remember seeing you ten years ago when you were a very little girl. I used to be at your house with the boys. We were schoolmates. I remarked that I had no recollection of him. Of course not, he said, but did not inform me of his name. He talked very familiarly of the boys, and said he had met them all at Richmond. Next he astounded me by saying he was a citizen of Baton Rouge, though he had been almost four years in New York before the war broke out. He was going to town to look after the property, hearing his father had gone to France. An inhabitant of that city, who was so familiar with my brothers and me, and with whom I was not acquainted. Here was a riddle to solve. Let us see who among our acquaintances had gone to France. I could think of none. I made up my mind to find out his name if I had to ask it. All through supper he talked, and when in country style the gentleman left us at table, I found the curiosity of the others was even more excited than mine. I was determined to know who he was then. In the parlor he made some remark about never having been in ladies' society the whole time he was in Virginia. I expressed my surprise, as George often wrote of the pleasant young ladies he met everywhere. "'Oh, yes,' said Monsieur, "'but it is impossible to do your duty as an officer and be a ladies' man, so I devoted myself to my military profession exclusively.' "'Insufferable puppy,' I said to myself. Then he told me of how his father thought he was dead, and asked if I have heard of his rallying twenty men at Manassas, and charging a federal regiment which instantly broke. I honestly told him, no. Iago, the great boaster, I decided. Abruptly he said there were very few nice young ladies in Baton Rouge. Probably so in his circle, I thought, while I dryly remarked, indeed? "'Oh, yes,' and still more abruptly he said, "'Ain't you the youngest?' "'Yes, I thought so. I remember you when you were a wee thing, so high,' placing his hand at a most insultingly short distance from the floor. "'Really, I must ask your name,' I said. He hesitated a moment, and then said in a low tone, "'De J. "'De what?' I absurdly asked, thinking I was mistaken. A. De J. he repeated. I bowed slightly to express my satisfaction, said, Anna, we must retire. 
and with a good night to my newly discovered gentleman went upstairs. He is the one I heard George speak of last December when he was here, as having been court-martialed and shot, according to the universal belief in the army. That was the only time I had ever heard his name, though I was quite familiar with the cart of De J. Pear as it perambulated the streets. My first impressions are seldom erroneous. From the first I knew that man's respectability was derived from his buttons. That is why he took such pride in them, and contemplated them with such satisfaction. They lent him social backbone enough to converse so familiarly with me, without the effulgence of that splendid gold, which he hoped would dazzle my eye to his real position, he would have hardly dared to remember me when I was a wee thing so high. Is he the only man whose coat alone entitles him to respectability? He may be colonel for all I know, but still he is A. de J. to me. He talked brave enough to be a general. This morning I met him with a cordial, "'Good morning, Mr. De J. anxious to atone for several snubs I had given him long before I knew his name last night. You see, I could afford to be patronizing now. But the name probably, and the fluency with which I pronounced it, proved too much for him, and after, "'Good morning, Miss Morgan,' he did not venture a word. We knew each other then. His name was no longer a secret.' End of Book 3, Part 3。Book 3, Part 4 of A Confederate Girl's Diary。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson Book Three, Part Four, August twenty fifth to August thirtieth, eighteen sixty two. August twenty fifth, about twelve at night. Sleep is impossible after all that I have heard, so after vainly endeavoring to follow the example of the rest and sleep like a stoic, I have lighted my candle and take to this to induce drowsiness. Just after supper, when Anna and I were sitting with Mrs. Carter in her room, I talking as usual of home, and saying I would be perfectly happy if Mother would decide to remain in Baton Rouge and brave the occasional shellings, I heard a well-known voice take up some sentence of mine from a dark part of the room, and with a cry of surprise I was hugging Miriam until she was breathless. Such a forlorn creature, so dirty, tired, and fatigued as to be hardly recognizable. We thrust her into a chair and made her speak. She had just come with Charlie, who went after them yesterday, and had left mother and the servants at a kind friend's on the road. I never heard such a story as she told. I was heartsick, but I laughed until Mrs. Badger grew furious with me and the Yankees, and abused me for not abusing them. She says when she entered the house she burst into tears at the desolation. It was one scene of ruin. Libraries emptied, china smashed, sideboards split open with axes, three cedar chests cut open, plundered, and set up on end, all parlor ornaments carried off, even the alabaster Apollo and Diana that Hal valued so much. Her piano, dragged to the center of the parlor, had been abandoned as too heavy to carry off. Her desk lay open with all letters and notes well thumbed and scattered around, while Will's last letter to her was open on the floor with the Yankee stamp of dirty fingers. Mother's portrait, half cut from its frame, stood on the floor. Margaret, who was present at the sacking, told how she had saved fathers. It seems that those who wrought destruction in our house were all officers. One jumped on the sofa to cut the picture down. Miriam saw the prints of his muddy feet. When Margaret cried, "'For God's sake, gentlemen, let it be. I'll help you to anything here. He's dead, and the young ladies would rather see the house burn than lose it.' 
"'I'll blow your damned brains out,' was the gentleman's answer, as he put a pistol to her head, which a brother officer dashed away, and the picture was abandoned for finer sport. All the others were cut up in shreds. Upstairs was the finest fun. Mother's beautiful mahogany armoire, whose single door was an extremely fine mirror, was entered by crashing through the glass, when it was emptied of every article, and the shelves half split and half thrust back crooked. Letters, labelled by the boys, private, were strewn over the floor. They opened every armoire and drawer, collected every rag to be found, and littered the whole house with them, until the wonder was where so many rags had been found. Father's armoire was relieved of everything— Gibbs's handsome Damascus sword with the silver scabbard included. All his clothes, George's, Hal's, Jimmy's, were appropriated. They entered my room, broke that fine mirror for sport, pulled down the rods from the bed, and with them pulverized my toilet set, taking also all Lydia's china ornaments I had packed in the washstand. The debris filled my basin and ornamented my bed. My desk was broken open. Over it was spread all my letters and private papers, a diary I kept when I was twelve years old, and sundry tokens of dried roses, etc., which must have been very funny, they all being labelled with the donor's name and the occasion. Fool! How I writhe when I think of all they saw! The invitations to buggy rides, concerts, compliments of, etc., Lily's sewing machine had disappeared, but as mother's was too heavy to move, they merely smashed the needles. In the pillaging of the armoires, they seized a pink flounced muslin of Miriam's, which one officer placed on the end of a bayonet and paraded round with, followed by the others, who slashed it with their swords, crying, I have struck the damned secesh. That's the time I cut her, and continued their sport until the rags could no longer be pierced. One seized my bonnet, with which he decked himself, and ran in the streets. Indeed, all who found such rushed frantically around town by way of frolicking with the things on their heads. They say no frenzy could surpass it. Another snatched one of my calico dresses and a pair of vases that mother had when she was married and was about to decamp when a Mrs. Jones jerked them away and carried them to her boarding-house and returned them to mother the other day. Blessed be heaven, I have a calico dress. Our clothes were used for the vilest purposes and spread in every corner, at least those few that were not stolen. Aunt Barker's Charles tried his best to defend the property. "'Ain't you shamed to destroy all dis here that belongs to a poor widow lady who's got two daughters to support?' he asked of an officer who was foremost in the destruction. "'Poor! Damn them! I don't know when I have seen a house furnished like this. Look at that furniture!' They poor, was the retort, and thereupon the work went bravely on of making us poor indeed. It would have fared badly with us had we been there. The servants say they broke into the house crying, Where are those damned secesh women? We know they are hid in here, and we'll make them dance for hiding from federal officers. And they could not be convinced we were not there until they had searched the very garret. Wonder what they would have done. Charles caught a Captain Clark in the streets when the work was almost over, and begged him to put an end to it. The gentleman went readily, but though the devastation was quite evident, no one was to be seen, and he was about to leave, when, insisting that there was someone there, Charles drew him into my room, dived under the bed, and drew from thence a Yankee captain by one leg, followed by a lieutenant, each with a bundle of the boys' clothes, which they instantly dropped, protesting they were only looking around the house." The gentleman captain carried them off to their superior. Ours was the most shockingly treated house in the whole town. We have the misfortune to be equally feared by both sides because we will blackguard neither. 
so the Yankees selected the only house in town that sheltered three forlorn women to wreak their vengeance on. From far and near strangers and friends flocked in to see the ravages committed. Crowds rushed in before, crowds came in after Miriam and Mother arrived, all apologizing for the intrusion, but saying they had heard it was a sight never before seen. So they let them examine to their heart's content, and Miriam says the sympathy of all was extraordinary. A strange gentleman picked up a piece of Mother's mirror, which was as thick as his finger, saying, "'Madam, I should like to keep this as a memento. I am about to travel through Mississippi, and having seen what a splendid piece of furniture this was, and the state your house is left in, should like to show this as a specimen of Yankee vandalism.' William Waller flew to our home to try to save it, but it was too late. They say he burst into tears as he looked around. While on his kind errand, another band of Yankees burst into his house and left not one article of clothing to him, except the suit he had on. The whole talk is about our dreadful treatment at the Yankees' hands. Dr. Day and Dr. Enders, in spite of the assertions of the former, lost nothing." "'Well, I am beggared. "'Strange to say, I don't feel it. "'Perhaps it is the satisfaction of knowing my fate "'that makes me so cheerful that Mrs. Carter envied my stoicism, "'while Mrs. Badger felt like beating me "'because I did not agree that there was no such thing "'as a gentleman in the Yankee army. "'I know Major Drum, for one, "'and that Captain Clark must be two, "'and Mr. Biddle is three, and General Williams.' God bless him wherever he is, for he certainly acted like a Christian. The Yankees boasted loudly that if it had not been for him the work would have been done long ago. And now I am determined to see my home before Yankee shells complete the work that Yankee axes spared. So by sunrise I shall post over to Mr. Elder's and insist on Charlie taking me to town with him. I hardly think it is many hours off. I feel so settled, so calm, just as though I never meant to sleep again. If only I had a desk, a luxury I have not enjoyed since I left home, I could write for hours still without being sleepy, but this curved attitude is hard on my stiff back, so good night while I lie down to gain strength for a sight they say will make me faint with distress. Nous verrons. If I say I won't, I know I'll not cry. The Brunos lost nothing at all from their house, thank heaven for the mercy, only they lost all their money in their flight. On the door, on their return, they found written, Ladies, I have done my best for you, signed by a Yankee soldier, who they suppose to be the one who has made it a habit of continually passing their house. Forgot to say Miriam recovered my guitar from the asylum, our large trunk and father's papers, untouched, from Dr. Enders's, and with her piano, the two portraits, a few mattresses, all that is left of housekeeping affairs, and father's law books, carried them out of town. For which I say, in all humility, blessed be God, who has spared us so much." Thursday, August 28th. I am satisfied. I have seen my home again. Tuesday I was up at sunrise, and my few preparations were soon completed, and before anyone was awake I walked over to Mr. Elder's, through mud and dew, to meet Charlie. Fortunate was it for me that I started so early, for I found him hastily eating his breakfast and ready to leave. He was very much opposed to my going, and for some time I was afraid he would force me to remain, but at last he consented, perhaps because I did not insist, and with wet feet and without a particle of breakfast, I at length found myself in the buggy on the road home. The ride afforded me a series of surprises. Half the time I found myself halfway out of the little low-necked buggy when I thought I was safely in and the other half I was surprised to find myself really in when I thought I was wholly out, 
and so on for mile after mile over muddy roads, until we came to a most terrific crossroad, where we were obliged to pass, and which is best undescribed. Four miles from town we stopped at Mrs. Brown's to see Mother, and after a few moments' talk went on our road. I saw the first Yankee camp that Will Pinckney and Colonel Byrd had set fire to the day of the battle. Such a shocking sight of charred wood, burnt clothes, tents, and all imaginable articles strewn around I had never before seen. I should have been very much excited entering the town by the route our soldiers took, but I was not. It all seemed tame and familiar. I could hardly fancy I stood on the very spot where the severest struggle had taken place. The next turn of the road brought us to two graves, one on each side of the road, the resting place of two who fell that day. They were merely left in the ditch where they fell, and earth from the side was pulled over them. When Miriam passed, parts of their coats were sticking out of the grave, but some kind hand had scattered fresh earth over them when I saw them. Beyond, the sight became more common. I was told that their hands and feet were visible from many. And one poor fellow lay unburied just as he had fallen, with his horse across him, and both skeletons. That side I was spared, as the road near which he was lying was blocked up by trees, so we were forced to go through the woods to enter, instead of passing by, the Catholic graveyard. In the woods we passed another camp our men destroyed, while the torn branches above testified to the number of shells our men had braved to do the work. Next to Mr. Barbie's were the remains of a third camp that was burned, and a few more steps made me suddenly hold my breath, for just before us lay a dead horse with all the flesh still hanging, which was hardly endurable. Close by lay a skeleton, whether of man or horse I did not wait to see. Not a human being appeared until we reached the penitentiary, which was occupied by our men. After that I saw crowds of wagons moving furniture out, but not a creature that I knew. Just back of our house was all that remained of a nice brick cottage, namely four crumbling walls. The offense was that the husband was fighting for the Confederates, so the wife was made to suffer and is now homeless, like many thousands besides. It really seems as though God wanted to spare our homes. The frame dwellings adjoining were not touched even. The town was hardly recognizable, and required some skill to avoid the corners blocked up by trees, so as to get in at all. Our house could not be reached by the front, so we left the buggy in the back yard, and running through the lot without stopping to examine the storeroom and servants' rooms that opened wide, I went through the alley and entered by the front door. Fortunate was it for this record that I undertook to describe the sacking only from Miriam's account. If I had waited until now it would never have been mentioned, for as I looked around, to attempt such a thing seemed absurd. I stood in the parlour in silent amazement, and in answer to Charlie's, Well? I could only laugh. It was so hard to realise. As I looked for each well-known article, I could hardly believe that Abraham Lincoln's officers had really come so low down as to steal in such a wholesale manner. The papier-mâché work-box Miriam had given me was gone. The baby sack I was crocheting, with all knitting needles and wools, gone also. Of all the beautiful engravings of Annapolis that Will Pinckney had sent me, there remained a single one— "'Gentlemen, my name is written on each. "'Not a book remained in the parlour except Idols of the King, "'which contained my name also, "'and which, together with the door-plate, "'was the only case in which the name of Morgan was spared. "'They must have thought we were related to John Morgan, "'and wreaked their vengeance on us for that reason. "'Thanks for the honour, but there is not the slightest connection.' Where they did not carry off articles bearing our name, they cut it off, as in the visiting cards, and left only the first name. Every book of any value or interest, except Hume and Gibbon, was borrowed permanently. 
I regretted Macaulay more than all the rest. Brother's splendid French histories went, too, all except L'Histoire de la Bastille. However, as they spared Father's law libraries, all except one volume they used to support a flour barrel with while they emptied it near the parlor door, we ought to be thankful. The dining room was very funny. I looked around for the cut glass celery and preserve dishes that were to be part of my dough, as Mother always said, together with the champagne glasses that had figured on the table the day that I was born, but there remained nothing. There was plenty of split-up furniture, though. I stood in Mother's room before the shattered armoire, which I could hardly believe the same that I had smoothed my hair before, as I left home three weeks previously. Father's was split across and the lock torn off, and in the place of the hundreds of articles it contained I saw two bonnets, at the sight of which I actually sat down to laugh. One was Mother's velvet, which looked very much like a football in its present condition. Mine was not to be found, as the officers forgot to return it. Wonder who has my imperial. I know they never saw a handsomer one, with its black velvet, purple silk, and ostrich feathers. I went to my room. Gone was my small paradise. Had this shocking place ever been habitable? The tall mirror squinted at me from a thousand broken angles. It looked so knowing. I tried to fancy the Yankee officers being dragged from under my bed by the leg, thanks to Charles, but it seemed too absurd, so I let them alone. My desk! What a sight! The central part I had kept as a little curiosity shop with all my little trinkets and keepsakes, of which a large proportion were from my gentlemen friends. I looked for all I had left, found only a piece of the Macrae, which, as it was labelled in full, I was surprised they had spared. Precious letters I found under heaps of broken china and rags. All my notes were gone with many letters. I looked for a letter of poor blank, in cipher, with the key attached, and the name signed in plain hand. I knew it would hardly be agreeable to him to have it read, and it certainly would be unpleasant to me to have it published, but I could not find it. Miriam thinks she saw something answering the description somewhere, though. Bah! What is the use of describing such a scene? Many suffered along with us, though none so severely. Indeed, the Yankees cursed loudly at those who did not leave anything worth stealing— they cannot complain of us on that score. All our handsome Brussels carpets, together with Lydia's fur, were taken, too. What did they not take? In the garret, in its darkest corner, a whole gilt-edged china set of Lydia's had been overlooked. So I set to work and packed it up, while Charlie packed her furniture in a wagon to send to her father. It was now three o'clock, and with my light linen dress thrown off, I was standing over a barrel putting in cups and saucers as fast as I could wrap them in the rags that covered the floor, when Mr. Larguier sent me a nice little dinner. I had been so many hours without eating, nineteen, I think, during three of which I had slept, that I had lost all appetite, but nevertheless I ate it to show my appreciation. If I should hereafter think that the quantity of rags was exaggerated, let me here state that after I had packed the barrel and china with them, it made no perceptible diminution of the pile. As soon as I had finished my task, Charlie was ready to leave again, so I left town without seeing or hearing any one or anything except what lay in my path. As we drove out of the gate, I begged Charlie to let me get my bird, as I heard Charles Barker had him. A man was dispatched, and in a few minutes returned with my Jimmy. I have since heard that Tish deserted him the day of the battle, as I so much feared she would, and that Charles found him late in the evening and took charge of him. 
With my pet once more with me, we drove off again. I cast many a longing look at the graveyard, but knowing Charlie did not want to stop, I said nothing, though I had been there but once in three months, and that once six weeks ago. I could see where the fence had been thrown down by our soldiers as they charged the Federals, but it was now replaced, though many a picket was gone. Once more I stopped at Mrs. Brown's while Charlie went on to Clinton, leaving me to drive Mother here in the morning. Early yesterday, after seeing Miriam's piano and the mattresses packed up and on the road, we started off in the buggy, and after a tedious ride through a melting sun, arrived here about three o'clock, having again missed my dinner, which I kept a profound secret until supper-time. By next Ash Wednesday I will have learned how to fast without getting sick. Though very tired, I sat sewing until after sunset, dictating a page and a half to Anna, who was writing to Howell. August twenty ninth, Clinton, Louisiana. Noah's duck has found another resting place. Yesterday I was interrupted while writing to pack up for another move, it being impossible to find a boarding house in the neighborhood. We heard of some about here, and Charlie had engaged a house for his family where the servants were already settled, so I hurried off to my task. No easy one either, considering the heat and length of time allowed. This time I ate dinner as I packed again. About four, finding Miriam did not come to Mr. Elder's as she promised, I started over to General Carter's with her clothes, and found her just getting into the buggy to ride over, as I arrived, warm, tired, hardly able to stand. After taking her over, the General sent the buggy back for Mrs. Carter and myself, and soon we were all assembled waiting for the cars. At last, determining to wait for them near the track, we set off again, General Carter driving me in his buggy. I love General Carter. Again, after so many kind invitations, he told me he was sorry we would not remain with him. If we were content, he would be only too happy to have us with him, and spoke so kindly that I felt as though I had a Yankee ball in my throat. I was disposed to be melancholy anyway. I could not say many words without choking. I was going from the kindest of friends to a country where I had none at all, so could not feel very gay. As we reached the track, the cars came shrieking along. There was a pause, a scuffle, during which the general placed me and my bird in a seat, while Lily, Charlie, Miriam, Mother, five children, and two servants, with all the baggage, were thrown aboard some way, when with a shriek and a jerk we were off again, without a chance of saying good-bye even. I enjoyed that ride. It had but one fault, and that was that it came to an end. I would have wished it to spin along until the war was over, or we in a settled home. But it ended at last, to Jimmy's great relief, for he was too frightened to move even, and only ventured a timid chirp if the car stopped, as if to ask, Is it over? Nothing occurred of any interest except once a little boy sent us slightly off the track by meddling with the brakes. Landed at sunset, it is hard to fancy a more forlorn crew while waiting at the depot to get the baggage off before coming to the house. We burst out laughing as we looked at each lengthened face. Such a procession through the straggling village has hardly been seen before. How we laughed at our forlorn plight as we trudged through the hilly streets, they have no pavements here, looking like emigrants from the old country as we have watched them in New Orleans. At the house we found Tish laid up. The loaded wagon with its baggage, four mules, three grown servants, and four children was precipitated from a bridge twenty-five feet high by the breaking of the before-mentioned causeway and landed with the whole concern in deep water below. Wonderful to relate, not a life was lost. The mattress on which the negroes remained seated floated them off into shallow water. The only one hurt was Tish, who had her leg severely sprained. The baggage was afterwards fished out, rather wet. 
In the mud next morning, it happened late at night, Dophy found a tiny fancy bottle that she had secreted from the Yankees, a present from Clemmy Lusenberg it was, and one of two things left in my curiosity shop by the Yankees. After seeing everything in, we started off for the hotel, where we arrived after dark, rather tired, I think, not a comfortable house either, unless you call a bare, unfurnished, dirty room without shutter or anything else comfortable, particularly when you are to sleep on the floor with four children and three grown people and a servant. After breakfast we came here until we can find a place to settle in, which Mr. Marsden has promised to attend to for us. It is rather rough housekeeping yet, but Lily has not yet got settled. Our dinner was rather primitive. There was a knife and fork to carve the meat, and then it was finished with spoons. I sat on the floor with my plate and a piece of cornbread, flour not to be bought at any price, and ate with my fingers, a new experience. I found that water can be drunk out of a cup. Oof! I am tired. August 30th still no prospect of a lodging so here we remain i never before lived in a house without a balcony and have only now found out how inconvenient it is the whole establishment consists of two rooms on each side of a passage as wide as the front door and as it has a very low ceiling with no opening and no shade near it is decidedly the warmest spot i ever inhabited we all sleep on the floor and keep our clothes in our trunks, except Lily, who has an armoire without doors. Knives and forks for dinner to-day, though the table still consists of a single plank. The house really has a suffocating effect on me. There is such a close look about it. The front is fully a foot below the level of the street, while quite a flight of steps leads from the back door to the yard. In fact, the whole town consists of abrupt little mounds. It is rather a pretty place, but heaven save me from the misery of living in it. Miriam is crazy to remain, even advocates that dirty, bare, shutterless boarding-house where we passed the first night, from what attraction I cannot imagine. I am just as anxious to get into the country. I would hate the dull round of this little place. I prefer solitude where I can do as I please without being observed. Here we are as well known by people we never before heard of as though we were fellow citizens. End of Book Three, Part Four Book Three, Part Five of A Confederate Girl's Diary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Three, Part Five, September First to September Tenth, eighteen sixty two. September 1st, Monday. I woke up this morning, and to my great surprise find that summer has already passed away, and that we have already entered the first month of fall. Where has the summer gone to? Since the taking of Fort Jackson the days have gone by like a dream. I had hardly realized spring, when now I find it is autumn. I am content to let the time fly, though, as every day brings us nearer peace, or something else. How shockingly I write! Will I ever again have a desk or a table to write on? At present my seat is a mattress and my knee my desk, and that is about the only one I have had since the 2nd of August. This is the dreariest day I have seen for some time. Outside it has been raining since daybreak, and inside no one feels especially bright or cheerful. I sometimes wish Mother would carry out her threat and brave the occasional shellings at Baton Rouge. I would dare anything to be at home again. I know that the Yankees have left us little besides the bare house, but I would be grateful for the mere shelter of the roof. 
I often fancy how we will miss little articles that we thought necessary to our comfort before, when we return. And the shoes I paid five dollars for and wore a single time? I am wishing I had them, now that I am almost barefooted and cannot find a pair in the whole country. Would it not be curious if one of these days while travelling in the north, if I ever travel again, I should find some well-loved object figuring in a strange house as a trophy of the Battle of Baton Rouge? I should have to seek for them in some very low house, perhaps. Respectable people had very little to do with such disgraceful work, I fancy." Suppose I should see Father's cigar stand, for instance, or Miriam's little statues. I wonder if the people would have the conscience to offer to return them. A young lady, passing by one of the pillaged houses, expressed her surprise at seeing an armoire full of women's and children's clothes being emptied, and the contents tied up in sheets. What can you do with such things? she asked a soldier who seemed more zealous than the rest. "'Ain't I got a wife and four children in the North?' was the answer. "'So we, who have hardly clothes enough for our own use, are stripped to supply Northerners. "'One would think that I had no theme save the wreck of our house if they read this. "'But I take it all out in here. "'I believe I must be made of wood or some other tough material not to feel it more.' I sometimes ask myself if it is because I did not care for home that I take it so quietly now, but I know that is not it. I was wild about it before I knew what had happened. Since I learned all, few are the words that have escaped my lips concerning it. Perhaps it is because I have the satisfaction of knowing what all women crave for, the worst." Indeed, it is a consolation in such days as these when truth concerning either side is difficult to discover. The certainty of anything, fortune or misfortune, is comfort to me. I really feel sorry for the others who suffered, but it does not strike me that sympathy is necessary in our case. Mrs. Flynn came to Lily's room when she heard of it, well prepared for sympathy, with a large handkerchief and a profusion of tears, when she was horrified to find both her and Miriam laughing over the latter's description of some comical scene that met her sight in one of the rooms. Seems to me that tears on all occasions come in as the fortieth article to the articles of belief of some people. September 3rd Political news it would be absurd to record, for our information is more than limited, being frequently represented by a blank. Of the thirteen battles that Gibbs has fought in, I know the names of four only, Bull Run, Stone Bridge, Port Republic, and Cedar Run. Think of all I have yet to hear. Today comes the news of another grand affair, the defeat of McClellan, Pope, and Burnside combined if I dared believe it. But accounts are too meagre as yet. Both Gibbs and George were in it if there was a fight, and perhaps Jimmy too. Well, I must wait in patience. We have lost so much already that God will surely spare those three to us. Oh, if they come again, if we can meet once more, what will the troubles of the last six months signify? if I dared hope that next summer would bring us peace. I always prophesy it is just six months off, but do I believe it? Indeed, I don't know what will become of us if it is delayed much longer. If we could only get home, it would be another thing. But boarding, how long will mother's two hundred and fifty last? And that is all the money she has." As to the claims amounting to a small fortune, she might as well burn them. They will never be paid. But if we get home, what will we do for bedding? The Yankees did not leave us a single comfort, and only two old bars and a pair of ragged sheets, which articles are not to be replaced at any price in the Confederacy, so we must go without. How glad I am that we gave all our blankets to our soldiers last summer, so much saved from the Yankees. Poor Lavinia! She fancies us comfortably settled at home. 
I dare say she spends all her time in picturing to herself what we may be doing, and recalling each piece of furniture the rooms contained. Wonder if she would not be shocked if the real scene were suddenly revealed to her, and she should see the desolated house, and see us fugitives in a strange town. Wonder how the cry of, "'Where are those three damned secesh women?' would have struck her, had she heard the strange oaths and seen the eager search which followed. I dare say it would have frightened her more than it did me when I was told of it. William Waller says it is God's mercy that we had escaped already, for we certainly would have suffered. I hardly think we could have been harmed, though, and shall always regret that we did not return immediately after the battle. It took them from that day to the evacuation to finish the work, and I rather think that our presence would have protected the house. Our servants they kindly made free, and told them they must follow them, the officers. Margaret was boasting the other day of her answer. I don't want to be any freer than I is now. I'll stay with my mistress. When Tish shrewdly remarked, Pshaw, don't you know that if I had gone you'd have followed me? The conduct of our servants is beyond praise. Five thousand negroes followed their Yankee brothers from the town and neighborhood, but ours remained. During the fight, or flight rather, a fleeing officer stopped to throw a musket in Charles Barker's hands and bade him fight for his liberty. Charles drew himself up, saying, I am only a slave, but I am a secesh nigger, and won't fight in such a d crew. Exit Yankee, continuing his flight down to the riverside. September 4th. I hear to-day that the Brunos have returned to Baton Rouge, determined to await the grand finale there. They and two other families alone remain. With these exceptions, and a few Dutch and Irish who cannot leave, the town is perfectly deserted by all except the Confederate soldiers. I wish I was with them. If all chance of finding lodgings here is lost, and Mother remains with Lily, as she sometimes seems more than half inclined, and Miriam goes to Linwood, as she frequently threatens, I believe I will take a notion, too, and go to Mrs. Bruno. I would rather be there in all the uncertainty, expecting to be shelled or burnt out every hour, than here. Oof! what a country! Next time I go shopping I mean to ask some clerk, out of curiosity, what they do sell in Clinton. The following is a list of a few of the articles that shopkeepers actually laugh at you if you ask for. Glasses, flour, soap, starch, coffee, candles, matches, shoes, combs, guitar strings, bird seed, in short everything that I have heretofore considered as necessary to existence. If any one had told me I could have lived off of cornbread a few months ago, I would have been incredulous. Now I believe it, and return an inward grace for the blessing at every mouthful. I have not tasted a piece of wheat bread since I left home, and shall hardly taste it again until the war is over. I do not like this small burg. It is very straggling and pretty, but I would rather not inhabit it. We are as well known here as though we carried our cards on our faces, and it is peculiarly disagreeable to me to overhear myself spoken about by people I don't know, as, "'There goes Miss Morgan,' as that young man, for instance, remarked this morning to a crowd just as I passed. It is not polite, to say the least. Will Carter was here this morning and told me he saw Theodore Pinckney in the streets. I suppose he is on his way home, and think he will be a little disappointed in not finding us at Linwood as he expects, and still more so to hear he passed through the very town where we were staying without knowing it. Beech Grove, September 6th, Saturday. Another perch for Noah's duck. Where will I be in a week or two from this? I shall make a mark twenty pages from here, and see where I shall be when I reach it. Here, most probably. But, oh, if I could then be at home! 
General Carter, who spent the evening with us day before yesterday, remarked that the first thing he heard as he reached town was that all the gentlemen and ladies of Clinton were hunting for country lodgings for us. It was pretty much the case. The general was as kind as ever, bless his gray head, and made us promise to go back to Linwood with him when he passes back next week. This is the way we keep the promise, coming out here. Early yesterday morning we received a note from Eliza Haynes, one of our indefatigable agents, saying her grandmother, Mrs. McKay, had consented to receive us and would come for us in the evening. Immediately my packing task was begun, but imagine my disappointment, just as I finished one trunk, to hear Mother announce her determination to let us go alone while she remained with Lily. Prayers, entreaties, tears, arguments, all failed, and we were forced to submit. So with a heart fuller than I can express, I repacked the trunk with Miriam's and my clothing and got ready to depart. In the evening the carriage drove up to the door with Eliza and her grandmother, and with a hasty and rather choky good-bye to Lily and Mother we were hurried in, and in another moment were off. I fancied the house would be north of Clinton, so of course the horses took the road south. Then I decided on a white cottage on the left of the road, and about two miles out found that it was to the right, not painted, and no cottage at all, but a nondescript building besides. "'Twas ever thus from childhood's hour. When did I ever fancy anything exactly as it was? But the appearance does not affect the house, which is really very comfortable, though apparently unfinished.' The same objection might be made to it that I made to Mrs. Moore's, for there is not a shutter on the place. But fine shade-trees take their place, and here I do not feel the want of them so much, as our room is in the back of the house to the west, where the rising sun cannot salute my nose as it did at Mrs. Moore's. As to what effect the setting sun has, I must wait for the evening to decide, though I always enjoy that. At Greenwell we used to walk a mile away from home to see the sunset in an open field. I find Mrs. McKay an excellent plain old lady, with neither airs nor pretensions, and very kind-hearted. Here she lives alone, with the exception of an orphan girl called Jane, whose position, half menial, half equal, it would be hard to define. Poor girl! The name of orphan alone was enough to make me sorry for her. She must be Friday's child, she is so ready and willing. Eliza, who it seems stays a great deal with her grandmother, is one of the brightest little girls I have seen for a long while. She sings and plays on the piano with a style and assurance that I can only mutely covet. Why cannot I have the confidence I see all others possess? She took me to the gin-house last evening, though I could not see much, as it was almost sunset when we arrived. An early tea and singing and music after completed our evening, and then we were shown to our room. Mrs. McKay has only a room for us, too, so it is fortunate that Mother would not come. She says she wants us to spend a few days with her to see if we like it, or if we will be willing to be separated from Mother. In the meantime, we can look around for lodgings in a larger and more comfortable place where we can be together. She tells such stories about the house Lily lives in, of its age and unhealthiness, that I am frightened about Mother. She says she will die if she stays there this month. Miriam and Eliza have gone to town to see them, and are then going to Mrs. George's to see if she can accommodate us. I wanted to have a splendid dream last night, but failed. It was pleasant, though, to dream of welcoming George and Gibbs back. Jimmy I could not see, and George was in deep mourning. I dreamed of fainting when I saw him, a novel sensation since I never experienced it awake. But I speedily came to and insisted on his pulling Henry Walsh's red hair for his insolence, which he promised to do instantly. How absurd! Dreams, dreams! 
that pathetic miss sarah do you ever dream comes vividly back to me sometimes dream don't i not the dreams that he meant but royal purple dreams that de quincey could not purchase with his opium dreams that i would not forego for all the inducements that could be offered i go to sleep and pay a visit to heaven or fairyland i have white wings and with another float in rosy clouds and look down on the moving world or i have the power to raise myself in the air without wings and silently float wherever i will loving all things and feeling that god loves me i have heard paul preach to the people while i stood on a fearful rock above i have been to strange lands and great cities i have talked with people i have never beheld charlotte bronte has spent a week with me in my dreams and together we have talked of her sad life shakespeare and i have discussed his works seated tete-a-tete over a small table he pointed out the character of each of his heroines explaining what i could not understand when awake and closed the lecture with you have the tenderest heart i have ever read or sung of which compliment considering it as original with him rather than myself waked me up with surprise clinton september ninth tuesday back again for how long i know not At sunset Saturday, Eliza and Miriam returned to Mrs. McKay with Nanny Davidson. Mother had proved obdurate and refused to leave Clinton, so they had all gone on and spent the day with Mrs. Haynes instead of going to Mrs. George's. After my quiet, solitary day, I was glad to see them again, particularly as they brought confirmation of the great victory in Virginia. It is said the enemy were cut off from Washington, and that we were pursuing them. Oh, my brothers, if God will only spare them! I envy Lydia, who is so near them, and knows all, and can take care of them if they are hurt. It will be several days at least before we can hear from them, if we hear at all. For Jimmy has never yet written a line, and George has written but once since the taking of the forts, and that was before the Battle of Chickahominy. We can only wait patiently. Perhaps General Carter will bring us news. Mrs. Haynes sent a very pressing invitation for us to spend the next day with her, so although it was Sunday we went. I am becoming dreadfully irreligious. I have not been to church since Mr. Gearlow went to Europe last July. It is perfectly shocking. But the Yankees have kept me running until all pious dispositions have been shaken out of me, so they are to blame. Like heathens, we called on Miss Comstock as we passed through town and spent an hour with her. Landed at Mr. Haynes's, we had ample time to look around before he and his wife got back from church. Here again I found what seems to be the prevailing style of the country. Widespread doors and windows, with neither blinds nor shade trees to keep off the glare of the sun. The dining room was a wide hall where the rising sun shone in your face at breakfast, and at dinner, being directly overhead, seemed to shine in at both ends at once. A splendid arrangement for a fire-worshipper, but I happened to be born in America instead of Persia, so fail to appreciate it. September 10th. Yesterday I was interrupted to undertake a very important task. The evening before, Mother and Lily happened to be in a store where two officers were buying materials for making shirts, and volunteered to make them for them, which offer they gladly accepted, though neither party knew the other. They saw that they were friends of Charlie, so had no scruples about offering their services. The gentlemen saw that they were ladies, and very kind ones besides, so made no difficulty about accepting. Lily undertook one of purple merino, and I took a dark blue one. Miriam nominally helped her, but her very sore finger did not allow her to do much. Mother slightly assisted me, but I think Lily and I had the best of the task. 
All day we worked, and when evening came, continued sewing by the light of these miserable homemade candles. Even then we could not finish, but had to get up early this morning, as the gentlemen were to leave for Port Hudson at nine o'clock. We finished in good time, and their appearance recompensed us for our trouble. Lily's was trimmed with folds of blue from mine around collar, cuffs, pockets, and down the front band, while mine was pronounced a chef d'oeuvre trimmed with bias folds of tiny red and black plaid. With their fresh colors and shining pearl buttons, they were really very pretty. We sent word that we would be happy to make as many as they chose for themselves or their friends, and the eldest, with many fears that it was an imposition and we were too good, and much more of the same kind, left another one with Charlie for us. We cannot do too much, or even enough, for our soldiers. I believe that is the universal sentiment of the women of the South. Well, but how did we get back here? I hardly know. It seems to me we are being swayed by some kind of destiny which impels us here or there, with neither rhyme nor reason, and whether we will or no. Such homeless, aimless, purposeless, wandering individuals are rarely seen. From one hour to another we do not know what is to become of us. We talk vaguely of going home when the Yankees go away. When will that be? One day there is not a boat in sight. The next two or three stand off from shore to see what is being done, ready at the first sight of warlike preparation to burn the town down. It is particularly unsafe since the news from Virginia, when the gunboats started from Bayou Gula, shelling the coast at random and destroying everything that was within reach, report says. Of course we cannot return to our homes when commissioned officers are playing the part of pirates, burning, plundering, and destroying at will, with neither law nor reason. Donaldsonville they burned before I left Baton Rouge, because some fool fired a shotgun at a gunboat some miles above. Bayou Sarah they burned while we were at General Carter's for some equally reasonable excuse. The fate of Baton Rouge hangs on a still more slender thread. I would give worlds if it were all over. At Mrs. Haynes's we remained all night, as she sent the carriage back without consulting us. Monday we came to town and spent the day with Lily. How it was, I can't say, but we came to the conclusion that it was best to quit our then residence and either go back to Linwood or to a Mrs. Somebody who offered to take us as boarders. We went back to Mrs. McKay's to tell her of our determination and in the morning took leave of her and came back home. We hear so much news, piece by piece, that one would imagine some definite result would follow and bring us peace before long. The Virginia news, after being so great and cheering, has suddenly ceased to come. No one knows the final result. The last report was that we held Arlington Heights. Why not Washington, consequently? Cincinnati, at last accounts, lay at our mercy— from Covington, Kirby Smith had sent over a demand for its surrender in two hours. Would it not be glorious to avenge New Orleans by such a blow? But since last night the telegraph is silent. News has just come of some nice little affair between our militia in Opelousas and the Yankees from New Orleans, in which we gave them a good thrashing besides capturing arms, prisoners, and ammunition. It never rains, but it pours, is George's favorite proverb. With it comes the rumor that the Yankees are preparing to evacuate the city. If it could be! Oh, if God would only send them back to their own country and leave ours in peace! I wish them no greater punishment than that they may be returned to their own homes with the disgrace of their outrages here ever before their eyes. That would kill an honest man, I am sure. End of Book Three, Part Five. Book Three, Part Six of A Confederate Girl's Diary. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Confederate Girl's Diary by Sarah Morgan Dawson. Book Three, Part Six, September Fourteenth to September Twenty Fourth, eighteen sixty two. Sunday, September Fourteenth, eighteen sixty two. I have been so busy making Lieutenant Bourges's shirt that I have not had time to write, besides having very little to write about. So my industry saved my paper and spared these pages a vast amount of trash. I would not let anyone touch Lieutenant Bourges's shirt except myself, and last evening, when I held it up completed, the loud praises it received satisfied me it would answer. Miriam and Miss Ripley declared it the prettiest ever made. It is dark purple merino, the bosom I tucked with pleats a quarter of an inch deep all the way up to the collar, and stitched a narrow crimson silk braid up the center to hold it in its place. Around the collar, cuffs, pockets, and band down the front, the red cord runs, forming a charming contrast to the dark foundation. Indeed, I devoted the sole article the Yankees let fall from my two work boxes, a bunch of soutache, to the work. Large white pearl buttons completed the description, and my shirt is really as quiet, subdued, and pretty a one as I ever saw. I should first hear the opinion of the owner, though. If he does not agree with all the others, I shall say he has no taste. I got a long, sweet letter from Sophie on Friday that made me happy for the whole day. They were about leaving for Alexandria. I was glad to hear they would be out of danger, but still I was sorry they were going so far away. I have been laying a hundred wild schemes to reach Baton Rouge and spend a day or two with them, which is impossible now. Sophie writes just as she talks, and that means remarkably well, so I can at least have the pleasure of corresponding. At Dr. Carnell's they will be out of the reach of all harm and danger, so I ought to rejoice. There is one thing in which Sophie and I agree, and that is in making Stonewall Jackson our hero talk of Beauregard, he never had my adoration, but Stonewall is the greatest man of the age, decidedly. Still no authentic reports of the late battles in Virginia. I say late, referring to those fought two weeks ago. From the Federal accounts, glowing as they usually are, I should gather the idea that their rout was complete. I cannot imagine why we can hear nothing more from our own side." I think my first act on my return home will be to take a cup of coffee and a piece of bread, two luxuries of which I have been deprived for a long while. Miriam vows to devour an unheard-of number of biscuits, too. How many articles we considered as absolutely necessary before have we now been obliged to dispense with? Nine months of the year I reveled in ice, thought it impossible to drink water without it. Since last November I have tasted it but once, and that once by accident, and, oh yes, I caught some hailstones one day at Linwood. Ice cream, lemonade, and sponge cake was my chief diet. It was a year last July since I tasted the two first, and one since I have seen the last. Bread I believed necessary to life, vegetables senseless. The former I never see, and I have been forced into cultivating at least a toleration of the latter. Snap beans I can actually swallow, sweet potatoes I really like, and one day at Dr. Nolan's I bolted a mouthful of tomatoes, and afterwards kept my seat with the heroism of a martyr. These are the minor trials of war. If that were all— if coarse, distasteful food were the only inconvenience. When I think of what Lavinia must suffer so far from us, and in such ignorance of our condition, our trials seem nothing in comparison to hers, and think how uneasy brother must be hearing of the battle, and not knowing where we fled to, for he has not heard from us for almost two months. 
In return we are uneasy about him and sister. If New Orleans is attacked, what will become of them with all those children? Tuesday, September 16th. Yesterday Miriam determined to go to Linwood, and consequently I had a severe task of trunk-packing, one of my greatest delights, however. I hate to see anyone pack loosely or in a slovenly manner. Perhaps that is the reason I never let anyone do it if I am able to stand. This morning was appointed as our day for leaving, but I persuaded her to wait until to-morrow, in hope that either the general or news from Virginia would arrive this evening. Bless this village! It is the meanest place for news that I ever was in. Not a word can be gathered except what is false or unfounded, and they are even tired of that in the last few days. Talk of Baton Rouge turning Yankee, as the report went here. Of the three or four there who took the oath, not one can be compared to some loyal citizens of this small burg. Why, I talked to two gentlemen yesterday who, if it were not for the disgrace and danger incurred by bearing the name, I should style union men, and talked, or rather listened to them, until my spirits were reduced to the lowest ebb. People were shocked at our daring to believe there lived gentlemen and Christians in the North, I mean those wild fanatics who could only take in one idea at a time, and rarely divested their brains of that one to make room for a newer one, were shocked at our belief. But if they could converse with a few here that I could point out, our gnat of common sense would be swallowed by this behemoth of heterodoxy. This morning Mrs. Barr, Miss Bernard, and a Miss Mudd came to town and surprised us by a most unexpected visit. They spent the day with us and have just now driven off on their return home through this drizzly, misting evening. A while ago a large cavalry company passed at the corner on their way from Port Hudson to Camp Moor, the report is. They raised their hats to us, seeing us at the gate, and we waved our handkerchiefs in return, each with a silent God bless you, I am sure. As though to prove my charge unjust, news comes pouring in. Note we a few items to see how many will prove false. First, we have taken Baltimore without firing a gun. Maryland has risen en masse to join our troops. Longstreet and Lee are marching on Washington from the rear. The Louisiana troops are ordered home to defend their own state, thank God, if it will only bring the boys back. Then comes tidings of nine gunboats at Baton Rouge, Ponchatoula on the railroad taken by Yankees, Camp Moore and three batteries ditto. Not so cheering." If that is so, Clinton lies within reach, being thirty-five miles off. Leaving much of the most valuable portion of our clothing here, the Yankees will probably appropriate what little they spared us, and leave us fairly destitute, for we take only summer clothes to Linwood. I have plenty of underclothes, but the other day when I unpacked the large trunk from Dr. Enders's, I found I had just two dresses for winter— a handsome blue silk I bought just two years ago last spring, and one heavy blue merino that does not fit me. What an outfit for winter! Miriam has two poplins and a black silk, and mother a wine-colored merino only. But each of us is blessed with a warm cloak and are correspondingly grateful. I was confident I had saved my green, dark blue, and brown silk dresses, but the Yankees saved them instead for me, or their suffering sweethearts, rather. On the other hand, taking so many necessary articles to Linwood, the risk of losing them is the same. An attack on Port Hudson is apprehended, and if it falls, General Carter's house will be decidedly unsafe from Yankee vengeance. The probability is that it will burn, as they have been daily expecting ever since the Yankees occupied Baton Rouge. The risk seems equal either way. Go or stay, the danger seems the same. Shall we go, then, for variety, or die here of stagnation while waiting for the Yankees to make up their minds? 
I would rather be at neither place just now. In fact, I could hardly name the place I should like to be in now unless it were Europe or the Sandwich Islands. But I love Linwood and its dear inhabitants, and under other circumstances should be only too happy to be there. I was regretting the other day that our life was now so monotonous, almost longed for the daily alarms we had when under Yankee rule in Baton Rouge. Stirring times are probably ahead. Linwood, September 17th, Wednesday. Still floating about. This morning after breakfast General Carter made his appearance, and in answer to his question as to whether we were ready to leave with him, Miriam replied, Yes, indeed, heartily, glad to get away from Clinton, where I have detained her ever since the day Theodore returned home, to her great disgust. As our trunk was already packed, it did not take many minutes to get ready, and in a little while, with a protracted good-bye, we were on our way to the depot, which we reached some time before the cars started. Though glad to leave Clinton, I was sorry to part with Mother. For ten days she has been unable to walk, with a sore on her leg below the knee, and I want to believe she will miss me while I am away. I could not leave my bird in that close, ill-ventilated house. He has never sung since I recovered him, and I attribute his ill health or low spirits to that unhealthy place, and thought Linwood might be beneficial to him too, so brought him with me to see what effect a breath of pure air might have. We were the only ladies on the cars except Mrs. Brown, who got off halfway, but in spite of that had a very pleasant ride, as we had very agreeable company. The train only stopped thirteen times in the twenty miles, five times to clear the brushwood from the telegraph lines, once running back a mile to pick up a passenger, and so on, to the great indignation of many of the passengers aboard, who would occasionally cry out, "'Hello, if this is the clearing-up train, we had better send for a hand-car. What the devil's the matter now?' Until the general gravely assured them that it was an old habit of this very accommodating train, which in summer time stopped whenever the passengers wished to pick blackberries on the road. Many soldiers were aboard on their way to Port Hudson to rejoin their companies. One gallant one offered me a drink of water from his canteen, which I accepted out of mere curiosity to see what water from such a source tasted of. To my great surprise I found it tasted just like any other. The general introduced a Mr. Crawford to us, who took the seat next to me, as the one next to Miriam was already occupied, and proved a very pleasant and talkative compagnon de voyage. General Carter's query as to my industry since he had seen me brought my acknowledgment of having made two shirts, one of which I sent yesterday. Who, too, was the next question? I gave the name, adding that I did not know the gentleman, and he was under the impression that it was made by mother. "'I'll see that he is undeceived,' cried the general. "'Hanged if I don't tell him.' Thirtieth Louisiana, you say, queried Mr. Crawford. That is the very one I am going to. I will tell him myself. So my two zealous champions went on, the general ending with, See to it, Crawford, Mrs. Morgan shall not have the credit, as though there was any great merit in sewing for one's countrymen. Our new acquaintance handed me from the cars as we reached Linwood, and stood talking while the accommodating train slowly rolled out its freight. He told me he was going to send me a tiny sack of coffee, which proposition, as it did not meet with the slightest encouragement, will of course never be thought of again. I noticed, too, on the train one of the Arkansas's crew, the same who, though scarcely able to stand on a severely wounded foot, made such a fuss about riding in a carriage while real ladies had to walk. Of course he did not recognize us any more than we would have known him if Dr. Brown had not pointed him out. I hear all of them are at Port Hudson, 
Anna told me as we got here that Dr. Addison, the one I disliked because he was so scrupulously neat while the others were dressed, or rather undressed, for working, was here yesterday, and inquired for the Miss Morgans, saying they were the most charming young ladies he had ever met. On what he founded his opinion, or how he happened to inquire for us in this part of the country, I cannot imagine. The general brings news of the boys from Jackson. He there met an officer who left Stonewall Jackson's command on the second instant, and says Gibbs was unhurt, God be praised. Another saw George a week ago in Richmond, still lame as the cap of his knee had slipped in that fall last spring. Of Jimmy we hear not a word, not even as to where he is. It seems as though we are destined never to hear again. September 20th, Saturday. General Carter has just received a letter from Lydia which contains what to me is the most melancholy intelligence, the news of the death of Eugene Fowler, who was killed on the 22nd of August in some battle or skirmish in Virginia. Poor Eugene! Does it not seem that this war will sweep off all who are nearest and dearest, as well as most worthy of life, leaving only those you least care for unharmed? September 21st. After supper last night, by way of variety, Anna, Miriam, and I came up to our room, and after undressing, commenced popping corn and making candy in the fireplace. We had scarcely commenced when three officers were announced, who found their way to the house to get some supper, they having very little chance of reaching Clinton before morning, as the cars had run off the track. Of course we could not appear, and they brought bad luck with them, for our corn would not pop and our candy burned, while to add to our distress the odor of broiled chicken and hot biscuit was wafted upstairs after a while in the most provoking way. In vain we sent the most pathetic appeals by each servant for a biscuit apiece after our hard work. Mrs. Carter was obdurate until, tired out with our messages, she at last sent us an empty jelly cup, a shred of chip beef, two polished drumsticks, and half a biscuit divided in three. With that bountiful repast we were forced to be content and go to bed. At sunrise this morning Mrs. Carter left to go down to her father in Eberville to see her stepmother, who is expected to die. Scarcely had she gone when six more officers and soldiers came in from the still stationary cars to get their breakfast. We heard that Mr. Marsden, too, was down there, so the general sent him a nice breakfast, and I sent my love with it, but he had already breakfasted at Mr. Elder's. As soon as they left we prepared for church, and just as we were ready Captain Brown and Mr. Addison were announced. The doctor greeted us with an elegant bow, but they did not remain long as we were about going out. Many officers were in church, and as I passed out, Colonel Bro joined me and escorted Miriam and me to the carriage, where we stood talking some time under the trees before getting in. He gave us a most pressing invitation to name a day to visit the camp, that he might have the pleasure of showing us the fortifications, and we said we would beg the general's permission to do so. Charming Colonel Bro, like all nice men he is married, of course. He and another officer drove just behind our carriage in coming home, until we came to the fork of the road. Then, leaning from their buggy, both gentlemen bowed profoundly, which we as cordially returned. Two more behind followed their example, and to our great surprise, ten, who were seated in a small wagon drawn by two diminutive mules, bowed also, and not content with that, rose to their feet as the distance between the two roads increased, and raised their caps, though in the most respectful silence rather queer, and I would have said impertinent had they been any others than Confederates fighting for us, who, of course, are privileged people. 
September 24th. Yesterday the general saluted us with, Young ladies, if you will ride in a Confederate carriage, you may go to dress parade this evening. Now, in present phraseology, Confederate means anything that is rough, unfinished, unfashionable, or poor. You hear of Confederate dresses, which means last year's. Confederate bridal means a rope halter. Confederate silver, a tin cup or spoon. Confederate flour is cornmeal, etc. In this case, the Confederate carriage is a jersey wagon with four seats, a top of hickory slats covered with leather, and the whole drawn by mules. We accepted gladly, partly for the ride and sight, partly to show we were not ashamed of a very comfortable conveyance. So with Mrs. Badger as chaperone, we went off in grand style. I must say I felt rather abashed, and wished myself at home as we drove into town, and had the gaze of a whole regiment riveted on us. But soon the men fell in line, and I did not feel so painfully conspicuous. I was amused at a contrast nearby, too. There was but one carriage present besides ours, though there were half a dozen ladies on horseback. This carriage was a very fine one, and in it sat three of the ugliest, dowdiest, worst-dressed females I ever saw. We three girls sat in our rough carriage as comfortable as could be, dressed, well, we could not have been dressed better, and looking our very best. Sans mentir, I think the Confederates were much the most respectable." And what a sad sight the 4th Louisiana was that was then parading. Men that had fought at Shiloh and Baton Rouge were barefooted. Rags was their only uniform, for very few possessed a complete suit, and those few wore all varieties of colors and cuts. Hats could be seen of every style and shape, from the first ever invented down to the last one purchased, evidently some time since. Yet he who had no shoes looked as happy as he who had, and he who had a cap had something to toss up, that's all. Four or five we knew gathered around our vehicle and talked to us. Mr. Houston told me he heard I had been thrown, severely injured, had a narrow escape, etc. Was not thrown. Saddle turned. A few steps off we recognized Mr. Scales. He would stare very hard at us, and if we turned towards him, would look quickly the other way, as though afraid to meet our gaze. Presently he gave us an opportunity, and we bowed. He came forward eagerly, blushing deeply, and looking very much pleased, and shook hands with us, and remained some time talking. He said he had not heard of our arrival, but would call as soon as possible. Mr. Talbot had rejoined Breckenridge. Having seen the last of that parade, he invited us to see that of his sailors, which was next, but it was too far, so we turned off to see Colonel Brose a mile away. His, the 30th Louisiana, is a beautiful encampment on a large open common. Parade was almost over as we reached there, and soon the Colonel came to meet us. I did not look at the drill. I was watching the hundreds of tents. It looked like a great many, and was wondering how men could live in such places, and was trying to fancy what George's or Gibbs's looked like. It was pleasant to watch the barefoot soldiers race around like boys let loose from school, tossing caps and chips at two old gray geese that flew in circles around the encampment, just as though they had never had more earnest work. One gray-headed man stood in the door of his tent while a black-headed young one danced before him to his own whistle, with his arms akimbo. Altogether it was a very pretty picture, but poor men, how can they be happy in these tents? End of Book 3, Part 6